Preface of More About Unknown London by Walter George Bell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet More About Unknown London by Walter George Bell Preface why don't you write a book upon London? I have been asked. I am wholly incorrigible. Not for me are the encyclopedists. I wrote a book upon a single street in London once, to be exact, upon the 536 yards of Fleet Street that you may measure between Ludgate Circus and Temple Bar, and a truthful reviewer accused me of writing a quarter of a million words. I mean nothing by the phrase, excepting all reviewers as truthful, else how could they be so kind? I plead guilty to the quarter of a million words, but I am not writing London complete on the same scale. With serious books of inordinate length, to my name, if any reputation I may have surviving them it must be, well of that kind of person. My great nieces tell me that only short-sighted people read serious books. Of one such, of which I proudly claim authorship, my artist brother assured me that it was excellent, saying that he read it at nights in bed before going to sleep. I am not sure that this is wholly praise, but it encourages hope that after normal sales have ceased, I may yet look forward to profits from sundry volumes prescribed each year by the faculty. This book has been put together at odd times as recreation, in intervals of more substantial work. It is without plan, disjointed, disconnected as London itself is, without any particular period of time or mood. I offer these contents as recreation. Some papers, I assure you, are exceedingly grave. The hope is entombed that somewhere between the two covers may be found a stimulus for every reader who ventures to learn more of the history of London, the greatest, most varied, most alluring city in the world. Two of these papers have appeared before, Anne Boleyn's letter in the Daily Telegraph, from which it is reprinted by permission, and Dr. Johnson's Womankind is an after-dinner speech at the Pioneer Club. My skillful friend Hanslip Fletcher allows me to use three of his drawings, that of the old printing-house room with the goodwill of the Manchester Guardian, wherein it first appeared. Another friend, Lionel Gowing, has brought out his camera to make other pictures. Guildhall Liberty Committee gives me its giants, and to the kindness of one and all I express my debt of obligation. End of Preface Chapter 1 of More About Unknown London by Walter George Bell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet Chapter 1 Gog Magog and Other Giants who is there that has not stored in an odd corner of the brain some vivid impression of wonderment gained in the most impressionable years of childhood, which keeps fresh and distinct amid all the crowded memories of later years? The event is not necessarily of importance, often quite the reverse. The boy who is six or seven today ought so to recall his first sight of a flying machine picked out of the skies as it has come humming overhead, but I question if that will influence his imagination. In my own case it was giants. That day, being of about six years of age, I had no expectation of keeping the company of giants. Chance had brought me to the office of an uncle, who was something in the city, a goth I fear from my later recollections of him, his dull brain, befogged with prices, unresponsive to historical things. With him I had passed into Guildhall's medieval porch, 
and through to the great hall looking left the giants there by the window arrested my whole attention all motion ceased involuntarily and at a standstill awe-stricken i stared gog and magog jolly old fellows they were and are with bucolic freshness of face their clothes painted upon them in the gayest of colors that fearsome weapon the spiked morning star that gog carries what a blow that would give thought i every day i learnt when the giants hear the clock strike twelve they come down to dinner how anxious i was to be in guild hall at that hour of noon to see them clamber off their pedestals and stalk hungry away in what gigantic cooking pot was that gargantuan meal prepared where was it served but i never saw this giant's feast my relative's business was too pressing for us to stay it was always so with these elder people but i lingered long enough to acquire additional lore the giants i learnt did not always stand so quietly by the window but in ancient days took station on either side of the door of the council chamber when the common councilmen filed in to do the city's business guarding them against intruders what thwacks old gog must have given when he espies strangers how magog would have pinned them one after another on his long spear i laughed with delight gog i felt sure was the most wicked of the two giants else why should he look so sad for to the unspoilt imagination of early youth all giants are wicked it is only in after years with the knowledge that there are germs both good and bad comes the realization that at the other end of the scale there may be beneficent as well as evil monsters these twin colossi were to my diminutive self of at least twice the stature that they were when now i see them they are big fellows still i had no good fortune in those tender years another day i was shown the stone lion aloft on the old northumberland house by charing cross crowning the high wall the clearance of the ducal town mansion and of charing cross did not take place till about eighteen seventy three his outstretched poker tail i admired still more was i impressed by the assurance that at the hour of midnight when the moon shone the lion got off his pedestal and walked round i only saw him stiff and lifeless never walking round for no one took my inquisitive self to the riverside at the magic hour no doubt because of this curiosity stimulated in childhood i have always found a lively interest in london's giants having delved deeply and been amply repaid i value lightly the careless statements of the ignorant these say that giants are no more than things of wood or than creations of some addled brain giants have history known better to the old writers than to ourselves they lived a few centuries nearer to the gigantic race caxton himself a scholar at his press within the armory at westminster the central hall stands about the site printed his voracious chronicles of england telling not only the deeds of the giants but of the first peopling of these islands and the founding of london as new troy you did not know that london was ever named troy listen and learn from caxton how it came about in this wise the emperor diocletian had three-and-thirty self-willed daughters of whose management he was at last relieved by obtaining for them as many husbands but the ladies did not pleasantly submit to the rule of their lords and agreed among themselves to regain their lost liberties by each cutting her husband's throat the deed was effected and the emperor their father driven to despair of managing so refractory a family to punish their crimes and rid himself of their presence sent them all to sea in one vessel with half a year's provisions after long sailing they reached an island which they made their residence and named albion 
after the name of the eldest lady the evil one never losing sight of them created visionary husbands for the ladies who became the mothers of horrible giants and these ruled in the land till the advent of brutus he it was to whom we owe the deliverance from gigantic rule of these fair lands this happy breed of men this little world this precious stone set in the silver sea this blessed plot this earth this realm this england but for brute we englishmen might be giants to-day with appalling morals instead of men of normal stature cheerfully paying our income tax i have his genealogical tree he was son of anthonon of troy that doughty warrior when troy was sacked by the greeks fled to italy and founded the city of pavia brutus fired by the parental example himself set out in search of new conquests voyaged around the spanish and french coasts obtained the aid of the gauls to invade britain and landed at the port where now stands southampton his deeds i find best set out in detail in the history of the trojan wars and troy's destruction so leave caxton sarah bates at the sign of the sun and bible in giltspur street had this little book printed for her to sell in the year 1735. Was she herself the gifted authoress and historian, I wonder? Note here a diversization. Albion, heretofore a daughter of the Emperor Diocolastian's interesting family, has become the devil-born son of that lady and the defender of England. The time was remote, and that a little of the mists of antiquity should surround this giant's origin causing confusion cannot surprise brute so says our history having thus got a footing in britain was preparing to improve the same when albion who had named this island after his own name by which it is sometimes called to this day note this link in evidence with our own time having intelligence thereof raised his whole power being men of gigantic stature and vast strength and bearing for their arms huge clubs of knotty oak, battle-axes, whirl-bats of iron, and globes full of spikes fastened to a long pole by a chain. And with these encountering Brute, a bloody battle was fought, wherein the Trojans were worsted, and many of them slain, and the whole army was forced to retire. A black day for St. George, but Brute retired only to fight again considering says his biographer the disadvantage between his men and giants he devised a stratagem to overthrow them at night he dug a long and deep trench at the bottom impaling it with sharp stakes and covered it with boughs and rotten hurdles on which he caused to be laid dried leaves and earth only leaving some firm passages well known to his men by particular marks trench warfare you observe is no new development of the european war but as old as england's gigantic race the fight was renewed the trojans nimbly retiring behind their trench made a stand plying their enemy with a shower of darts and arrows till goaded to fury the giants rushed forward and the vanguard immediately perished on the stakes the trojans continuing to shoot their arrows very thickly giants were put to flight and pursued into cornwall a distance i find by ordnance map from southampton of one hundred twenty nine miles there in another bloody fight albion was slain by brute fighting hand to hand and his two brothers gog and magog giants of huge stature were taken prisoners and led in triumph to the place where now london stands upon those risings on the side of the thames brute founded a city which he called troynevent or new troy and building a palace where guildhall stands he caused the two giants to be chained to the gate of it as porters in memory of which it is held that their effigies after their deaths were set up as they now appear in guildhall 
observe that the giant Gog Magog has been split into two, a cleavage for which I know no historical basis. The gigantic history of the two famous giants in Guildhall. Footnote. Gigantic only in name, this history is in two tiny volumes, which Thomas Borman sold in 1741 from his bookstall, near the giants in Guildhall. End of footnote has better authority for its description of the elder giant as Gog Magog, and the younger as Corinius. These two fought. Corinius was a younger brother of Brutus, sharing his wanderings and fortunes. Like was he to have been slain by Gog Magog, who in a wrestle caught him aloft and broke three of his ribs. Desperately enraged thereby, Corinius, a giant of quick temper, I take it, collected all his strength, heaved up Gog Magog by main force, and bearing him on his shoulders to the next high rock, threw him headlong, all shattered, into the sea, and left his name on the cliff. That cliff has ever since been called Langomagog, that is to say, the giant's leap. Thus perished Gomagog, commonly called Gog Magog, the last of the giants. His fate is verified by other writers. Geoffrey of Monmouth, a well-respected person, if given at times to telling more than he knew, wrote Britain's history in the twelfth century and dealt with Gog Magog. Back in the thirteenth century, a record of Fulke Warren, an outlawed baron of King John's time, was written in Anglo-Norman on age-browned parchments still preserved in the British Museum and reprinted but the other day. It describes a visit paid by William the Conqueror to the Welsh marches. The stern king inquired the cause of a burnt and ruined town, and was told by an old Brighton, None inhabited these parts, except very foul people, great giants, whose king was called Gomagog. These heard of the arrival of Brutus, and went out to encounter him, and at last all the giants were killed except Gomagog, whose fight to the death with Corinius is given much as already told. Locrin, an old tragedy once attributed to Shakespeare, gives an account of the giant's fall, among them Gogmagog, son of Simotheus, the cursed captain of that damned crew. As your modern historian, a dull fellow and suspicious, would say, he is well documented. That there were giants in England is established by the Gog Magog Hills in Cambridgeshire, near at home. Look at your map for the name. I love the mystery of names. Was it not Lord Beaconsfield who confessed that if the stars really were set back in illimitable space so many millions of miles distant as was represented? He was puzzled to know how astronomers found out their names. And I could, and I would, quote scripture from both Revelation 28 and the prophet Ezekiel for both Gog and Magog. The effigies seen in Guildhall today are admittedly but things of wood, carved in the year 1708. Captain Richard Saunders of King Street, which leads up to Guildhall, a gallant soldier of the trained bands, made them for replacing other giants that had themselves replaced still earlier giants burnt in the Great Fire of London. These originals, fashioned of wicker work and rushes, yearly graced my Lord Mayor's show, being carried in the pageant till by decay of time, helped by a number of city rats and mice which had eaten up their entrails, they were no longer able to support themselves upright without collapse. London citizens will recall that in the Lord Mayor's show of 1912 there walked a great giant. Some have said that he was not really a captive of the diminutive St. George, a glow in armor of shimmering steel, and with tossing crest, who led him through the streets by a chain. Indeed, no giant at all, but a normal man whose eyes peered through the lace of the jerkin. I must examine into that. 
but I dissent altogether from the statement that Gog Magog was the last of the giants. London itself had others of later date, of whom John Stowe, the most gifted of London antiquaries, has borne remembrance. The giant of St. Mary Aldermanbury was a towering fellow, though he left at that city church of himself only a shank bone which was strung up for public inspection in the cloister. A shank bone of a man, as is said, very great, observes Stowe, for it is in length twenty-eight inches and a half of a size, light and somewhat pory, porous, and spongy. This bone is said to be found among the bones of men removed from the charnel house of Paul's, or rather from the cloister of Paul's church, of both which reports I doubt. Not doubting this giant's authentic limb bone, but its ascribed origin, and for this reason. Rain Wolf, stationer, who paid for the carriage of the bones from the charnel, was himself an antiquary, and knowing the covetedness of that breed, Stowe says of him, neither would the same have been easily gotten from him if he had heard thereof, except he had reserved the like for himself, being the greatest preserver of antiquities in those parts, which I account sufficient reason. True it is, adds Stowe, wonderingly, that this bone, from whensoever it came, being of a man, as the form showeth, must needs be monstrous, and more than after the proportion of five shank bones of any man now living amongst us. Indeed, a great monster likely to have caused confusion had he gone in the flesh to St. Mary's Church. Now, Rain Wolf was, in fact, the inspirer and employer of that antiquary and historian of wide fame known as Hollingshead, whose large and valuable collection of chronicles was published after Wolf's death. William Harrison, who wrote of giants in his Description of Britain, incorporated in those same chronicles, also speaks of this bone at St. Mary Aldermanbury, which he measured as thirty-two inches. To show the living generation what manner of giant this was, there stood in the church cloister, fixed to the east wall not far from the bone itself, an image made by some skilful artist in full proportion, which showeth the person of a man full ten or twelve feet high, says Harrison. I found from their accounts that the wardens of St. Mary Almanbury, when rebuilding their church after the great fire of London, paid, for digging a pit to bury ye bones, five shillings fourpence, for baskets to carry ye bones to ye pit, ten pence. And possibly the gigantic limb bone, a marvel to so many, went in with the rest. St. Lawrence Jewry also had its giant. Old Jewry had been the city ghetto till the London Jews migrated east to Houndstitch and beyond, leaving only their name for remembrance. His remains John Stowe had known from childhood. I myself more than seventy years since, he was writing about 1597, have seen in this church the shank bone of a man, as it is taken, and also a tooth of a very great bigness hanged up for show in chains of iron upon a pillar of stone. The tooth, being about the bigness of a man's fist, is long since conveyed from thence. The thigh or shank bone of twenty-five inches in length by rule remaineth yet fastened to a post of timber and is not so much to be noted for the length as for the thickness, hardness, and strength thereof. Lacking knowledge where or when this bone was first discovered, Stowe was of open mind. The tooth of some monstrous fish, as I take it, he wrote in a marginal note. The shank bone might be of an elephant. Not having this relic to handle and examine, I hesitate to give an opinion. It may have been an elephant. A yet more ample giant, rising twenty-eight feet high and more, Stowe wholly rejected, 
deeming but fabulous his tooth, which weighed ten ounces of troy, and skull so large that it would hold five pecks of wheat, and shinbone six feet in length, and of marvellous greatness, though Harrison declared that he had had the tooth in his hand, on the tenth day of March in the year 1564, and the other relics were extant and to be seen. You note he is precise as to date. Then follows in the description the fellow with the mouth sixteen feet wide. No, that is much too big a swallow. I turn next to a giant's home, or must I say his castle. In Bread Street, Cheapside, stood Jared's Hall. Its beautiful crypt, the vaulting upheld by eighteen delicate pillars, survived to our time till 1852. There dwelt a giant. The race of Jenny, native to London, is small, and this was a sinuous, fleshy monster, no mere fragment of bone or tooth, or shadowy creation of fancy in thin air. Great was he at the joust. John Stowe knew the fame of Jared the Giant. He visited the house to see its wondrous relics, objects of awe to the Elizabethan gammon and the gaping countrymen, for these were evidences of the size and prowess of Jared, well calculated to confound the incredulous. Of old time, Stowe writes, the said house having a large and high-roofed hall, there stood in the midst thereof a mighty staff, armed at the fore-end with iron and steel. It reached from the ground or floor to the very top of the hall, even as it were to touch or pierce it. This staff is said to be one of them that the said Jared the Giant used to run withal in his wars. Sure, he had need of a very great horse to carry him that should wield such a staff, but I think he was no horseman, but went all on his feet. There stood also a ladder of the same height just by the staff. I have seen them often, and inquired of the tenants the cause of their being there, but they could make me none other answer than that the one was Jared's staff, as ye have heard, and the ladder to ascend to the top thereof, to see the same staff to be safe and not decayed. Of late years this hall is altered in building, and diverse rooms made of it. Notwithstanding, the staff is removed to one corner of the hall, which remaineth of height as afore, save that the point is broken off. But the latter is broken or sawed shorter almost by the one half, and the remnant thereof hanged on to a wall in the yard. A servant of that house, more courteous than his master, showed me the length of the staff by a wall's side, where the said staff was laid, while the rooms over the hall were in building. I measured the ground and found it over fifty foot in length. But the master of the house set the same to lack half a foot of forty foot, which word of his I must take for current, for reason could he give me none. Neither would he rise from his seat to show me any further, but bade me read the chronicles, for there he had heard. A scurvy knave this landlord, lacking the historical sense that spares no discomfort to search out truth, and no fit custodian for the home of a giant, although dead. I recall how Mark Twain one night at the Savage Club bemoaned the habit of giants, he was dealing with those of literature, to die. Shakespeare, said he, is dead. Milton also is dead, and I myself am not feeling very well. Stowe explored antiquity and wrote his survey in Queen Elizabeth's reign. He was dissatisfied. John Geyser was mayor of London in 1245 and had owned this hall and many other geysers after him, some of them aldermen of Vintry Ward, and themselves a family of vintners. Geyser's Hall became corrupted by use to Jared's Hall. It was an inn before 1479, and in Stowe's own time, a common hostelry for the receipt of travellers. It remained a tavern till the middle 19th century, 
exposing the great painted sign of Jared the Giant, made of knotted oak, now to be found in Guildhall Museum. Out of this geyser's hall, again I quote Stowe, at the first building thereof were made divers anchored doors, yet to be seen, which seemed not sufficient for any great monster or other than men of common stature to pass through. The pole in the hall might be used of old time, as then the custom was in every parish, to be set up in the summer as maypole before the principal house in the parish or street, and to stand in the hall before the screen, decked with home and ivy, all the feast of Christmas. The latter served for the decking of the maypole and roof of the hall. Thus much for Geyser's Hall. So falls Jared the Giant, and I, for one, am sorry for it. More giants have been laid low by your skeptical antiquary than by all the saints in Christendom. End of chapter 1Chapter 2 of More About Unknown London by Walter George Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet. Chapter 2 The First British Naval Dispatch. It is not to be found at the Admiralty, nor amongst the early papers of our fighting services stored in that great depository of England's history the public record office in Chancery Lane. Tucked away where few would think of seeking for such a purpose, among the archives of the City of London at Guildhall, is the earliest dispatch in existence giving account of an English naval battle, a letter from King Edward III addressed to his son, the Duke of Cornwall, in which he announced the happy result of the sea fight of La Clouse on Midsummer Day of the year 1340. This engagement, known in our history as the famous Battle of Sloes, opened the second phase of the Hundred Years' War, of which the outstanding events were Cressy and Poictiers. A word is needed to explain how this intimate document came to the city, bringing joyful news and relief at a time of grave public anxiety. In the 14th century, it was the duty of the sink ports to furnish a navy for the king's service. But London, though not among the five ports, by reason of its standing as the capital of the kingdom and the wealth of its merchant citizens, was expected to give a reinforcement of ships. On the outbreak of war with France, London had sent three large vessels, known as La Jeannette of London, La Cogue of All Hallows, and La Saint Mary Cogue. William Hansard, Sheriff of London, owned the last of these. The ship did good service at Sloes, but we cannot trace the fortunes of the others. London also furnished anchors, archers, and 20,000 marks for the expeditionary fleet. It consequently followed, with patriotic and domestic interest, the fortunes of the king at sea. Edward, Duke of Cornwall, then a boy of ten, afterwards renowned in chivalry as the Black Prince, was nominal warden of the kingdom during his father's absence, and on receipt of the news of Sloes he forwarded the letter to Guild Hall for the comfort of the Londoners. The mayor and aldermen thereupon caused it to be inscribed in their Liber Rubius, now known as Letter Book F, wherein the text, in Norman French, may still be read. I give a careful translation. The letter is brief and soldier-like. Footnote. The letter has been given in the original Norman French by M. Jules Delpit in his Collection Générale des Documents Francis K. Sou Thor Angladaire, Paris, 1847. But no complete translation, as far as I can ascertain, has before been printed. End footnote. Fortunately, we can fill in the details from other sources. King Edward III thus addressed his son. 
heading in letter book f letter of our lord the king directed to his son the duke of cornwall concerning the naval battle fought on the day of the nativity of st john the baptist very dear son we are sure that you are desirous of hearing good news from us and what has happened to us since we left england you should know that on the thursday after we took our departure from the port of dorwelt we waited all the day and the night following and on the friday about the hour of noon we came to the coasts of flanders before blankburg where we had a view of our enemy's fleet which was all gathered together in the port of swine and because the tide was not high enough for us to meet them we therefore remained all that night on the saturday the day of st john well after the hour of noon with the tide we in the name of god and in full trust of the justice of our quarrel entered into the said port upon our enemies who had assembled their ships in a strong array and who made a most noble defence all that day and the night after but god by his power and miracle granted us the victory over our enemies and him we thank most devoutly for his work you also should know that the number of soldiers and other men at arms amounted to thirty-five thousand of which number about five thousand escaped and the remainder as we were given to understand by those who were taken prisoners alive are lying dead in places on the coast of flanders on the other hand all our ships that is to say the christopher and others that were lost at middleburg have now been recovered and we also have taken of their navy three or four great ships as large as the christopher the flemings showed us good will in the battle from the commencement until the end thanks be to god our lord for the grace he has shown us and we and all our friends render to him our prayers and thanks our intention is to remain here until we have arranged certain points with our allies and others of our friends in flanders with whom we have business very dear son may god be your guardian given under our privy seal in our ship cog thomas on wednesday the eve of st peter and st paul twenty eighth june thirteen forty the conditions before sloes was fought were such as to excite grave alarm in england a french force landed at portsmouth had sacked and burnt the town and laid waste the countryside later a raid was made on southampton on a sunday while the inhabitants were at mass and the people as they poured out of the churches were slaughtered those who escaped by flight returning to find their homes left in smoking ruins the channel islands had been seized even london itself fearful of attack took steps to fortify with stones and palisades and stakes driven into the bed of the thames against these happenings edward had to show but the empty title of king of france an alliance with the flemings and a load of debt an active french fleet commanded by two gallant seamen nicholas bahachet a norman of humble birth and hugh quiret a piccadilly knight made the english channel unsafe issuing from its ports to engage in piratical acts against british merchantmen and cutting across our communications with the continent at length the preparations for edward's second invasion of france were complete an arbitrary act of seizure of all vessels capable of carrying forty tons or casks of wine greatly strengthened the fighting value of england's fleet it was awaiting orders to sail when news reached the english king that philip v of france had assembled a large fleet manned by normans and genoese then lying ready to intercept his passage robert morley the english admiral and archbishop stratford the chancellor warned the king of the peril of his enterprise edward was undaunted i shall go he is reported to have said those who are afraid where no fear is may stay at home the english flotilla 
numbering some two hundred ships in all and covering a great space of water the big ships the pressed vessels and the little floins taking their proper place and order stood out to sea from orwell in essex in the forenoon of the twenty second june thirteen forty arriving next day off blankenburg on the flanders coast there the english seamen obtained from the mastheads a distant view of the fleets of bahachet and quiret anchored off slois at that time a considerable harbour upon which opened the stream and canal that bore the world's traffic to the great mart of bruges edward dropped anchor three knights put ashore to reconnoitre returned with an alarming report they had counted two hundred ships of war besides smaller vessels and nineteen ships so large that they had never seen the like with the enemy was the great english ship christopher which had been captured by the french after it had carried edward on his first crossing to antwerp their masts were like trees in the forest it is certain that the english were outnumbered edward determined to fight when daylight came next morning and it is curiously illustrative of the time that he had trusted to the fortunes of battle the presence of fifty noble ladies of honour who were going to wait upon queen philippa in flanders his first care being to place them in safety under a strong guard the english stood out to sea on the morning of the twenty fourth june then bore down upon the french who had drawn up their ships in four lines across the passage to the harbour and lashed the vessels together with strong chains awaiting attack we too of the living generation know this sea ground over which king edward the third's sailors six centuries ago manoeuvred know it well we call it zeebrugge scene of the last glorious exploit on the grand scale in which british seamen engaged in the greatest of our wars that it was though the coast outline has much changed and the actual harbour has silted up with the tides and currents perpetual wash and slow as to-day lies inland sand shifted by the wind having formed the low dunes often i wondered when england thrilled with the account of the zeebrugge fight that in our forgetfulness none had recalled the near association of the naval victory of slois the spirits of your fathers shall start from every wave i think they were there the invisible watchers of that great day not less real to be sure than those angels of mons whose visions some have said appeared to our men in the trenches but we had forgotten the ships fought without guns although at cressy six years later were used very small bombards which one chronicler relates with fire and a noise like god's thunder through little balls of iron to frighten the horses it is certain that no gunpowder was burnt at slois a sea fight much resembled a land fight only in confined space and was fought not by seamen but by soldiers the likeness to siege warfare on land was heightened by the appointment of the more important ships carrying towers from which heavy stones and other missiles were hurled down the decks were packed with bowmen and spearmen and swordsmen battle tactics were simple the preliminary exchanges of arrows having done their work on the crowded decks it became the object of every commander in attack to lash his ship against an enemy ship and board her after which everything depended upon individual valour this battle says fossar of slois was right fierce and horrible for battles by sea are more dangerous and fiercer than battles by land for at sea there is no retreat nor fleeing there is no remedy but to fight and abide fortune and every man to show his prowess it all took place nearly six hundred years ago chroniclers of different nationalities with differing racial prejudices are naturally confused but it would seem that the first english attempt failed against the enemy's serried ranks then king edward bethought himself of a ruse turning his ships about he made off in flight 
the french at once unchained their vessels and raised sail to pursue and while they were in disorder the english again bore down upon them the sun behind their masts and the wind filling the sails as in so many other medieval battles it was the skill of the english archers which first influenced the fortunes of the day their dense flights of arrows doing such terrible execution that the genoese crossbowmen in the french ships were driven from the decks and unable effectively to reply close action opened when morley the english admiral laid his craft alongside the great christopher which was boarded and after a struggle taken and soon the ships of the opposing fleets were closely grappled together with loud shouts of defiance the english men-at-arms calling upon their saints to succor them in the manner of the days of chivalry knights and yeomen and plebeian soldiers boarded their enemy and with battle-axe and sword and pike fought out the issue on decks that soon were slippery with blood morley in the captured christopher broke the enemy's second line a panic is said to have seized the third line which retained some formation and the men leapt into the sea over two thousand perished by drowning the fourth line consisting of sixty craft chained together offered a brave resistance till nightfall when some made good their retreat barbavera the commander of the genoese auxiliaries also withdrew some of his shattered ships in the darkness but when the battle ended next morning the magnificent norman fleet comprising some three-fourths of the whole was at the victor's mercy edward who himself fought in the thick of the hand-to-hand -hand struggle had been wounded in the thigh i quote the french chronicle of london to be found among the british museum manuscripts by a friendly writer who describes the sea fight in the language of chivalry the melee opened to the sound of trumpets nakers viols tabors and many other kinds of minstrelsy how many an age-old shock of arms that passage recalls then did our king with three hundred ships vigorously assail the french with their five hundred great ships and galleys and eagerly did our people exert great diligence to give battle to the french our archers and our alabasters began to fire as densely as hail falls in winter and our engineers hurled so steadily that the french had not power to look or to hold up their heads and in the meantime while this assault lasted our english people with a great force boarded their galleys and fought with the french hand to hand and threw them out of their ships and galleys and always our king encouraged them to fight bravely with his enemies he himself being in the cog called thomas of winchelsea and at the hour of tiercey nine o'clock in the morning there came to them a ship of london which belonged to william hansford and it did much good in the same battle for the battle was so severe and so heartily contested that the assault lasted from noon all day and all night and the morrow until the hour of prime six o'clock and when the battle was discontinued no frenchman remained alive save only spottlefish who took to flight with four-and-twenty ships and galleys quiret and bahachet fell into edward's hands the former mortally wounded there is a norman legend that bahachet when brought captive before the english king answered some taunt with a cuff whereupon the angry monarch hanged him forthwith from the mast of his ship this has no support from english authorities and obviously is unlikely the victory was complete but edward no doubt exaggerated the numbers when he reported thirty thousand of his enemies slain it seems inconceivable that the french could have put thirty-five thousand men afloat in the small vessels of those days the coke thomas which flew edward's standard at slow s and after the flight remained his favorite ship was sunk ten years later in the no less famous battle of les espagnol sur mer the first attempted invasion of england by spain a huge spanish nieff struck her so hard amidships that her mainmast went by the board and the craft rapidly filled 
edward landed at sloes amid the rejoicings of the flemings and his march in the subsequent campaigns curiously recalls the far greater struggle in which english and french as close allies have so recently been engaged mons valenciennes cambrai bupom peron sacutan all these appear his footsteps closely follow that via sacra now hallowed by so many thousands of our own dead End of chapter 2chapter three of more about unknown london by walter george bell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by janet chapter three a garden of memories the generality of people when brought up at the little railed plot on tower green as they make a circuit of inspection of the tower of london regarded as the tower's execution ground of so many tragic memories which of course it is not always there seems a hush about this place three english queens perished there for jane the queen i count one of them though her reign lasted but nine troubled days the others anne boleyn and catherine howard anne by the calais headsman's sword her companions in destiny by the axe it is hallowed ground the aged countess of salisbury margaret pole suffered there also refusing to bend her gray head to the stroke so should traitors do and i am none she protested i suppose some qualm on the part of henry the eighth and his dower daughter some idea of what was due to their sex induced them to order the execution of the women in comparative privacy within the tower's walls fear influenced elizabeth's counsellors when deciding that robert Devereux, earl of essex a rebel to the great queen with whom he had long been a favourite should die there london's populace still held him in affection the queen's hold weakening with cantankerous old age derrick the executioner when leaving the tower his work done was assailed and beaten by an enraged mob till the sheriffs rescued him from those who would have taken his life viscountess rockford was another who perished on tower green five women and a man footnote in an earlier age the earl of hastings accused by richard duke of gloucester of necromancy was hurriedly decapitated below the keep but there is no certainty of the site of this execution and footnote that is the whole company what are six heads in the bloody records of the tower often i stray on to tower hill revisiting that grim spot now embowered in green where heads fell so many more numerous than these it is as quiet as any nook in london for a serenity broods over the place since the tumult of which it has known so much died away i have in mind stratford and the final scene when they say two hundred thousand persons crowded the hill to acclaim his death a restful place on a summer's day away from the hot city pavements and the people surging over them my only company has been the pleasant cries and prattle of children you must search for the public execution ground outside the tower it was a right or privilege that the city for centuries held that execution of the capital sentence should be carried out by the sheriffs of london and middlesex and on the city's ground at the gate of the tower the sheriffs formally have claimed the body of the doomed man a right granted by charter confirmed by successive english monarchs and in times past guarded jealously it lies to-day within a garden this blood-soaked execution ground the londoner heedlessly passes by out of trinity square a leafy space has been preserved where trees and shrubs throw black shadows over the close cropped lawn one of those oases of green that strangers find with pleasant surprise within the city 
the trinity house now has its care it is ringed about with an iron railing and the gates are locked a few residents of the locality having keys send in their children and nurses and there i have met the pretty grandchildren of general pippin the resident major of the tower you can be alone i should have been locked out like the rest of london's millions having no right of entrance but that i made friends with the gardener he tends the young grass that grows in the spring and brushes away the leaves that fall in autumn and has no worries with memories he will point out to you with pride that it should be in his keeping a little square paved with dark brick of some twelve feet span on every side with in the centre a stone tablet few words are cut into the tablet they tell that this is the site of the ancient scaffold here the earl of kilmarnock and lord balmerino suffered eighteen august seventeen forty six the curious may see the stone through the rails thus it commemorates most inadequately the awful tragedy of this place a spot that is associated i quote lord macaulay's words as i have done before upon the cemetery of st peter ad vincula church which it filled with whatever is darkest in human nature and in human destiny with the savage triumph of implacable enemies with the inconsistency the ingratitude the cowardice of friends with all the miseries of fallen greatness and of blighted fame the happy children here at play have no memories some day there will come into their minds a realization of death when play shall cease and joyful anticipations of the morrow be no more a horror of the unknown voyage they will put it aside rarely to be recalled but life thereafter will never be quite the same to them their play is undisturbed by any associations of this place of blood and i ask for no better companions there lustful young life at its dawn were life itself when the mind is strong and the capacity for work greatest has been violently ended a mite of a boy a spot of flaming vermilion amidst the greenery calling to me over the very place of execution toddled across it to give to the old gentleman his teddy bear alas my years have passed the fascination of teddy bears and my thoughts were roaming the lessons of history are for the schoolmen and its immediate reward for those who court the jade the vision it sets up of past times and men and women who peopled familiar places bringing back the life of dead streets and empty hearths i saw this ground not as it is but as our forefathers knew it the grey fortress prison of the tower defying time was the same save that its walls rose sheer from the water-filled moat but tower hill had no trees to relieve its hardness and rarely a blade of sparse grass survived the trampling of this ground into mud by thousands of feet i have no envy of the good old times nor wish to shoulder my way among fellow creatures assembled here as spectators wanting anxious to witness the awful scenes the descending axes blow the head rolling over the sawdust that strewed the scaffold's floor this common land lay bare dedicated to death and committed to no other use an open hillside wind-swept from the river an accursed place which all life shunned a path ran half obliterated and in places stamped out of recognition byward tower laid out its drawbridge over the moat opposite at an angle was a little shelter called the bulwark gate that has long since been cleared away it was there the exchange of custody was made the lieutenant of the tower handed over his prisoner to the sheriffs and the sad little procession martial men bearing pikes and halberds guarding the doomed man trampled the rising ground to where the scaffold and the block were raised 
the masked headsman standing ready the voice of the tower hill orator airing the wrongs of his class has come over to me breaking the quietude about this spot and i have wondered if he has any sense of historical proportion london regards its old execution ground with unconcern and few i dare say know of its existence not three in a thousand of those who are drawn by the tower's association with our national history to visit the grey old fortress i have no wish to see it in any other than its present use a garden of memories see me safe up mr lieutenant and for my coming down let me shift for myself the good sir thomas moore said this climbing the creaking scaffold at tower hill his quaint humour irrepressible when all his hopes were in heaven's blue vault i recall from many pictures that pale lean face he did not like fisher robe for death but came in an old frieze gown bearing in his hand a red cross after prayers the executioner offered to tie his eyes i will cover them myself he said he bound them in a cloth brought with him then kneeling laid his head upon the block the stroke was about to fall when he signed for a moment's delay his white beard had grown long in prison and he put it aside pity that should be cut he murmured that has not committed treason with these strange words the strangest perhaps ever uttered at such a time the lips most famous in europe for eloquence and wisdom closed forever the horrid indignities with which the mangled body of john fisher was treated upon this spot cried down the centuries the infamy of henry the eighth the cardinal's hat given by pope paul the third while fisher lay in the tower never crowned that aged head a sentence by a contemporary who has described the end tells all we want in portraiture of the man so much wasted as to look death itself in human shape he was past eighty he could not walk lifted in a chair between two lieutenants men he was carried to the bulwark gate for delivery over to the sheriffs and so carried up the hill to execution the headsman stripped the body upon the scaffold of the shirt and all the clothes there leaving the corpse naked a sight for the awe-stricken rabble to gaze at where it remained after that sort for the most part of the day saving that one for pity and humanity's sake cast a little straw over it and about eight o'clock in the evening commandment came from the king's commissioners to such as watched about the dead body for it was still watched with many halberds and weapons that they should cause it to be buried whereupon two of the watches took it upon a halberd between them and so carried it to a churchyard by called all hallows barking where on the north side of the churchyard hard by the wall they digged a grave with their halberds all hallows barking is in sight a stone's throw distant and the river flows by over which fisher's head was exposed on a pike rays of light were observed to shine about it that was the report such a concourse of people assembled on london bridge looking up that neither horse nor man could pass and the head was removed and thrown into the thames the martyr's body found final sepulture in st peter ad vincula tower hill another day witnessed a strange scene intrigue ambition and the machinations of enemies had brought the protector somerset to the scaffold about which was gathered an immense throng he was addressing the people when there arose a great stir the sound as of a great number of horses running on to the people to overrun them or of guns shooting machin the diarist was present many fell to the ground for fear he says for they that were at one side thought no other but that one was killing the other that they fell down to the ground one upon another with their halberds 
some fell into the ditch of the tower and other places and a hundred were in the tower ditch and some ran away for fear this until they espied a body of men approaching on horse and on foot and at their head sir anthony brown sheriff of surrey whereupon there burst out a cry of pardon 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 god save the king caps and cloaks were hurled into the air it happened only that the inhabitants of certain outlying hamlets as haggerston newington and shoreditch being commanded upon such occasions to give attendance with weapons under their lieutenant arrived late the execution being at eight o'clock and seeing the duke already on the scaffold they pressed forward with haste there is no pardon good people there is no such thing said the doomed man and he was right the tower itself has known more mercy than this merciless place loud gave up his life on tower hill some said as he came out to execution that he had painted his face that morning purple but the standers by were hushed into sudden awe on seeing that purple face turn ghastly white edward stratford the buckingham of shakespeare's speech of matchless pathos somerset just mentioned and john dudley duke of northumberland were others there lieth before the high altar two dukes between two queens is the simple record of the burial of these last in st peter ad vincula's crowded cemetery two howards henry earl of surrey and thomas duke of norfolk the rebel monmouth mangled by a nerveless executioner before he died the names and these are but a few form almost an epitome of england's history thomas cromwell himself responsible for the violent deaths of so many perished by the axe on this same execution ground fierce hatreds have been stilled here and some lives that have been ignominious the proudest blood of england has poured out where stands this little square of brick if away in space there is a cavern which stores up the sounds heard on earth it will echo the menacing murmur of exultant vengeful passions that have swayed the rocking crowds upon tower hill the low utterance of anguish and despair when man stood friendless there before his maker and the after silence i feel sure will be broken by the children's rippling laughter it is not my task to call to the ghosts of all who have died in this garden but in the tablet's inadequate commemoration one name is wanting i do not understand the omission kilmarnock and balmerino have their names there why not simon fraser lord lovett who completes the three rebel lords the last man who suffered death by beheading in england that alone should justify his remembrance a villain you may say traitorous treacherous double dealing so let his dishonored bones crumble into dust forgotten simon fraser was that in the estimation of his english contemporaries and i should have valued their judgment lightly but that his wild and stormy career speaks for itself posterity has softened the lines of the portrait made him man not devil shaded the hoofs that contemporaries drew but it has not altered the verdict it is difficult to get back the atmosphere of the time of the jacobite rebellion of seventeen forty five scotland was then a remote place london citizens alarmed by tales of highlanders excesses that enlarged as they travelled down from the border broke into disgraceful panic in dread of the arrival of an army of bare-legged northerners to sack their quiet homes i take no pride in those nerveless ancestors of mine lovett himself did not fight for bonnie charlie as worthless a steward as the majority he was an old man racked with disease exactly how old he was it is not possible to tell for it was his humor to exaggerate his age 
mr mackenzie his latest biographer has some evidence that he was seventy-two at the time of his death the highland chieftain was a sworn adherent for the moment of the havernarian dynasty what mattered an oath or two lovett always a jacobite at heart but cast by nature for an intriguer fought against the old pretender at the rising in scotland in seventeen fifteen and by taking inverness he gave to that rising a staggering blow he had served both sides had been a pensioner of both had betrayed both twice he had lived in outlawry and for months had roamed the most inaccessible mountains and glens of his native country a fugitive condemned to arrest and execution for high treason till a change in the english crown won for him a pardon what masterful manner of man was simon fraser he showed in the well-known incident of his marriage at twenty failing in his plan to secure an athol heiress he forcibly married her mother introducing a clergyman into her room at midnight the bagpipes were blown to stifle the lady's cries he might have seemed a legendary figure had not scotland's wild lawlessness the testimony of a thousand witnesses it was his ambition throughout his scheming life to be the biggest love it that ever was and at castle downey in invernessure when his fortune was in he kept feudal state a guest at his abundant table has picturesquely drawn the highland scene the lairds of the neighbourhood seated at the principal table next to them the dwinewassels or gentlemen of the clan lower down the tenants or common husbandmen and below the utmost extent of the board at the door and sometimes without the door of the hall gathered a multitude of frasers destitute of shoes or bonnets regaling themselves upon the lord's bounty the bait of a dukedom of fraser proffered by the chevalier brought lovett over he was too infirm for action but his clan awaited only his word to throw themselves with highland ferocity into the struggle he sent his son with a fiery cross to rouse the countryside while himself professing loyalty to king george which none believed lovett was not at culloden waiting at gordelug to receive news he saw the wild and desolate vale below him suddenly fill with horsemen riding furiously a child who was there in afterlife recorded that the unexpected appearance of the confused multitude had seemed to her a vision of fairies and that in accordance with highland tradition she strove to refrain from moving her eyelid lest the vision should disappear lovett's old eyes saw no fairies they saw from a hillside he had fled precipitously the spectacle of castle downey ablaze set on fire by butcher cumberland's soldiers prince charles edward he met for the first and only time in the rout he urged further resistance but the gambler in lives for a crown had staked and lost then confiding his life to his faithful clansmen those fine scots whom no inducement of life or reward would turn from loyalty to the chieftain unable himself to walk a step unsupported lovett was carried by them mile after mile over hill and glen to scotland's west coast and in an island on loch morer believed that he had found safe refuge for he possessed the only boat on the lake a searching man of war's party found him at last concealed in a hollow tree with his legs showing muffled up in flannel like those of a gouty alderman another story was that he was disturbed when lying comfortably ensconced between two feather beds neither matters he was safe trapped he was conveyed in a horse litter from stirling to edinburgh and thence by berwick over the long journey to london the white hart inn st albans was the last resting place and there hogarth saw him and drew the characteristic portrait here reproduced lovett once secure in the tower had no illusions as to his fate 
as he passed in a coach to westminster hall for trial by his peers a woman looked in at the window and called coarsely to him you ugly old dog don't you think you will have that frightful head cut off you ugly old bitch i believe i shall he retorted the tide of his life was ebbing out but while any chance remained the old fox tried his cunning he wrote to cumberland reminding him that often he had carried him in his arms in the parks at kensington and hampton court and held him up for the admiration of his royal grandfather what use could there be in the destruction of a hundred very infirm old men like himself past seventy and without the least use of hands legs or knees a gruff reply from the prince's secretary was the only response the evidence of connivance at rebellion was overwhelming and there was no real defence horace walpole wrote to man i have been living at old lovett's trial it lasted seven days the old creature's behaviour has been foolish and at last indecent when he came to the tower he told them that if he were not so old and infirm they would find it difficult to keep him there they told him they had kept much younger yes said he but they were inexperienced they had not broke so many jails as i have at his own house he used to say that for thirty years of his life he never saw a gallows but it made his neck ache the last two days he behaved ridiculously joking and making everybody laugh even at the sentence when he withdrew he said adieu my lords we shall never meet again in the same place he says he will be hanged for that his neck is so short and bended that he should be struck in the shoulders i did not think it possible to feel so little as i did at so melancholy a spectacle but tyranny and villainy wound up by buffoonery took off all edge of concern lovett had played his part and now could throw aside the mask he did not ask for his life there came from him no whining appeal for mercy and clemency little doubt that he was a great villain but his end was nothing ignoble walpole allows that he died extremely well he joked with the major of the tower on the morning of execution i am preparing myself sir for a place where hardly any majors and very few lieutenant generals go he gave to the warders a bit of his philosophy the end of all human grandeur is like this snuff of tobacco he declared as he knocked the ashes out of his pipe others greater than lovett have arrived by toilsome roads at that same truth he said he was to die as a highland chief should do that was not in his bed he passed his compliments to the governor's wife on leaving his prison and was conveyed in the governor's coach to the bulwark gate where the sheriffs awaited him and again by coach to a house before the scaffold there his friends were permitted to gather about him when a gentleman offered prayer lovett called a warder to help him to kneel and afterwards prayed silently for a brief space he took a little brandy and bitters the prospect of immediate death found him remarkably composed he desired that his clothes might be delivered to his friends with his corpse and asked of the sheriffs that his head might be received in a cloth and put into the coffin a further request was oddly thought of in the circumstances it was that the head should not be held up to the multitude's gaze at the four corners of the scaffold as had been customary at the execution of all traitors since medieval times learning that his desire would be conceded though no written order had been received to allow it the old man was obviously pleased a couple of warders gripped him tightly supporting his weight as he toilsomely ascended the few steps to the scaffold 
seeing then for the first time the great concourse of people that had assembled a flash of his old humour came back god save us he said looking round why should there be such a bustle about taking off a grey old head that cannot get up three steps without three bodies to support it an overcrowded stand fell some persons being killed and others maimed the greater the mischief the better the sport love it is said to have remarked as though himself merely a spectator of the day's event but so many phrases have been attributed to him that i am sceptical of crediting any he was placed in a chair and asked for the executioner to whom he presented ten guineas in a purse desiring to see the axe he felt its edge and said he believed it would do soon he rose looked at his coffin read the inscription with apparent approval and sitting down again repeated from horace the line dulce et decorum est pro patria mori did old lovett believe himself a patriot dying for his country and that that made sweet the sacrifice who shall say others as deep in double dealing as he have held such flattering to their souls and therein have found consolation he knelt at the block but being placed too near had to obtain assistance from the warder to be drawn back mayhap there flashed through his mind at that moment a vision of what in the circumstances could not be the stately funeral of a highland chieftain that he had foreseen for himself with every piper from edinburgh to john o'groats assembled to play his dirge that was his last unsatisfied vanity after half a minute he delivered the sign by dropping his handkerchief to the ground and the executioner severed the head from the body the old fox died like a lion certainly i think his remembrance should be borne on the memorial stone in my day the house was standing overlooking trinity square in the place of execution where lovett and the other rebel lords of the forty five kilmarnock and balmerino were taken for a few moments rest before being passed out to the scaffold it was the north corner building of catherine court but it has been swept away like so much else about this quiet end of the city where the port of london authority is erecting its immense new offices destroying most things they will show you in a crypt of the tower a headsman's axe and at its side the block upon which simon fraser lord lovett was decapitated the last a heavy piece of gnarled oak standing twenty and one-half inches high and brown with oil and age two deep original cuts are upon it athwart the flat and narrow ledge between the large space scooped out on one side to receive the shoulders and the small recess opposite for the chin it used to be said that the cuts were made when the axe fell that ended the lives of lords kilmarnock and balmerino and i believe the old label so gave its story but almost invariably two blows were needed completely to sever the head from the trunk and the fact that there are these and no more shows that the block was used only once it was long in possession of john poyden a warder who when his own death drew near devised this gruesome gift to the tower old simon fraser lord lovett was the last man beheaded on tower hill a full century and three quarters ago sir simon de burley tutor of king richard the second was the first to suffer on this same place in the year thirteen eighty eight the more honourable death of the axe simon's both and there will be no more the headsman's craft has gone from out our midst a lost british industry lovett's coffin plate bearing the words simon dominus fraser de lovett de calat april nine seventeen forty seven engraved in the lead and the age wrongly given as eighty 
you may see on the west wall by the door of the little church of st peter ad vincula within the tower his remains were placed in the same church beneath a stone curiously marked with two rings and a lozenge joined by a shaft where kilmarnock and balmerino rested by his side you almost step upon it entering they have no other monument these three victims of the forty-five and no more than a share is theirs of the memories that clutter so thickly about that little square of paved brick upon the execution ground whereon the children play stay i am wrong i had thought that london bore no resemblance of the scottish rebellion long since discounted and forgotten but there is a tavern near by that honors them in its sign in the parlor of the three lords minories during whatever the licensing hours may be there are many more learned than myself in these matters you still may pledge a health to charlie over the border End of chapter 3chapter four of more about unknown london by walter george bell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by janet chapter four an election of sheriffs did you ever find guildhall locked and barred against you with two and twenty gates in line two and twenty heads peering over the tops each head surmounted by a gold-laced three-cornered cap conferring dignity two and twenty maces held in hand by the owners of the heads an awesome sight i warrant you i have so found guildhall there must be great doings in the city this day i reasoned for guildhall porch thus to be fortified with outer defences debarring a citizen in his plain civic duty of paying his rates an election of sheriffs was to take place as always on midsummer day of each year and these were precautions taken to secure that none but the elect of the city should participate we know on elizabethan authority that of a subject there is no public officer of any city in europe that may compare in port and countenance with the lord mayor of london during the time of his office next to my lord mayor himself no civic official stands so high as the sheriff let no intruder raise his unauthorized hand to vote him into office i looked at that line of defences and imagination reeled perhaps it was the martial array of heads the gold lace the maces held so threateningly that made me think the owners of these faces were fierce men i am told that is not so they are the beetles of the various livery companies they are fathers of families many of them good and lawful men of the city who pay their scot and bear their lot and so they all say i fall into this habit of speaking at guildhall but i did not feel myself called upon to challenge the two-and-twenty defenders of the city's undoubted right and privilege to elect its sheriffs without hindrance from outside authority what chance should I have had in the melee, with all those knobby maces, like whirlbats, raining blows about my head and shoulders? The defenders do not stand each in his own little fort, as you might think, for there is nothing behind the gates. They are in line, ready to rain force should assault be levied upon any particular place of entry. That is a trick they learnt from the European war, I do not doubt. The heads over the high wooden gates held me fascinated, and it was some time before I noticed above each gate strange writings. Tallow chandlers, tin plate workers, turners, tylers, was one. Barbers, basket makers, blacksmiths, boyers, appeared over another. These last are men who bend the English U. Only those free of the city and members of one or another or several of the livery companies are qualified to vote for sheriffs 
whatever his company the elector must approach at his own marked gate and the beadle is there to recognize him and failing recognition to challenge before giving admittance i found myself an onlooker at this particular common hall by what devious means the deed was compassed do not inquire as stealthily i stepped through the medieval porch there went ahead sir homewood crawford the city solicitor him i avoided long ago common counsel had committed to the city solicitor the prosecution of parties hired by interested persons to come to guild hall for the purpose of disturbing survival elections there must have been reason for that in the good old times strong in innocence of such intention i entered great guild hall where my sense was refreshed by the pleasant smell of sweet herbs crushed under the feet their scent pervaded the atmosphere they had been thickly strewn about the dias for thereon the mighty ones of the city were shortly to take their places this was for their protection it is an ancient custom bringing back the fragrance of long dead years dating from a time when there was danger of plague or other infection in any large company of men the strong smell of herbs was then counted a prophylactic for this reason the judge of assize had herbs laid upon his desk to ward off the dreadful jail fever born perhaps by the shuddering prisoner the lord mayor the sheriffs and high officers were in like manner guarded at elections from contamination should it come from the voters massed below soon the mighty ones entered in procession a blaze of red coats and gold epaulets scarlet fur-trimmed robes and fur hats the sword borne upright and the mace shouldered color rioting against the gray old walls the lord mayor tall a striking figure was in full dress slashes of gold lace lightening his black gown wearing the feathered hat congratulations my lord baron on your new dignity the sheriffs robed in scarlet aldermen who had passed the chair the same and many aldermen in purple gowns i noticed that each of these and also the recorder in wig and gown the town clerk similarly attired and others carried in the hand a neatly tied posy of flowers that is another venerated city custom the carrying of the bouquet a grace of times past brought into times present these thought i are much better than the drab surroundings when last i cast my vote in a county council election the city of london boasting a continuous history longer than that of any other corporation holds fast to every one of its venerable traditions it has the saving grace of being picturesque in all its actions so welcome in these gray days some shallow minds affect derision of the city's civic splendor the steel and fur and gold which i hold to be among its most valuable possessions based as is all this state upon immemorial custom it survives because it is so old it may be envied by younger corporations it cannot without offence be copied common hall was opened in due form oys oys called the common crier stepping to the front of the diaz and from his first words i realized how little yet the city fathers felt safe from intrusion all you declared the common crier who are not liverymen depart this hall on pain of imprisonment i experienced a cold shiver though the june day was warm others that officer admonished to draw near and give your attendance god save the king then from the common sergeant came an announcement that brought back the spirit of a medieval age i looked around for footmen in armor at least for halberdiers but of these the city has none the lord mayor and his highly placed brethren would withdraw while the votes were being given in order that the livery should exercise 
free and unfettered their undoubted right of election undeterred by their presence i understood recalling what harrison had written that in port and countenance none can compare with my lord mayor should he frown when a candidate's name came forward how should the elector be unmoved or his choice be unfettered at a signal from the lord mayor the procession was reformed and passed out of guildhall to the common chamber where sword and mace were rested upon a bed of luxurious rose blooms for the interval of waiting the colour went out of guildhall with them but the fragrance remained and there remained the two outgoing sheriffs scarlet clad one at each corner of the dais front the names of candidates were called over those for sheriff numbered seven but three were passed over their appearance being formal for latter nomination it was not until the fourth when okup c c was called that first was raised the cry of all all and a forest of right hands was held up two new sheriffs were to be elected and this was the first actual man beside each sheriff right and left a short flagstaff was reared and the name of the candidate contained in a frame in movable letters placed in order to spell it out was run up dick whittington was elected sheriff in this precise way five centuries ago no doubt he had smelt the sweet herbs strewing the floor as i had smelt them and had seen his name run up in the chalked or roughly painted letters with by chance indifferent spelling but these movable letters are of the age of the typewriter and american office routine a modernism which the city should at once cast out to my eye they constituted the one blemish on the time-honored ceremonial the elector's choice is given by show of hands and the sheriffs each with white-gloved finger pointing made the count no easy task when the votes rank in hundreds the counts agreed candidate number five had a bare dozen supporters but the name of number six being submitted guildhall up to its rafters rang again with the cry of all all and again a forest of hands was elevated it was plain which two had the bulk of support the count was repeated number seven had a few dozen hands and there was a ribald cry of all all and some laughter i had rather the limitation of one man to one company was observed it was so in old days i do not think that members of four or five companies turning up to vote in block for their man makes for that real freedom of election which the liveries justly claim the sheriffs announced the figures a poll of the livery was promptly demanded on behalf of one of the defeated candidates and pending report to the lord mayor common hall went on with the next business that being the election of bridge masters and ale conners the office of bridge master is one of small profit rooted in antiquity going back to the time when london had only the one stone bridge built by king john its duties are light and i understand the bearer is charged to see by personal inspection once or twice each week that the city bridges have not slid into the thames at night or are not in such disrepair as to make that event likely the post is usually given to some brother who has served the city well and from whom fortune has withheld her favours there are two bridge masters and but two candidates presenting themselves both were re-elected of ale conners on the other hand the city requires seven a thirsty city this london with repute for the good quality of its ale not lightly to be gainsaid in olden days it drank its potations deep it perhaps is not without significance that the liber albus 
that code of city laws and precedences compiled by Richard Whittington, mayor, and John Carpenter, his town clerk, mentions no ale measure of less capacity than a quart. The Connors must see to it that quality is maintained, and report to the Lord Mayor and Aldermen should infractions by Brewsters come to their notice. For the Brewsters, or alewives, did most of the medieval trade in brewing ale, which curiously was not accounted an occupation for men. How much of the right of search and taste in city taverns survives in practice, I cannot say. But there has been no legal impairment of the ancient powers, and the ale conners still are elected by the livery, as in old times. The mayoral procession returned into Guild Hall, sword and mace having been raised from their bed of rose blooms. The sheriffs reported the result of the show of hands and the demand for a poll. A legal gentleman in wig and gown stepped to the front, but Common Hall, having by this time relapsed into a buzz of conversation, his words were inaudible. I thought perhaps he dealt in common law and was giving the sanction of the church to the election, but that was not so. Oys, oys, in the strident tones of the common crier again called all to attention, and with the announcement that the poll for sheriffs would take place at Guildhall on the next succeeding Friday, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 7 p.m., the ceremony, which held me greatly interested, was at an end. Fortunate London! Venice, which held the gorgeous East in fee, has passed. The Grand Mogul, seated amidst the splendor of Oriental magnificence, where is that despot? But this free city of London of a thousand years keeps alive in honors today, customs and ceremonies as old as were theirs. Long may it flourish in the centuries that are to come. We have a madness to reduce everything in public life to the level of the black coat, and after that is accomplished, no doubt, to the shirt sleeves. I agree that ceremonial cannot aptly be created today, but having it as our inheritance, why not value it? It is only the dour, unimaginative souls who rail at ceremony, and pity there are so many of them. I found my friend Day, C.C., a lawyer, come from out the mass of the electors to whisper into my ear. Okup has by far the biggest show of hands. I think he is safe at the poll and he confided to me that if Okup were returned sheriff, he would himself be his under-sheriff. Then you will have to attend any executions of criminals there are about, the sheriff not being present? I said, and he nodded approval. Well, every man to his liking. That is not a duty of office that I covet. Rather would I con the nut-brown ale or enjoy the health-giving open-air life of a bridge-master. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of More About Unknown London by Walter George Bell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet Chapter 5 Anne Boleyn's Letter I stood the other day in the little chamber in the lieutenant's lodgings of the Tower of London, wherein Queen Anne Boleyn slept her last night on earth. That is the tradition it has, and with a place of such long and varied associations as the Tower, often there is nothing more material than tradition upon which to depend. A doubt is cast over it, when one recalls that first cry of horror uttered by the unhappy queen as she realized that she was shut into the grim fortress prison. Mr. Kingston, shall I go into a dungeon? The old constable of the tower answered, No, madam, you shall go into your lodging, that you lay in at your coronation. That we have from a hand near his time, and because of it, 
often it has been assumed that anne boleyn's last days were spent in the old royal palace within the tower those buildings oliver cromwell has the credit a century after having destroyed foreseeing no future use for royal palaces for kings chalpies the ambassador has left on record that the queen needlessly enhanced her grief and misery by looking out of her window upon the scene of the execution of the five gentlemen condemned with her in that case the royal apartments certainly cannot have been her doleful prison they stretched out beyond the wakefield tower any view of tower hill being impossible it is for every reason unlikely that henry the eighth would have committed to confinement in his own royal chambers his dishonoured and discarded queen whom he seems to have pursued with inhuman enmity many things point to the use of the lieutenant's lodgings the king's house of to-day it was at that time the newest building in the tower there kingston and his wife could sleep outside the queen's door as he says they did it fits in with chapu's statement the yeoman warder attending as i sought the queen's chamber made part of the picture of the house for he wore the uniform of king henry the eighth for whom was built this old mansion red tiled and with its heavy oak timbers below the gables now exposed g r was embroidered upon the tunic that was the only change he led the way up two flights of stairs then along a passage lighted by the windows looking inwards upon the stone paved space of tower green which the ravens striding away with long hops make their undisturbed home the key turned in the lock of the door opening into a square room fourteen feet it measures on every side and there is dark brown wainscoting of plain oak up to the low ceiling the white ceiling can almost be touched by an upstretched hand it is but eight feet above the floor this was the queen's room outside the single casement window the rampart walls extended the battlement being visible and one realized that the wall fell sheer the spell was upon the place i thought it the most pathetic prison within the tower others there are in plenty where naked stone walls and narrow lights piercing a great thickness of masonry plainly tell their purpose strongholds that have held doomed men till the time came when they should pass out to die the low window the rampart without it is princess queen elizabeth's walk a raised way from the bauchum tower to the bell tower these seemed to invite escape the yeoman warder recalled that always there would be an armed sentry patrolling besides where should a prisoner escape from this height by the window is a fireplace on the stone above someone sentry's back has scratched an inscription too faint today to be decipherable but there is what may be the word anna the little room without furniture is kept as when queen anne boleyn used it nothing changed save that the squares of glass are set in a modern casement a little room of sad memories instinctively one lowers the voice speaking in it paying them reverence here if tradition does not belie anne boleyn woke early in the dark of a may morning to hear mass and prepare for the end these four walls were the last she looked upon before she went down the stairs and out to the scaffold the queen on may second fifteen thirty six was brought from greenwich by water to the tower which was her prison till the nineteenth a brief seventeen days witnessed the fall from her high estate the arrest trial sentence and execution and on the morning after the bloody tragedy was committed henry the eighth married jane seymour 
it was a distracted woman who beyond the steps at traitor's gate was handed over to the constable jesu have mercy on me anne boleyn cried and then she kneeled down weeping a great space and in the same sorrow fell into a great laughing and so she did several times afterwards it is all very human sir william kingston too old a servant of the crown to question the king's justice and much given to eavesdropping seems to have treated the unhappy queen with the greatest consideration his wife lady kingston and the queen's aunt lady boleyn were her personal attendants little has transpired concerning those days spent within the tower save her protestations of innocence and the women's conversation laboriously reported to cromwell but there is a letter by kingston himself to that same master secretary dated the day before the execution which shows that harsh times and his hard task had not destroyed the humanity in him at my coming she said mr kingston i hear say that i shall not die afore none and i am very sorry therefore for i thoth to be dead by this time and past my pain i told her it should be no pain it was so subtle and then she said i have heard say the executioner was very good and i have a little neck and put her hand about it lawing heartily i have seen many men and also women executed and that they have been in great sorrow and to my knowledge this lady has much joy and pleasure in her death i glanced through the window curious to see how far the view extended over the battlement and beyond the moat looking west the rise of tower hill with all that gives its character to-day all the distant tall warehouses was spread out below though clear vision was obstructed by the leafless trees the actual scaffold upon which the alleged participants with her in crime perished must i think have been mercifully sheltered from the queen's anxious eyes but the assembly of thousands of people in deep masses the commotion the little human ants as they seem from this height and distance going out to witness the death of their fellow ant perhaps the noise rising to her quiet chamber will have been sufficient indication that her despairing appeal to henry to spare at least the lives of these had been as fruitless as had been the defence of her own good fame in this little room one must believe in such privacy as was allowed to her in her bedchamber anne boleyn wrote the famous and touching letter to king henry the eighth if indeed that letter was ever written it is reproduced at length in facsimile here and is well known four years after queen anne boleyn met her destined fate cromwell whose statecraft had sent so many men to the block the stake and the gibbet himself passed to execution on tower hill and on his papers being ransacked afterwards this letter was found among them that has been the traditional story the document bears the endorsement in three lines now mutilated the lady a to the king h of the tower which has been represented to be in cromwell's handwriting out of that material a legend has been woven in years when history was much less scientific than it is today the letter never came to henry's knowledge all correspondence passed to cromwell and he intercepted it cromwell one recalls was among the company the lord mayor and aldermen of london being others who at the king's request stood round the scaffold at tower green whereon anne boleyn suffered there is much that may justly be charged against cromwell's memory that he was hard and ruthless is unquestioned but it is not necessary to load him with the infamy 
of possessing this piteous appeal from a queen to a king from a wife to a husband and standing by while the headsman's sword flashed swift and true doing nothing whether henry ever received the original or not none can tell it is plain that the letter now in the national possession is not an original letter it is in the Cantonian MSS at the British Museum, accessible to all who call for it. The fire at the Cantonian Library in 1731, which did great destruction among the manuscripts, has burnt away parts at the edges, but full transcripts had been made. Frode, whose first impression was strongly in favor of the letter's authenticity, afterwards became dubious dr gardner after long years of experience in handling tudor documents among the state papers declared it to be a manifest forgery that may be so but the clubbing method in history i do not care for why forged and by whom it is difficult to suggest the only explanation at all plausible that can be made is that when elizabeth succeeded to the crown it was an effort on the part of someone to rehabilitate the good fame of her mother and so curry favor by producing a concocted letter plainly the letter as we have it is a copy and that it is quite honestly a copy without pretension of being anything else is evident from the appearance on the same sheet of a fragment of another letter from anne boleyn a draft it might seem the document is written without a sign of emotion in a good clerkly hand completed without a single correction save that a not is interlined and in one sentence let me receive an open trial the word have was first penned and then crossed out for receive but that in the same line a distraught woman would not have written so I fancy the writing is Elizabethan. Nor does it appear that the endorsement has any real similarity to Cromwell's handwriting. The whole romantic story seems to fall to the ground. We are in the presence of an historical mystery which may be insolvable, and failing the production of an original holograph, can judge on the insecure basis of the contents alone. The letter is remarkable. It reads true. That is, I think, the impression that everyone must receive on a first reading. Its honesty seems so transparent. The phrases move along in such natural order. It expresses, in words that are simple and unforced, just what one would expect in the circumstances to find expressed. So that reading one makes a mental picture of the anguished woman in her prison writing it to question its authenticity seems almost dishonorable inhuman such is the power of words and the spell which the pitiful story of anne boleyn has weaved about her authentic or not the letter has passages that have become part of our literature and i give it here not pandering to the silly vanity that, of course, everyone knows it. Sir, your grace's displeasure and my imprisonment are things so strange unto me as what to write or what to excuse. I am altogether ignorant. Whereas you send unto me, willing me to confess a truth and so to obtain your favor, by such an one whom you know to be mine antient professed enemy. I no sooner conceived this message by him than I rightly conceived your meaning, and if, as you say, confessing a truth indeed may procure my safety, I shall with all willingness and duty perform your command. But let not your grace ever imagine that your poor wife will ever be brought to acknowledge a fault where not so much as a thought ever proceeded and to speak a truth never a prince had wife more loyal in all duty and in all true affection than you have ever found in anne boleyn with which name and place 
i could willingly have contented myself if god and your grace's pleasure had been so pleased neither did i at any time so far forget myself in my exaltation or received queenship but that i always looked for such an alteration as now i find for the ground of my preferment being on no sure foundation than your grace's fancy the least alteration was fit and sufficient i knew to draw that fancy to some other subject you have chosen me from a low estate to be your queen and companion far beyond my desert or desire if then you found me worthy of such honour good your grace let not any light fancy or bad counsel of mine enemies withdraw your princely favour from me neither let that stain that unworthy stain of a disloyal heart towards your good grace ever cast so foul a blot on your most dutiful wife and the infant princess your daughter try me good king but let me have a lawful trial and let not my sworn enemies sit as my accusers and my judges yea let me receive an open trial for my truth shall fear no open shame then shall you see either mine innocency cleared your suspicion and conscience satisfied the ignominy and slander of the world stopped or my guilt openly declared so that whatsoever god or you may determine of me your grace may be freed from an open censure and mine offence being so lawfully proved your grace is at liberty both before god and man not only to execute worthy punishment on me as an unlawful wife but to follow your affection already settled on that party for whose sake i am now as i am whose name i could some good while since have pointed unto your grace not being ignorant of my suspicion therein but if you have already determined of me and that not only my death but an infamous slander must bring you the joying of your desired happiness then i desire of god that he will pardon your great sin therein and likewise mine enemies the instruments thereof and that he will not call you to a strict account for your unprincely and cruel usage of me at his general judgment seat where both you and myself must shortly appear and in whose just judgment i doubt not whatsoever the world may think of me mine innocence shall be openly known and sufficiently cleared my last and only request shall be that myself may only bear the burden of your grace's displeasure and that it may not touch the innocent souls of those poor gentlemen who as i understand are likewise in straight imprisonment for my sake if ever i have found favour in your sight if ever the name of anne boleyn hath been pleasing in your ears then let me obtain this request and so i will leave to trouble your grace any further with mine earnest prayers to the trinity to have your grace in his good keeping and to direct you in all your actions from my doleful prison in the tower the sixth of may your most loyal and ever faithful wife anne boleyn now read this a second and a third time till the spell has gone and there comes a cankering doubt and that doubt grows the date is important it is four days after her arrival in the tower if this is the queen's letter to henry the eighth then it contains most things calculated to defeat its purpose which was an appeal to have justice openly done to her the reference to jane seymour who to her knowledge here disclosed had already supplanted anne boleyn in the king's affections could only rouse his furious resentment and make his merciless determination immovable if the letter is genuine transferring the charge of unfaithfulness from herself to him then the shaft was driven into the wound in which a man so jealous as henry was most sensitive and there rankling 
it does much to explain the extraordinary vindictiveness of henry towards his discarded queen the feasts and masks and entertainments in which he indulged while the death judgment against the imprisoned woman was still pending his dressing all in white on the day of the execution and the immediate marriage thereafter with jane seymour high objects of state despite frode's tireless efforts do not satisfactorily explain this last if the letter be genuine i repeat it contains most things calculated to defeat its purpose if it is an invention of elizabeth's reign designed to rehabilitate in public esteem the tarnished memory of that great queen's unhappy mother then it contains most things calculated to achieve that purpose it is quite uncannily skilful read as having that last purpose with that object fixed in the reader's mind then the bias is that it is a forgery yet i have been told that wise or unwise that phrase indicating anne boleyn's rival is the strongest presumption of the letter's authenticity that to write it to drag in the wrong done to her no matter at what cost was a temptation that a woman wronged could not resist that so far from establishing the worthlessness of the document it is something near proof that anne wrote it she was not like cromwell practised in the gift of statesmanlike concealment of emotions hell knows no fury like a woman scorned if intimate knowledge of feminine psychology be necessary to unravel this tangled riddle then it does not necessarily follow that our most learned historians are the best judges only one who can penetrate a despairing woman's mind can say whether one so placed as was anne boleyn would write in these terms throwing all caution to the winds of heaven that gift i do not profess to possess every reader of this letter will form his or her own judgment any opinion i have myself formed little matters end of chapter five chapter six of more about unknown london by Walter George Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet. Chapter 6 An Old Printing House. Mostly you must seek in byways of the city for the surviving houses of the great period of rebuilding after the fire of London in 1666. Thousands then went up hastily. I have estimated their numbers elsewhere at nine thousand, making good that part of the devastation which the flames wrought, and thereafter there were the churches, St. Paul's Cathedral, the company's halls, and public buildings still to be raised, altogether costing millions. Our after-war housing schemes are nets, compared with what the restoration citizens not only talked about but accomplished the rebuilding act after the fire was insistent for future safety upon the use of brick and stone alone thereby it entirely transformed the appearance and character of the city giving to it a uniformity it had never known when all the houses were framed in stout oak and beech and rough plaster fronts and gables and steep red-tiled roofs were the mode each builder following his own bent there is a little left of the city built after the great fire seen by king charles the second and by mistress nell gwynne but you need wide open eyes to find it for there is very little look into quality court midway up chancery lane next time you are thereabouts for a surprise cheapside is the exception to my general statement that you must search the byways that historic thoroughfare 
has in number thirty seven a house which i take to be the earliest left standing among those dating from the great fire it is at the friday street corner a red brick house deep red turning with age a little purple like clotted blood still it bears set into the front one of the best of the london signs it is the carved stone sign of the chained swan a family crest and why displayed here i do not know except that it fits the house as well as any other a modern tablet tells the passer-by that this old brick building was the only one in cheapside that escaped the flames of sixteen sixty six i don't believe it for reasons that are amply adequate but hold that this is more likely to be a house built just as london was beginning to rise out of its ruins in the years sixteen sixty seven to eight an assurance i have had that during internal reconstruction in nineteen twenty beams taken out bore evidence of having been charred by flame does not move my disbelief another of these great fire houses is elkington's in cheapside number seventy three the old mansion house so called from the tradition of its having been built for sir william turner lord mayor in sixteen sixty eight to nine he leased for his mayoralty carpenter's hall standing near the city's northern wall which had escaped the fire so i judge the house was not then ready but many subsequent lord mayors are said to have kept their mayoralty here in cheapside before the mansion house was built and made ready in seventeen fifty three for sir crisp gascoigne its first occupant some builder's decorator or someone with his taste has concealed the original front beneath a mass of ornate stucco ornament rubbish which i have prayed some gale might peel off into cheapside and disclose the honest brick beneath it were fitting that the stuff should kill the decorator in its fall only long years back in the course of nature his misspent life must have ended by less violent means the house is shown stucco covered in a print of nearly a century ago it is undoubtedly authentic of the after-fire period and within there is a magnificent chestnut staircase with heavy balusters and rail covetous americans good judges too have offered bundles of dollars for that staircase honor to those good englishmen and londoners who resisting temptation have kept it for us beyond these are the three tiny shops in cheapside welcome gifts from the past originally till a street widening they numbered four they stand at the wood street corner over which the famous plane tree spreads its summer leaves and shadow where wordsworth heard a thrush singing a picturesque corner familiar to all city men the midgets were built together in the year sixteen eighty seven as a tablet placed high on the rear wall tells on parish ground of st peter cheap they front the city's most important thoroughfare and are so small the smallest houses in all the city because the site is but a few feet deep each consisting of a single room above and a mere box of a shop below a red brick house with the string course across it which fills the back of bow churchyard looking out on cheapside is contemporary with wren's st Marley bow church it has a double floor of rooms and i have envied the tenant who values them the occupancy of his sheltered quiet city residence eager to eject and replace him but he shows a distressing robustness of life many people think that the old houses of london's rebuilding after the great fire have gone 
though a mere handful of all those built survives, I call to mind without effort places where bunches of them stand together, in Crane Court and Racket Court off Fleet Street, Quality Court in Chancery Lane, and Wardrobe Place, Doctors' Commons. The temple has large numbers of houses of the period. Inner temple was almost completely burnt out in the Great Fire, and there was a second disastrous fire in the temple in 1679. In King's Bench Walk, the cloisters, Pump Court, Essex Court, New Court, Lamb Building, and elsewhere, you find them. Many bear dates over their decorated doorways. For an example of the great house, there is the deanery of St. Paul's. Two only, and those somewhat late, survive in wardrobe place Doctor's Commons, which, till a destroyer came a few years ago, was built about by these late 17th century houses. It is still one of the most picturesque byways of the city, with trees bearing leaf in summer a shaded, quiet, close nestling by St. Paul's. A kindly Anthonium reviewer of unknown London charged me with being discursive. Perish the thought that I should be anything else. But it is time to stride out towards the particular after-fire printing house of which I am on this occasion the Ciceroni, not of such buildings in general. That house is in Crane Court and Red Lion Court, two adjacent footways off Fleet Street, with its chief entrance and paved square upon the court, named after the impossibly colored lion. It is last in the row of houses in Crane Court, here shown by the photographer's skillful aid. The house in the forefront, number four, a fine example of the type, remarkably fine, has the date 1671 over the door, so fixes the period. The better aspect of the printing house is upon Red Lion Court. That side is represented in the drawing reproduced by my old friend, now dead, Mr. Tom Way. Guess you will, very early on a visit, that this is not one house, but three there you guess correctly, but the plan I do not profess to understand. There was a fire in Crane Court not long ago, so recently as 1877. It gave us, in exchange for a house I would rather have seen preserved, the modern castellated building of the Scottish Corporation filling the head of the court, which I have always felt should have looked out upon a Scottish moor, rather than upon the somewhat dingy passage. Nicholas Barbone, a great builder after the fire of London, erected the original house, occupied after him by a son of that gifted physician, Sir Thomas Brown, of Norwich, author of the Religio Medici. Nick, if my genealogy does not go astray, was cousin once removed of that well-named Puritan baptized if Christ had not died for thee, thou had been damned barebone. Men called him for short, damned barebone. That was inevitable. The house destroyed by this Victorian fire had enjoyed full seventy years immortal fame, for it became the headquarters of the Royal Society under Sir Isaac Newton's presidency. Each night, when the Society was in session, a light was shown at the entrance to the court from Fleet Street to indicate that the lamp of philosophy burnt brightly above. There remains at the back in Newton Hall, sacred these later days to the positivists, an old building in which maybe Newton's voice has been heard. I have lingering a suspicion that the Crane Court angel of my printing house was in some way connected with the Royal Society's rooms, an annex, perhaps. Its ornamentation confers more distinction than would be expected in a small merchant's residence. 
the Red Lion Court House had obvious importance of its own. For well nigh a century, Messrs. Taylor and Francis, printers of scientific publications, have occupied the joint premises. Velpe, publisher of the Delphin Classics, was there before them. There is a little paved square over which you enter, still preserving a few of the original black and white marble lozenges. One imagines it in late Stuart and William and Mary days, with little bay trees set about in green painted tubs, and people, substantial merchants were resident about Fleet Street then, sitting out in the sunshine that comes into the court, or enjoying the cool of a summer evening, after dinner partaken, and the wine had gone round. The fine rooms, amply proportioned with tall doors and walls panelling up to the decorated plaster ceilings, were surely made for hospitality. There is a substantial length of the grand staircase remaining, stout and wide and solid. It turns to the landing on the first floor. Pity this is only a fragment, for it is characteristic of an age when builders had ideas of solidity, using oak for the twisted balusters and the massive rail, now browned with age and polish. With William and Mary, mahogany came into use, and more fragile designs were favored. Men lent less heavily, perhaps, after the bottle. The same type of twisted baluster and rail is found on the stairs leading to the topmost floor of the incorporated house in Crane Court. But the real delight of the house is in its generously panelled rooms, and especially their ceilings. Professor A. E. Richardson has described these last with an architect's insight, and gladly I borrow, or should he prefer the term steel, this passage from him. On the first floor the fine rooms, designed by Sir Christopher Wren, with geometrical panels and plaster enriching the ceilings, are preserved intact and form a most charming suite. These ceilings are the work of a master hand, the plaster work being designed and modeled with a large, rich firmness, as though the designer and craftsman were experimenting with great gusto in congenial material, possibly as an exercise for a bigger enterprise. One of the ceilings has a large circular compartment with rounded, flowered molding about three inches in depth, and the designs in the side compartments are varied in depth according to position, being thickest further from the windows. It must have been a rich forest of lights and shadows in the firelight, very appropriate to the old tenants in their plum-colored coats and canary waistcoats and laced ruffles, and very pleasant for philosophers to raise their eyes to as they pondered over such wild new ideas as Newton's theory of gravitation. If this gravitation was all that it was cracked up to be, they may have thought, these heavily molded plaster roses and leaves ought to have fallen on their noses. But the whole ceiling is today almost unbroken and as fine as ever, though it looks down now on piles of old books and papers and the odds and ends of a publisher's storeroom. Note the ascription to Sir Christopher Wren. He thinks this to be a Wren house. There we part company, myself with some diffidence, for I have not an architect's training. I am blind to much of the work attributed to Wren, to Grinling Gibbons, and to Chippendale, whose output must have been super colossal if all were genuine. And in this case admit myself wholly unconvinced. When in a city church or a dealer's shop, I am told that the wood carving is by Grinling Gibbons, I reply, 
of course it flatters the owners as though the claim were too obviously genuine to be questioned but really is non-committal but if a link with wren exists in this printing house i have found it not in the building itself which might be anybody's but in that particular large circular compartment of a plaster ceiling above alluded to why allow me to explain many people no doubt enter st vidas church in foster lane crowned with that wonderful pierced steeple which to me has seemed amongst the finest of wren's smaller works without ever looking up to its ceiling it is worth the glance up it is enriched centrally with panels of foliage contained within one large oblong panel formed by bands of ornament fruit and flowers in unusually bold relief the ceiling came to us somewhat curiously in the seventeenth century the tobacco reach had a centre at bidford in devon many italian workmen were there employed and some of them practised in spare hours the artistic craft of plaster working which they had followed in their native country wren chancing to see this work thought their skill would be usefully engaged in making ornament for his churches and brought the men to london now the design and craftsmanship of this circular plaster panel in the red lion court and crane court printing house are so much like the greater work in the city church of st vidast that a common origin is likely though how far wren's hand is involved is necessarily problematical other ceilings in the house have seemed to me of later date fine door cases a great deal of panelling and valuable old furniture and fittings engage attention in the rooms littered as they are with printing frames and type and innumerable papers if having freedom to wander about you come upstairs upon a little boxed-off compartment now i suppose almost unique in london it is the powder room there the fine dame or beau of early georgian times attended for the ministrations of the coiffure who with a little sprinkler blew the white powder upon the wigs making them resplendent for the day in the park or the evening's rout the window which has not been opened these many years has the original little leaded panes of glass the joy of the old place as often i have revisited it is that it preserves into these days a printing house just as the printer richardson the father of the english novel might have left it in another such house in salisbury court across fleet street richardson wrote pamela and his presses produced those other books of interminable letters of love craftiness and dejection which few honest men to-day i am honest myself can admit that they have read samuel johnson and richardson may have walked together up these same stairs the old printer did not always trouble to take a shop a dwelling-house served all purposes of his trade he placed his hand presses on the ground floor his cases of type were lodged on the floor above and he himself lived in the upper apartments with his apprentices afamia they were his servants and waited upon him and their mistress at table steam and machinery have transformed the printing trade but here is what i take to be the last printing house in the city of london that has stood out against the innovation of machinery nothing that turns on axle and wheel has ever entered here it keeps to the ancient ways one shudders to think how completely the old character of the house would be changed were boilers and steam pipes pulleys and belts to be obtruded into these comfortable rooms and staircases 
be laid out on the factory model in the press room under the roof are the very oldest of the hand presses well oiled and kept still printing the stanhope the first lever press replacing the old screw press which had come down but little changed from winkendward who introduced the art of printing into fleet street in the year fifteen o one the northumberland press the albion and the eagle it is slow work that is done by them the type being hand inked the lever pulled for each separate impression and but one side of a paper sheet printed at a time snail-like compared with the production of the steam-driven rotaries that with deafening noise dash off twenty thousand copies complete of a newspaper in a single hour but it is good work much of the very finest printing in london is done at this house nichols and goff the antiquaries and also the learned bower were printers at one time established in red lion court the first printer of eminence that i can positively trace to this particular house was valpi who came in eighteen twenty two that was eight years after the invention of the steam printing press valpi's sculptured sign the greek digamma still stands fixed on the exterior wall valpi adopted it as his trademark it appears on the title page of all his books on his letter paper indeed his vanity in his beloved trade sign was so great that he placed it on his carriage valpi is best remembered by this generation as the originator and printer of the delphin classics that huge undertaking consisted of a reprint in no fewer than one hundred and forty four volumes of the great classic writers all were set in type and printed in this house i found the full collection vellum bound in a dealer's list the other day and at twenty five pounds it was a cheap lot george dyer was the chief laborer upon them editing the whole series single-handed i like to picture him seated in august state with busts of the great figures of antiquity about him below the big circular panel of the plaster ceiling in that ample room already described it has the atmosphere for a big endeavor but this of course is all my fancy the cellar and garret have been thought good enough for the scholar's labors he lived in clifford's inn near by charles lamb his most intimate friend loved to poke fun at the simple-minded and erudite old scholar he was the amicus redivius of that delightful elia paper which relates how dyer on leaving lamb's cottage at islington with his head and thoughts in the air fell into the new river from which he was with difficulty fished up wet through and shivering on another occasion dyer had been visiting leah hunt and a quarter of an hour after leaving he returned saying that he believed he had left his shoe under the table he had in fact walked nearly half a mile before he noticed the loss dyer composed poetry in ten-syllable verse to g d wrote lamb a poem is a poem his own as good as anybody's and god bless him anybody's as good as his own for i do not think he has the most distant guess of the possibility of one poem being better than another valpi retired from the business in eighteen thirty seven and then richard taylor came to red lion court the founder of the present firm of taylor and francis was a remarkable man of great scientific gifts he was under secretary of the linnean society for nearly half a century a fellow of the royal astronomical and of the philological societies and of the society of antiquaries and an original member of the british association 
the Francis of the partnership was Dr. William Francis, also a man of considerable scientific attainments, who entered the business in 1852. Together they gained a great reputation for careful printing, and produced many important works in natural history, as well as beautiful editions of the classics. The Delphine classics were not Velpe's only great enterprise at this house. He also printed there the English translation of Greek and Latin classics in 52 volumes. I suppose that even these vast productions have been eclipsed by Messrs. Taylor and Francis, who have printed the proceedings of many of the learned societies year by year, enough to stock dozens of bookcases. Scientific printing is the special feature of the firm's work, and there are no forms used in the most abstruse mathematical calculations or words in almost any language living or dead, for which they could not at once provide the necessary type. The present head of the firm is my good friend, Mr. R. T. Francis, the younger son of the late Dr. William Francis, who died in 1904. He has suffered me with much forbearance when I have brought delighted parties of antiquaries to roam about his printing house. End of chapter 6《ハッシュタグもらばうあんのんロンドン》by Walter George Bell。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet。Chapter 7 Cries of Old London。Give credit for this paper, whatever may be due, to Sir Frederick Bridge and none to myself. I knew many of the London street cries. His merit is that he has found them all. Of course, I do not limit his merit to that. I have sat in abbey and concert room, and have heard from Sir Frederick Bridge delightful music. But this particular piece of antiquarian work was no mean accomplishment. His quest was music. Did you ever survey the big music catalogue of the British Museum Library? I shudder when I see its interminable volumes, and thank a kindly fate that that, at least, I may pass by. I, too, have delved deeply, but that stratum have I left alone. Sir Frederick is no coward. I picture him approaching the desk, and without a tremor calling for Orlando Gibbons, Wilkes, and Deering. Of course, it was open to anybody possessing nerve to dare as much. But how many had the knowledge of Sir Frederick Bridge as to where the old London street cries could be found? It is passing strange that while antiquaries were from a hundred sources, piecing together as much as we had known of them, they should have been lying all together in the British Museum Library. That cave of Ali Baba has held them in its mysterious depths these many years, inheriting the manuscripts, for Gibbons, Wilkes, and Deering were all contemporaries of Shakespeare. A happy thought first came to Wilkes to use the London cries as vocal parts to a fancy for viols. Let me explain that the fancy, Sir Frederick is authority, enlightening my musical ignorance, was an old and early form of instrumental chamber music, and the association of the vocal parts with this form was a new experiment. Certainly the cries cannot have seemed material of a promising libretto, but they were always in the streets, ready at hand for anyone to utilize at will. Orlando Gibbons appropriated the idea. There was no copyright. After him came Deering, one supplementing the other, and that we have today, 
not the words alone but the actual notes that resounded from the criers about the metropolis is plain from the fact that all three composers give the tunes alike i should need miss coral peachy and the philomel singers with mr stanley roper and mr graham smart to interpret the music as delighted i have heard them but the written cries shall interpret themselves it is a whole day that orlando gibbons and he is the fullest gives us of that elizabethan and earliest stuart london about which he walked with ears and eyes observant this same london of ours only its surface features much differed the city is to-day but a little embedded area the centre of the great blob that the dense metropolis makes on the map the city was london in queen elizabeth's and king james's time let us just peep into it as it stood when the cries were shouted a small city and two a walled city wall and river encircling the habitations across the thames on bankside in suffolk where the playhouses and the bear baiting ring much frequented london streets were narrow rough egg-shaped cobblestones made a paving which stretched from house to house there were no separate footways the houses were timber framed and built the walls filled in with laths bearing a coating of rough plaster the flat face strewn with adhering sand or gravel here and there some important merchant's mansion or traveller's inn had its ground story only of brick the poor lived in mere wooden hovels weather-boarded and smeared with pitch and often in cellars an open kennel ran down the centre or side of each street out on which poured the rain from the roofs and with it much refuse thrown from the houses was carried along towards the stinking town ditch and the river the houses of elizabethan london were dark and low that the walled city was picturesque in the mass i never doubt not being ourselves condemned to live in it there is no need to bother about its ugly side its high mortality from plague scattered from every point where people congregated its horrible insanitation well water often filtered through graveyards and general unwholesomeness the race must have been strong to have endured london rose early about its work and went early to bed the city gates closing against horse and wheeled traffic at sunset the wickets closed at dark when all the alehouses shut their doors out of the still night you might have heard the cry god give you good morrow my masters past three o'clock and a fair morning that was the watchman's hail he swings his horn lantern as he stamps along it is a summons back three and a half centuries and i propose to be up bedtimes with gibbons making the round of the streets with him as he goes about collecting the cries the eastward sky lightens pointing the city gables the first sun rays come aslant the high wall and the grey fortress tower giving a warm glow to the red tiled roofs already the fishwives are astir gossip done and business at hand new place new mackerel new haddock new thornback new great lamprills new fresh herrings from one or another come the various cries new mussels my lily-white mussels new cockles new great cockles new sprats new sprats new they use new with the meaning of fresh a great consideration when means of transit are slow and fish perishes 
hot coddlings are on offer in the fresh morning will you buy any milk today mistress i have fresh cheese and cream i have fresh calls another milk maids below was a latter variant of the cry it became milk below and then the familiar milk o still with us about six o'clock or earlier in summer the apprentices with a clatter bring down the shutters and stand at the shop doors calling footnote it was a learned bachelor of divinity one alexander gell who was sentenced to lose his ears and be degraded from the ministry for giving his opinion of king charles i that he was fitter to stand at a cheapside shop with an apron before him and say what lack ye than to govern a kingdom ellis's original letters i i i two seventy six end footnote their cries last with little intermission throughout the day listen where the haberdashers crowd about paternoster row what is it ye lackey ladies fine bone lace or edgings sweet gloves silk garters fine combs or glasses or a poking stick with a silver handle will ye buy any starch or clear complexion mistress woman's vanity is old as the human race it is only fashion which changes others make appeal to the passer-by male and female indifferently fine wrought shirts or smocks here's perfumed waistcoats produce comes in from the country fields and gardens and is shouted about the city white cabbage white young cabbage white turnips white young turnips white parsnip white young parsnips white lettuce white young lettuce white radish white young radish the criers have small invention there is more variety about the fruit sellers cherry ripe aca black apples fine medlars fine pippins fine hard st thomas's onions fine seville oranges fine lemons ripe strawberries ripe close by moorgate is a barred prison-like building the madmen poor helpless creatures are at their begging grate poor naked bedlam tom's a cold a small cut of thy bacon or a piece of thy sow's side good bess god almighty bless thy wits bless thy wits tom's a cold shakespeare uses the words and often must have heard the cry as he passed said to the same refrain that sir frederick bridge has resurrected till sundown that plaintive appeal goes on the street vendors are out crying quick periwinkles quick 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 who could resist that call ripe chestnuts ripe walnuts ripe small nuts rosemary and bays quick and gentle oysters three pence a peck at bridwell dock new oysters new wallfleet oysters new cockles new great cockles many have taken up their stands with hot viands always welcome in the draughty houses where wood fires burn at the hearths hot apple pies hot pudding pies hot pippin pies hot mutton pies there is full selection to be made i have ripe peas cods fine potatoes fine says one i have ripe gooseberries says another sweeps man and boy black as devil's imps move among the people and their musical cry rings among the houses sweep chimney sweep sweep chimney sweep sweep chimney sweep mistress sweep with the hay deary 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 sweep from the bottom to the top chimney sweep then shall no soot fall in your porridge pot 
with the hoop dairy dairy sweep that is fine but to give the surge of the hey dairy 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 sweep and full lilt of the lines i should need the musical notation itinerant fenders are ready to tempt the thrifty housewife with barter broom for old shoes or pouch rings boots or buskins for new broom cries one old bottles old shoes pouch rings for brooms others set their lure for the kitchen maids coney skins have ye maidies hey ye any kitchen stuff maidies there is the ink cellar his little barrel and measure and funnel swung at his side and with good goose quill pens in hand chanting almost a little song very fine writing ink very fine bright ink buy any ink will you buy any ink the street market is ubiquitous for there is hardly an article of utility that is not on offer and has not its distinct cry a good sausage and it be roasted go round about the capon go round will you buy a mat for a bed ripe damsons fine ripe damsons hard garlic hard will ye buy any aquavite mistress buy a barrel of samphire old doublets ha ye any old doublets buy a fine washing ball i have mixed the cries together careless of seasons sometimes there is snow over london the roofs are white the red tiles showing only where the warmth of the chimneys has thawed the fall little fresh vegetables are then on offer and less meat the good wife being largely dependent upon her salted pickle tub for the winter's supply hot oat cakes are cried buy a new almanac it is a reminder that another year has come round old and young people gather about the common crier in the street to hear his message it is delivered in this wise oys if any man or woman can tell any tidings of a gray mare with a long mane and a short tail she halts down right before and is stark lame behind and was lost this thirtieth day of february he that can tell any tidings of her let him come to the crier and he shall have well for his ire the city harbors all sorts of handymen willing to do any odd job in the houses have you any wood to cleave have ye any old bellows or trays to mend hard manual labor is given to earn the penny ha ye any work for a cooper have you any work for a tinker the vendor of small coal offers his fuel from the sack borne on his back it is very costly and is brought by sea hence the common name of sea coal ha ye any corns on your feet or toes is the demand of another ready for a small fee to extirpate them with his scalpel a dentist goes round holding his forceps aloft and promising his victims painless extraction then comes another barter droning his sing-song i suspect a scottish strain in him there is such economy of idea such reiteration about his lines have you any boots maids or have you any shoon or an old pair of buskins will you buy any broom an old pair of boots maids or a new pair of shoon or an old pair of buskins for all my green broom so the cries go on greeting the ear at every street corner of this narrow noisy stuffy old town i have ripe cowcumbers ripe calls one salt fine white salt will ye buy my dish of eels what ends have ye of gold or silver hot spiced cake will ye buy any straw this last from a countryman 
will ye buy any milk or frumenty and amid the bustle and the life and the laughter there is always the pathos of the prisons not hidden in some concealed corner but at the city gates newgate and ludgate are the chief of them in the last the debtors lie and the sheriffs also have their compters their inmates are so little thought of that they have not even food supplied without begging for it good gracious people for the lord's sake pity the poor women we lie cold and comfortless night and day on the cold boards in the deep dark dungeon as poignant even as this is the monotonous cry that comes from the marshalsea begging grate bread and meat for a prisoner of the marshal say for christ jesus sake we know the london street scene and the cries a couple of centuries before gibbons five centuries ago wonderfully london has kept its history john lydgate died when henry the sixth ruled england a man of seventy old as years were then counted extremely old and in his middle period he wrote his london lackpenny telling of the adventures of a countryman who came out of kent to get justice at westminster but for lack of money could not speed disgusted with law he turned to our fair city then unto london i died me hay of all the land it beareth the price hot pescats one began to cry strawberry ripe and cherries in the rice one bade me come near and buy some spice pepper and saffron they gan me bade but for lack of money i might not spade in cheapside till the goldsmiths came there as the predominant traders were stalls and shops at which simon and his good wife replenished their finery then to the cheap i gan me drawn where much people i saw for to stand one offered me velvet silk and lawn another he taketh me by the hand here is pear's thread the finest in the land then went i forth by london stone throughout all the canwick street drapers much cloth me offered a nun then met i one cried hot sheep's feet one cried mackerel rash is green another gan greet a song in the streets of some old romance or a popular jingle so early tempted from the townsman's pouch the small copper coin or drew from the pleased housewife a contribution in kind towards the day's meal then i hide me into east cheap one cries ribs of beef and many a pie pewter pots they clatter on a heap there was harp pipe and minstrelsy yea by cock nay by cock some begin to cry some song of jenkin and julian for their mead but for lack of money i might not speed old as were these cries that lydgate has preserved for us ringing through london streets in the fifteenth century they are much akin to those later the cries passed on from one generation to another were amongst the most ancient of london's traditions sam johnson a londoner after my liking wrote in the adventurer the attention of a newcomer is generally first struck by the multiplicity of the cries that stun him in the streets no i do not agree that london was ever a quiet city it was noisy always just the same when the iron-shot cartwheels rumbled over the egg-shaped cobbles as now with each day's continuous roar of motor traffic i love all the noise of its ceaseless activities like james russell lowell i can feel that in london i am listening to the roaring loom of time it has immense variety it can even be quiet 
Often I steal across the city after midnight, when the last of the moving traffic has found shelter, and the big palace-like blocks of office buildings seem to have grown larger and yet more forbidding in the dimness of their outline and in the solitude. Away from the few main thoroughfares, I am in a city of the dead. I get down to the river, where the moon lightens the wharfs and there is no stir among the shipping, but immense activities are locked in sleep, and then I realize, as few, save the old dead inhabitants of the city have done, how much London belongs to the Thames. For two hours at most, London streets are deserted, certainly not for more. The late to bed have hardly departed before the market men, the first to throw out a hail to the stranger, are starting a new day. He knows London indifferently who does not know its twenty-four hours round. I am old-fashioned enough to believe that I should have preferred those street cries heard by Deering and Gibbons and Wilkes to the motor horns and trill taxi whistles that assail our ears today. They at least were human, not mechanical. But perhaps I am wrong, deceived by a false glamour we weave about times past. A century hence, no doubt some other writer will be telling of an unknown London, and in his new chapter on the sounds of the metropolis, will recreate in fancy the music of those motor horns, the cheery call of cab whistles, that so enlivened the streets in 1921, comparing them to the great disparagement of the clatter of aerial engines and the dull, incessant buzz of propellers overhead that night and day rack the nerves of his own generation. But that is a step forward, and I have not finished my day with Orlando Gibbons. Last scene of all is as the watchmen come creeping about the streets again, enlivening them with their cry as the dusk falls. Lanthorns and candlelight hang out, maids for all night. There is the day's last cry as midnight strikes. Twelve o'clock, look well to your lock, your fire and your light, and so good night. Better still, do I like the earlier admonition inviting sleep. List good people all past ten o'clock, the hour I call. Now say your prayers and take your rest with conscience clear and sins confessed. I bid you all good night, good night. Imagine that from Robert, X-239. Life in London has indeed lost the picturesqueness of a bygone day. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of More About Unknown London by Walter George Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet. Chapter 8 St. Martin Le Grand. I repudiate altogether a popular belief that the best place from which to see the city is the top of an omnibus. That way you miss nearly everything of value in that treasure center of abiding interest, familiarizing yourself only with streets of tall buildings hurrying past, which mean nothing, and people darting hither and thither who seem entirely unconcerned in their surroundings, as no doubt they are. But a single exception I allow, and it is St. Martin Le Grand. For this good reason. A tall wooden paling encloses the spot on every side, and only when raised to the top of a passing omnibus can you look over. It is not much that rewards. The accompanying photograph shows all. Only the view of a big stretch of ground, laid open to the depth of some twenty feet below the street level, and scarred with pit-holes, 
with a few wild plants that found rooting in the earth during the war years when men were too preoccupied to disturb them with building this is a bit of roman london earth touched with the sun rays that has again awakened to life after burial for centuries and these are roman pit holes archaeologists have cleared and explored them for any treasure they may have contained but the search has proved uneventful many fragments of pottery have been recovered a few with lettering or ornament but without importance some household utensils and bones that roman citizens partook of animal food at meals eaten here as elsewhere nearly two thousand years ago does not materially enlarge our conceptions of roman london concerning which we still know little a statuette of hadrian the pavement mosaic of a noble's mansion or a find of coins these far better would have repaid research after all exploration by future ages of our own dustbins would rarely produce say an aeroplane or a submarine depth charge or the einstein theory roman and saxon and norman medieval tudor victorian few spots in the city are so crowded with associations as this much scarified ground left fallow for so many years while awaiting the builder the empire's central post office is what the name recalls as it was till yesterday but to our ancestors st martin le grand has meant much more than this a sanctuary for evildoers lasting throughout five centuries a college of priests the curfew and the flames of london's great fire ingelric a priest and gerard his brother built here or more likely rebuilt a church dedicated to st martin of stout logs as i look back upon it that was ten years before the norman conquest its unique place in later medieval london was that it gave the curfew to the city at the first deep note of warning from st martin's the ringers and other church belfries stood ready st lawrence for the thames side barking church for the tower then together they rang out the curfew st brides gave the message to the western suburb couve le feu all lights went out taverns for ale and wines shut their doors ludgate bishopsgate aldgate and all others of the city gates were locked and guards posted the city was enclosed within itself left to darkness its streets in utter solitude strangely quiet till the first rays of the morning sun shot aslant the high guarding wall and life was again astir no person shall be so daring says the proclamation of mayor renald le conduit a d thirteen thirty four on pain of imprisonment as to go wandering about the city after the hour of curfew rung out at st martin's le grand unless it be some man of the city of good repute or his servant and that with reasonable cause and with light ingelric a noble saxon had held some office under edward the confessor and that st martin's and saxon london stood high in repute is evident from its possessions piously as king william tells for the remission of my own sins the conqueror granted his charter to the brothers in the second year of his reign i like this document and its great picture its meekly supplicant preamble for as much as among the many good works which the faithful of christ perform for the health of their souls that chiefly is esteemed and considered which is designed by a devout mind for the institution and building of a holy mother church 
in which the servants of god through their prayers are absolved of their sins by a bountiful god which moses by the construction of the mystical tabernacle has foreshown which also was prefigured by the industry of solomon when he was building a costly temple to the lord signifying that the future church ought to be adorned with the highest honor by the faithful by the example of whom and in the name of the lord jesus christ i william by the disposal of god and inheritance of consanguinity king of england duke and ruler of normandy etc etc its damnatory clause now if any one shall presume to transfer to another purpose this which we have granted may he suffer god's punishment for heretics with judas the traitor and the signatures crowding with majesty upon the parchment i william king of the angles and duke of the normans under the seal of holy cross have irrevocably consented and confirmed i matilda the queen have given my consent i robert the son of the king have assented i steigand archbishop have confirmed i william bishop of london within the walls of which the aforesaid monastery is situate have underlined it with the mark of the holy cross and have granted it all sort of liberty as much as to my power can pertain i odo bishop of bayou have consented i john cardinal priest of the holy church of rome throughout wales and england bearing the apostolic office pope alexander consenting was present at this constitution and have confirmed as much as pertains to the apostolic see liberty to this church by the present mark i peter also cardinal priest and chancellor delegated from the said pope to england acquiescing to this constitution have subscribed with my own hand i leofric the bishop have granted i waldoff the earl i william mallet the chief i arfas chancellor of the king and abbots chaplains and many dignitaries in train there is spaciousness and something of feudal grandeur even in the verbosity of the instrument the conqueror liked so well the brothers ingelric and giard that to the college of secular canons they founded about their church he gave unusual privileges he confirmed them in possession of their broad lands in essex and elsewhere and to these he added his royal gift certain land and more outside london wall at cripplegate they should elect from among the brethren an able prosecutor and keeper of their affairs they had meadow pasture and water they had sock and sack toll and team in fanglefoff blood white mud brice umphleep frid white hamsockney yes and miss kenning too i was on the point of overlooking that what more need be said broad based upon these generous gifts there grew up at st martin le grand a college of priests unrenowned either for learning or piety and so i am little concerned with it and what is more to the purpose the famous sanctuary that was a most extraordinary condition of things for even a medieval age to have tolerated in the heart of the city sanctuary in its simplest form appertained to all churches it ensured the wrongdoer at least safety for his life should he choose to abandon the realm and forty days within which unmolested he might consider the risks of leaving the church of his refuge and submitting to the law forty days then trial or else outlawry and banishment that was his choice the sanctuary given to him in its origin sanctuary was not unworthy it was a gift of charity and mercy 
designed as a loophole of escape from the harsh severity of the penal laws and none who knows those harsh laws can doubt the necessity of some mitigation but of sanctuary in its abuse no good can be said st martin le grand was a chartered sanctuary its liberties protected by papal anathema and royal charter it was a resort wherein murderers thieves felons generally and false debtors might and did take refuge and there lived out their unworthy lives safe under the protecting aegis of the church other sanctuaries refused their protection for certain crimes committed such for instance as robbery of the church st martin le grand in its wider tolerance did not boggle at sacrilege one henry neve took sanctuary in fourteen sixteen bringing therein a signet ring and a pyx for the reserved sacrament that he had stolen together with certain coins and other valuables and these he deposited with another dweller in the precinct of st martin's this delinquent afterwards fled the sanctuary thereupon the dean's officers seized the stolen property as a waif within the franchise of the church st martin le grand like westminster to which near the end of its salacious life it became attached existed as a free royal chapel acknowledging pope and king but released from all other supervision ecclesiastical or civil neither archbishop nor bishop had authority in the precinct nor had london's mayor kings did not hesitate to profit by the scandal using the offices of the deanery and prebends as well-paid places for the preferment of the least scrupulous of their own clerical followers for the larger part the canons of st martin's were non-resident and the discipline maintained was notoriously a feat in the sanctuary miles forrest one of the murderers of the little princes in the tower rotted away piecemeal as sir thomas more says the duke of buckingham's speech at the council board when the faithless gloucester desired the removal of the young princes from sanctuary at westminster affords a striking picture of the state of sanctuaries at that period i retain the old spelling of john stow yet i will not say nigh but that it is a deed of pity that such men as the sea or their evil debtors have brought in poverty should have some place of liberty to keep their bodies out of the danger of their cruel creditors and also if the crown happen as it hath done to come in question while either part taketh other as traitors i will well there be some places of refuge for both but as for thieves of which these places be full and which never fall from the craft after they once fall there too it is pity the sanctuaries should serve them and much more man-killers whom god bade to take from the altar and kill them if their murder were willful and where it is otherwise there need we not the sanctuaries that god appointed in the old law for if either necessity his own defence or misfortune draweth him to that deed a pardon serveth which either the law granteth of course or the king of pity may then look we now how few sanctuary men there be whom any honourable necessity compelled to go thither and then see on the other side what a sort there be commonly therein of them whom wilful unthriftiness hath brought to naught what a rabble of thieves murderers and malicious heinous traitors and that in two places specially the one at the elbow of the city westminster the t'other in the very bowels st martin's i dare well avow it were the good that they do 
with the hurt that cometh of them, and ye shall find it much better to lack both than to have both. And this I say, although they were not abused as they now be, and so long have been, that I fear me ever they will be, while men be afraid to set their hands to the mendment, as though God and St. Peter were the patrons of ungracious living. Now unthrifties riot, and run in debt, upon the boldness of these places. Yea, and rich men run thither with poor men's goods. There they build, there they spend, and bid their creditors go whistle them. Men's wives run thither with their husband's plate, and say they dare not abide their husbands for beating. Thieves bring thither their stolen goods, and there live thereon. There, devise they, new robberies. Night lie they steal out, they rob and reeve, and kill, and come in again as though those places gave them not only a safeguard for the harm they have done, but a license also to do more. Let us credit King Richard the Second, in an earlier age with more light than his contemporaries, when he roundly condemned St. Martin Le Grand as a nest of iniquity. London citizens were the chief sufferers from this resort of all evil, ensconced in their midst under charter. For, although within the city walls, St. Martin's was a liberty in itself. There were places geographically within the old city of London that claimed to be outside the Lord Mayor's jurisdiction. The lawyers' inns have never admitted the mayoral jurisdiction. St. Martin's successfully resisted all efforts at interference by the city fathers. The citizens' merchandise underwent constant plundering by its refugees. They petitioned King Henry the Fourth in Parliament in the year 1403, setting out that murderers, traitors, robbers, money-clippers, and other felons, malefactors, and rioters at St. Martin le Grand made disturbance within the city by day and issued forth by night to commit outrages, after which they again betook themselves to the sanctuary. False merchants and debtors were in the habit of taking refuge in St. Martin's, and lived there unmolested upon the goods they carried with them in their flight. Apprentices and others went as fugitives with their master's goods. The citizens represented their own sorry case, property so stolen and dealt with, not being recoverable by secular law. They prayed for redress, apparently with no other result than an empty promise that the charges should be investigated. Not long after this date, the citizens took matters into their own hands. The story curiously illustrates medieval ways. On September 1st, 1444, a civil prisoner, a soldier named Knight, was being conducted from Newgate to Guild Hall. His comrades had arranged a deep-laid plot. One had summoned him on a pretended action for debt before the sheriff, well knowing that he would be led past St. Martin's Gate. When there, five other soldiers dashed out of Painter's Alley, the little passage to Paternoster Row which still bears, set in the wall of a corner house, the stone effigy of a boy with his pannier, or basket, placed there after the great fire, with the inscription, When ye have sought the city round, yet still this is the highest ground. They took the prisoner from his jailers and rushed him into the sanctuary. The sheriffs, the aldermen of the ward, and the city chamberlain, coming with an armed posse and a multitude of people, demanded that the man and his rescuers should be given up to them. Failing to obtain compliance with this demand, 
they broke into the sanctuary and forcibly seized all six. The astonished canons of St. Martin's sent post-haste by horsed messenger to the dean at Cambridge a letter written at London with heavy heart. They reported this violent infraction of their privileges, saying that the prisoners were led from their gate through Cheapside to Newgate, all naked save their layman clothes, two together, chained by the neck and manacled as traitors afore your gate, as in despite of your sanctuary, and as we be informed be like to be dead in all haste. Also they reported grave distress and alarm among the remaining sanctuary men. Your tenants here being dread and sore, lest they be fetch out with force in the same wise. Richard Caudry, the dean, went at once to the king, laying complaint. Henry the Sixth referred the issue to the lords of his council in blood in the stared chamber. In short, made a star chamber matter of it. There it was fought out at great length with this result. The privilege enjoyed by St. Martin's was upheld, the prisoners were restored there, and fines were imposed on the sheriffs for disobedience to the king's writ, which, upon the dean's protest, had preemptorily required the restoration of the men. The dean, a man worldly wise, had clinched his other arguments by reminder that the city governors had good reason to support the liberties of his church, for many worshipful members of the corporation had, for debt or other trespass, received the shelter of its privileges. That was a nasty remark. This saintly William of Wickham stands out as the shining and rare example of St. Martin's piety, but Caudry I like best, for in him was incarnated the church militant, a dean with grasp of affairs, who knew how to uphold his rights, bad as they might be. No king ever cowed him. When Henry the Sixth sent his officers to St. Martin's to claim for treason, William came, one of Jack Cade's rebels. Quadri himself locked the fugitive in the sanctuary prison, then collected his papal bulls, charters, and muniments, as well under lead as wax, and with them hurried off to the royal palace. There he convinced the devout monarch that, powerful as were kings, their autocracy stopped at the dean of St. Martin's door. A greater triumph than this, Caudry enjoyed. The earls of Salisbury, Wiltshire, and Wooster, the barons de Lisle and de Molines, Matthew Philip, sheriff of London, and the alderman of his ward, he held on one occasion in his power. A speaker of the House of Commons was cause of the trouble, Sir William Oldhall, who had been outlawed in the vexed times which preceded the Wars of the Roses. He had fled to St. Martin's for sanctuary. It was charged falsely with small doubt, that Old Hall, making sortie with other sanctuary men in one of their lawless raids, had some part in dangerously wounding Walter Burr, a royal officer, in the adjacent streets. The three earls and others mentioned burst open St. Martin's Gate at midnight, found Old Hall concealed in the church, and raising him bound on horseback, carried him off to Westminster, thereby violating sanctuary they were ipso facto excommunicate. Full confession and reparation to God and St. Martin by gifts of huge tapers of wax, gold, jewels, and other oblations of value, won for them absolution, and from the iron-willed caudry, a pointed homily. They must have found it jarring to listen to. Old Hall was sent back into sanctuary. I know nothing of Rome's curse today, but in St. Martin Le Grand's time it was a piercing weapon. 
that the evildoer chose always, nearly always, to submit to the church's discipline does not surprise me. Let him be accursed in the town and in the field, in entering and on going out. Let him be accursed in his house, eating or drinking, sleeping or waking. Let him be accursed by land or by water, accursed in sitting or standing, in working or reposing. Let him be accursed in every place, in all his works, in his outward limbs and his entrails, from the sole of the foot to the crown of the head. Let there be no soundness in him. Let his way be dark and slippery, his children orphans, his wife a widow, the angel of the Lord chastising him. Let his fate and his portion be with Dathan and Aviron, who went down into hell alive, and with Judas the betrayer of God, and with those who said to God, Depart from us, we have not known thy ways. Let his body be as leprous as King Uzziah and Miriam, the sister of Moses. Be he also, on account of his demerits, struck with St. Anthony's fire, and for his multiplied misdeeds and impenitent heart let him be consumed by the judgment of heaven. As these candles, the clergy throw down their lighted tapers on the floor, are extinguished, so may his soul be extinguished. Let him be delivered over from the help of God to the eternal company of the devils whom he served here on earth, unless he may condign reparation of the injuries and violence done to us and to our church. So be it. So be it. St. Martin's was somewhat rich in hot language. My choice favors the curse of Eustace, Count of Boulogne, protecting his gift. If any of my sons or relatives, instigated by the devil, shall wish to diminish or infringe the liberties of the church, let him be banished from the company of God and the blessed Martin, and from our good will. Felons on their way from Newgate to execution on Tower Hill were taken past the south gate of St. Martin le Grand. Some forlorn men sought its liberty but few successfully. Sir Roger Clifford, a protester in arms against Richard III's usurpation, so attempted to break free from the custody of the sheriff and shelter himself in the precinct, but he suffered his fate. A curious practice was recalled at the Star Chamber trial, before alluded to, that when in ancient times the king's justices sat in St. Martin's Gate, as being a place outside the city, to try causes of treason or felony, the prisoners were placed before them on the other side of the street, and were carefully guarded from advancing. For traitor or felon, if once he passed the kennel in the middle of the street, could claim the sanctuary of Holy Church pertaining to St. Martin's, and all proceedings against him became void. The gate was a place of danger to be avoided by any man having a lurking enemy. There are cases on record of John Frow of Lincoln, who dogged his enemy, Robert Dodmerton, with a drawn dagger in hand till, near St. Martin's Gate, he stabbed him mortally in the neck, and himself immediately slipped into the sanctuary and of Lully, a butcher, who stabbed a man in the highway and claimed immunity, and others like. In one notable year during the Wars of the Roses, when freemen of London and foreign residents clashed in serious affray in the streets, the sanctuary men of St. Martin's sallied out and joined the mob in plundering the strangers. It is misfortune that the evil wrought at St. Martin le Grand should entirely have overshadowed the good, for wherever religious men have labored, some good has resulted, some culprit steeped in crime, 
murderer, traitor, robber, money clipper it may be, has been brought by example to a knowledge of better things. William of Wickham apart, few of St. Martin's officers, placemen in the larger numbers, have been renowned for grace, though for Thomas Boucher, afterwards Cardinal Archbishop and the patron of Caxton, should be reserved kindly remembrance. The college did not survive the dissolution of the religious houses. Early in the short reign of Edward the Sixth, the church was raised level with the ground, and not for three and a half centuries has there been a St. Martin le Grand, though the name has survived in the locality, and in our time, while Sir Robert Smirk's building last occupied the site, as the general post office. A libertine sanctuary, like that of Whitefriars, grew up under Queen Elizabeth, and much of its dissolute associations returned. The place became a headquarters for the manufacture of false jewellery. The flames of the Great Fire in 1666, sweeping furiously across London, consumed all, after which the area was clean built, and never was London again to shelter a place quite so vile as the old St. Martin Le Grand. End of chapter 8「Nine of More About Unknown London」by Walter George Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet. Chapter 9 Sweet Stuff. I had asked at the Sweet Stuff shop for half a pound of jumbo chains, an honest request, I take it, and calculated to give offence to none. The young woman across the counter I thought pert. It was not enough for her to repeat the request with a simulated air of wonderment. Was it something unnatural? She must toss her head with its tower of raven curls. I do not like the sweet stuff young woman of these commercial days, if this be the true type. In my youth they were motherly souls who presided at such emporiums with kindly eyes that beamed above the trays full of delectables upon their juvenile customers. When the heartache was evident, and farthings ran short, I had known them on occasion project an extra toffee drop into the screw of paper containing the small purchase, and send away the happy feaster with a soft pat on the head, remembering that they had been children once. That must have been an awful long time ago, it seemed to our wandering minds. A diminutive sister and myself, and I the younger of the two. The change, like a deal else, is not for the better. Jumbo's chains, I've never heard of them, said the pert young woman. But surely, I ventured, such depth of ignorance of her business a little astonished me. We don't keep them here, she snapped and turned from me to give conversation to another young person assisting behind the counter. It was perhaps a little absent-minded of me to have overlooked all the years that have gone by. That obstacle I often stumble across. Jumbo, the big African bull elephant at the zoological gardens at Regent's Park, the female elephant Alice, and America's greatest showman, Phineas Barnum, together filled the main sheet of the daily newspaper in those back years. Jumbo secured honors withheld from princes by having the verisimilitude of his massive form in miniature, encased in sweet stuff rock. This it was the delight of children, breaking the stick, to find, all through, and thereafter to eat. Only the gods of the playroom were so honored. I had passed the sweet stuff stage of life, but well remember the commotion. It must have been in the earliest eighties. Jumbo was acquired 
from the Zoological Society of London by Phineas Barnum for his travelling show. Jumbo had lived content at Regent's Park and made friends. He objected to leave. They built a massive travelling cage at his door, floored with beams calculated to sustain the weight of tons, in which to transport him to the docks for shipment to America. He sniffed the whole structure with his trunk and refused to enter. The blandishments of his keeper were unavailing. I talked with Jumbo's keeper in the Elephant House recently, for the hale old veteran still is there. Barnum, most astute of showmen, was to have his opportunity. There was the elephant Alice. Somebody, goodness knows who, for the world knows nothing of its greatest humbugs, set London agog with the legend that the two were a devoted couple, that Jumbo refused to leave Alice. There was at once the element and novelty of elephantine romance. It was a colored picture of the elephant, much faded and dust-stained, that I chanced to see when looking into an old print dealer's window by Red Lion Square, which brought it all back to memory before I entered the confectioner's shop, vacant-minded as to what I should purchase but for that. Thousands had flocked to the zoo, greatly to advantage its coffers. Jumbo gorged himself with buns, of these offerings choosing only the best. The newspaper press filled its center columns with Jumbo's daily bulletin, his emotional heart-burnings, his visitors, his stout resistance when, with iron chains, men tried unavailingly to haul him into the traveling cage. The cable flashed across interviews with Barnum in America. Barnum made nothing of the week or two's delay till at last Jumbo was trapped. Why should he? For it had given him the biggest advertisement of his life in two hemispheres. The sweetmeat manufacturer canonized the idol in Jumbo's chains. Street boys whistled and hummed the most popular song of the day, the words running like this. Jumbo said to Alice, I love you. Alice said to Jumbo, I don't believe it's true. If you only loved me, as you say you do, you wouldn't go to Yankee land and leave me at the zoo. These jingles take a notching hold in the memory. I have read Magna Carta and do not recall its lines so well, and historically it is not less important. After all, what should the young woman know of Jumbo? Surely she had no part in that wave of sentimentality in which we could afford to indulge in the early eighties over the broken domestic felicity, quite imaginary, of the zoo's elephant house. Much has happened since then, sterner things, and perhaps today we could not be quite so silly. The thought softened the asperity with which, at the outset, I had regarded her conduct. I ventured again. Then you can give me some jujubes, I asked, after racking the memory till some name once familiar but forgotten by disuse came back. In the long past, as a small boy, I had enjoyed those delicacies. Jujubes? The pert young woman repeated the name in a tone of incredulity. What strange manner of being was I? Had I come out of the ark? Was I trying to poke fun, or only to bewilder her? All these thoughts seem reflected in her expressive face, the upturned eyebrow, as I stood there, believing in my foolishness that at last I had evolved from mental depths a word of universal use. Surely the world and the dictionary makers had not lost knowledge of jujubes, the soft pliant comestible, with a coating of atomic sugar, that often as a juvenile I had squeezed between the teeth, too fond, too delectable, to pass backwards to the throat, till its diminution in size 
threatened that it should elude the final gulp altogether. "'Oh, yes,' said the pert young woman. "'She must know something of sweet stuff's being there. "'You mean glycerin jujubes for the throat. "'You get them at the chemist's.' "'I looked around, distraught. "'Why, in a bowl close at hand was the very thing I sought, "'not the tasteless concoction for which chemists overcharge. "'Jujubes piled high. "'They looked much the same as when, in the years gone by, I had bought them in pennyworths, regarding the quarter pound as a wholesale order. I would teach this young woman her business. They are there, I said, pointing. We call them pastilles, she responded distantly, at least ever since I have known them. There was a note of detachment from all interest in whatever name, ages remote from her own, may have chosen in truth i found myself in a foreign land mora youngest and most dictatorial of my great nieces had been insistent that never never had i brought her sweetmeats which when i think of it is true for many things have been in my thoughts and i have entered many disputations but what children like and what is not good for them has not been either one or the other. The omission should be made good. But I did not know the hazard of the venture. My old learning in sweet stuffery I found of no avail. I was out of date. I must begin over again. This is an age of aeroplanes and motor cars and wireless wonders in which hundreds and thousands seem remote as men of the drift. They have lost importance. Red and white, I had known these well enough in the tall glass bottles, but dare I inquire for them of the imposing young woman of the raven curls? Memories of lost delights came storming back. Nothing, I feel sure, does one forget. The memory lies in the brain and only needs a stimulus of the nerve cells or the gray matter to revive it we have in that magic box all the machinery to be juveniles again but the moment that comes back is fleeting it is only with the really young that it lasts vanilla ice i must take some of that too i said really quite apologetically having received the pastilles the knowledge of my ignorance had humbled me before the young person. It had been a joy, that vanilla ice that I remembered, laid out in thick slabs on the glass over the counter, a full three-quarter inch thick to be the best, a flat of ice, something like the inner part of a soft chocolate cream, covered top and bottom with a generous layer of vanilla chocolate. I saw chocolates at the counter. Once I bought chocolates, once, like these, too. How little such things change. Once, in the long ago. But to my confusion, vanilla ice, like so much else, the young woman had never heard of. All sorts came to mind, a medley of sticky and firm, of hard and soft. But I lacked courage to ask for them. What important title might now conceal the homely mixture, I did not know. Before next I came shopping for sweet stuffs, I must learn the tongue. The young woman seemed to wait till I should say something intelligible, and I was annoyed. The magnificence of this shop was itself an offense. Its shining brass and wealth of plate glass seemed to emulate the artistic tastes of the public house decorator so far removed was it from the homely little shop stowed away in a corner that I had known, where English was understood and small people could get what they wanted, whether sweet stuff, or blood alleys, or colored transfers, or the marvelous serpent's eggs to which boys applied a lighted match, and a thing of mystery uncoiled. The mothers were poorly replaced by this quite superior young person, 
who assisted it was the sight of a label proclaiming coconut toffee that aroused the latent devil in me of course i knew it should i forget a plague on your coconut toffee and all such new-fangled empty high-sounding bombastic names i would sweep them from the shop they do not so deceive me i with all my ignorance would get level with the young person should i shout stickjaw and dash headlong out of the shop on reflection no learned societies have done me the honor of listening to me have even given me fellowship could i expect a quiet audience while i discoursed upon the piltdown skull or cornered in the quadrangle of burlington house joined issue with the physicists on einstein's fascinating theory of relativity when it was open to any gray head there rejuvenated by awakened recollection of his own boyish scrapes to interject yea who ran out of the sweetstuff shop in my time i have dared smith minor today an erudite professor that i would do his dags but there are acts and words possible to callow youth which are not admissible to ripening years that good benevolent alderman and fairy godfather of all poor crippled children sir william Traylor bart has told me that when he was a schoolboy living on ludgate hill it was the custom of his fellows with books and satchel to make forays up fleet street and especially to a barber's shop against old temple bar which had convenient doors of entry and exit into the city and westminster they would rush in at one door shouting insultingly sweeney todd to the astonished barber and his lathered customers and dash out at the other it were best done in company taking the chance of one boy being collared the lord mayor that was to be had himself experienced the barber's cuffs the disputation over the counter attracted an elderly man from an ante-room out into the shop the master or manager of the establishment no doubt he was thin and pale chance took me to the biggest toy show ever got together at the british trade fair at the crystal palace and there i had been curious to notice that the attendants at the toy stalls mostly were jolly round men and i imagine boisterous in nature as if infected in life by some of the exuberant fun of their own toys that figure i would wish to see in all who cater for juvenile happiness the sweet stuff master built quite unlike this wore a sad look saddened perhaps by selling so much stuff for which years ago amidst such abundance he must have lost all care he would not concede that fashions in sweetmeats had greatly changed from him i learned new lore taking his confidence for search after strange knowledge has made an errant gossip of me bull's eyes were to-day much the same as forty years ago and to be found in all the shops but for years they had gone out of favour in london and the southern counties they were national in the north of england as are peppermints in scotland the war brought back their popularity in the south soldiers coming to london making demand for them and in response the black and white stripe reappeared in the shop windows a lambeth firm of manufacturers must have made a fortune out of the cases of bull's-eyes sent to the camps as for names the soft fondants of other days had become creams but that was only a shortening the proper name being still fondant creams barley sugar one of the oldest favorites keeps in demand it is merely a toffee made in spiral sticks and has nothing to do with barley but was so named generations ago because confectioners broke the grain of the sugar with barley water marzipan often thought a modern confection 
is as old as Shakespeare who mentions it. Butterscotch, why, scotch, is a mystery even in the trade. I had touched a reminiscent chord in him, and he rambled on, talking names of sweets utterly strange to me, but some familiar like almond rock, sugar almonds, and acid drops the best of acid drops in these days to be purchased at the chemist's and sold at prices at which no confectioner could expect sales vanilla ice he allowed was no longer made and was forgotten it used to be manufactured cheaply but what could one do with sugar at nineteen pence a pound confectioners used to pay three halfpence for it the public grumbled at ten pence per pound, then the controlled price, but the confectioner's price was nearly double. Chocolates were the mainstay of the confectionery trade today. I thought him a little contemptuous, as if questioning how should the yeoman strain of England be maintained in a race nurtured on chocolates, really a French dainty, the taste for which a generation of unregenerates had imported these yes they were wholly our own my eye had caught the trim little box decorated with what might have been a chelsea wallpaper the lid raised temptingly to display the short sticks of sweet stuff inside there was the red stick red outside and a toothsome gray-colored peppermint within the multicolored stick, the blue and red and orange winding round in the ribbon fashion of the markings of a barber's pole over a speckled center, the plain rock, same all through, the stick of almonds embedded in toffee and cased in transparent oily paper to prevent its stickiness from contaminating the others. Honest, native sweet stuff, how well I had known it as a boy, when I had determined that, when grown up, and I possessed really big money, I would lay in great store of this priceless treasure. But lack a day! Why should it be that, even as growth stops, the desire ceases and love of sweetmeats departs? It is the simplest and most satisfying of life's pleasures. I had not, possessing money, given a thought to sweet stuff rock these many decades but the sight of the stumpy oblong box brought rushing back the memories of lost delights moira should know those delights two boxes i ordered the merchant seemed amused at my enthusiasm old english goodies we call them they still have a sale he explained bless me old english eh a good thing that i am not a woman of fashion and tender about the passing years end of chapter nine chapter ten of more about unknown london by walter george bell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by janet Chapter Ten A Parson on the Scaffold St. Gregory by Paul's was a little parish church that stood at the southwest corner of the old cathedral, almost touching the wall. Its tower hardly reached the height of the cathedral nave. St. Paul's may be called the mother church indeed, wrote Thomas Fuller of the Worthies. Having one babe in her body, St. Faith's, and another in her arms. The last was St. Gregory's. Loud had partially dismantled the church in his reforming schemes. The ruin left by the Great Fire of London in the year 1666 was not rebuilt. So St. Gregory's passed out of London's life in the heat and tumult and noise of the great fire. I am concerned only with its last parson, not actually last in order of those who ministered, 
but among those who count parson i use advisedly and it is only the foolish who find objection in the good old word for in the church's unsettlement in commonwealth days the status of the parochial clergy was not a little ambiguous john hewitt doctor of divinity had been admitted to st gregory's by the affection of the parish the preferment was perhaps irregular and whether rector or vicar what matters john hewitt perished on the scaffold at tower hill one other victim of plot and counterplot that in the centuries have brought so many distinguished heads to roll in the sawdust there he was born a gentleman and bred a scholar and was a divine before the beginning of the troubles when king charles the first's standard was raised at oxford hewitt was with the eager throng who in the first flush of enthusiasm offered their swords and he lived in the royalist army till the destruction of all its hopes likely enough being a minister of the gospel of peace he did not himself fight the new order thereafter established in the country allowed him liberty he found a new sphere of activity in the city of london where at the church under the shadow of old st paul's he preached with great applause says clarendon all men knew hewitt's views notoriously among puritans he was a malignant with hardly an effort at concealment he had invited his congregation to remember a distressed friend and money so collected in england for the exiled king was passed into france of that there was ample evidence the strongest reason existed for belief that hewitt himself had been engaged in more than one mission to the continent years went by years of disillusionment as cromwell out of surprising success was making failure and he was not touched many supporters of the monarchy suffered arrest or were driven into exile but never he had hewitt been given two years longer he would have had the joy of witnessing the restoration perhaps his sacred calling his blameless life spent in the service of others and the affection in which he was held by a wide section of the london populace his birth and social position may have made his political enemies hesitate who knows his wife was a daughter of robert bertie first earl of lindsay who was slain at edgehill she at least would have no mercy shown to his judges when again a king sat on the english throne she petitioned the house of lords representing that her late husband dr john hewitt was cruelly sentenced to die as a traitor by a tyrannical court of justice and soon after put to death to the unspeakable grief and irreparable loss of the petitioner and her fatherless children she prayed their lordships to accept those presumptuous murderers out of the act of oblivion and to bring all or some principle of them to speedy justice womanlike she could not forgive little we know of hewitt but from that little emerges a most engaging personality nothing soured by the hard adversity of the times a man with the natural gift of friendship possessing a strength of character that no shocks or temptations could divert from his assigned purpose dr mellifilis dr altivalans at dr inexhaustibilis he was styled by a contemporary the long arm of cromwell at last stretched out to reach him when in sixteen fifty eight stapley's plot was discovered of hewitt's connivance in that effort to commission in this country officers for the king in the rising then contemplated there is no certain evidence for he refused to plead denying the competency of the court and he was condemned in contumacy 
stapley's own testimony necessarily is suspect on the scaffold hewitt denied having seen the king or given shelter to the marquis of ormond who had come to england to ascertain the state of the royalist preparations as for a plot for setting london on fire he declared that he so trembled at the thought of such a horror that had he known of it he would have been the first to disclose his knowledge never had he met or been in correspondence with persons who would have carried out such a design but of his sympathy with if not actual participation in a premature effort to bring about the restoration there can be little doubt cromwell his mind always filled with old testament imagery likened hewitt to a flaming torch in the midst of a sheaf of corn meaning that as a public preacher it was within his power to foster discontents and seditions and from his own viewpoint of the country's needs the old protector was right hewitt complained that he was not heard by counsel on the question of the court's competency and that when he would have pleaded he was not allowed to do so he knew nothing of law a london alderman foot of coleman street ward sat on this court of justice with much dislike and unwillingness by his own testimony probably no plea by hewitt would have affected the result he had strong advocacy to plead for him cromwell's daughter mary had married lord falconbridge with the ceremony observed at that time and afterwards they were privately married by hewitt in st gregory's according to the prescribed rites of the church the lady was said secretly to have attended the church services to his own daughter's urgent and piteous appeal to him to preserve hewitt's life reinforced by that of her husband cromwell was inexorable it was in his mind that churchmen were his mortal enemies they should see what they were to trust to if they stood in need of his mercy the conviction was for treason against his highness the lord protector and the commonwealth the sentence was that passed upon all traitors whether to king or lord protector was the same that john hewitt doctor of divinity should be conveyed back again into the tower of london and from thence through the middle of the city of london directly to be drawn under the gallows of tyburn and upon the said gallows there to be hanged and being alive to be cut down to the ground and but the ghastly details of mutilation and quartering are best omitted any who want them may find them in a thousand records for what reason we do not know cromwell paid to this london divine the small grace of permitting that he should die the more honourable death by the axe on the morning of the eighth june sixteen fifty eight hewitt came out upon the scaffold at tower hill the usual crowd of onlookers had assembled i am now become a public spectacle to men and angels he told the people and i hope god who is omnipotent is now beholding me with some pity and great mercy and compassion i here give up myself freely and willingly to be a state martyr for the public good it was his trust that the god of mercy would pardon and forgive all those responsible for his fate he was brought into the world he said to bear witness to the truth of the gospel the church he commended for purity of doctrine and orderly discipline till a sad reformation had spoiled the face of the church and made it a query whether it was a church or no i cannot go he declared finally without my prayers for a blessing upon the people of this land for whom he then supplicated the prayer has been printed and little can it have pleased those officers of the law who stood around awaiting the headman's stroke his faith in god and king was alike strong unto death 
pity that the Stuarts were not more worthy of those stout hearts who served them. Lord, bless us all and bless him, the posterity, which in authority ought to rule over us and be above us. Bless him in his soul and in his body, in his friends and in his servants and all his relations. Give religious hearts to them that now rule in authority, loyal hearts in the subjects towards their supreme. Restore those banished, and of thy great mercy and in thy good time deliver thy people out of their necessities. There is no word written of the moment when the axe fell. Simply we are told by sympathizers that John Hewitt underwent his fate with great Christian courage. Men carried the mangled corpse of their pastor into St. Gregory's Church for burial. There on the following Sunday, the Reverend Nathaniel Hardy preached from the text Isaiah, LVII, 1, The Righteous Perisheth. With such outspokenness and assurance of popular approval that he printed the sermon under his own name. He dwelt upon the loss of this vigilant and faithful minister of God, who though out of the fight was not out of mind, nor would he be forgotten. The whole course of his life was a constellation of graces and virtues, both as he was a Christian and as he was a minister. Let that be John Hewitt's epitaph. End of chapter 10《ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピ Don't think that I owned Brick Court. Had I laid claim to a single chamber in that square, substantial, roomy building, be sure the benchers of Middle Temple would have smothered me under parchment proofs that theirs alone is the legal, incontestable, inalienable right to the freehold. But it is one of the joys won from association with historical things that, As familiarity grows, there comes with it a pleasant sense of sharing possession. Let the benchers extract their last penny of rent. The associations of these old temple courts, historical, literary, legal, are as much mine as they are theirs. I thus go about London as rich a man as any. No doubt the crack in the wall had been there before, gradually widening. I thought it a bad sign for the preservation of this ancient house, built on the steep slope of the hill and apparently breaking into halves. The gifted architect of the temple evidently thought the same, for soon after all the lawyer tenants were ejected and the building razed to the ground. Giving place to a new number one brick court, as good as the former one in everything except age. It was a popular tradition that this was one of the original brick buildings of the temple, come down to us, perhaps, from the spacious days of great Elizabeth. Long ago, Spencer had noted the rise of those bricky towers. The which on Thames broad aged back do ride, where now the studious lawyers have their bowers, there why loam won't the Templars knights to bide, till they decayed through pride. Obviously, to a knowing eye, this building was nothing of the sort, but had been erected soon after the great fire of London, probably about sixteen seventy nine. There was then a good deal of pulling down and rebuilding in the temple. But the earliest of the temple's brick houses stood on this same site. 
Thomas Daniel was treasurer of the inn early in Queen Elizabeth's reign, and it is recorded by the Middle Temple Parliament that that worthy, having spent much labour and money on the new brick buildings, his nephew, John Daniel, should, as reward, have admission to any vacant chamber pleasing him without fine. Afterwards came other blocks of brick chambers in Vine Court, James I, and in Pump Court, Elm Court, and elsewhere under Charles I. Possibly because of these brick buildings, Middle Temple escaped with the loss of only one house in the flames of 1666, when the neighboring Inner Temple was almost completely burnt out. The order went out in the year 1678. That brick court and the garden on the north side shall be made one court and buildings erected on all sides of it. And in these demolitions probably disappeared those bricky towers that Edmund Spencer had seen and sung of. London under Elizabeth being almost wholly timber-built, with some conscious pride in their achievement, the Middle Temple benchers had named this little beflagged square Brick Court. The living interest in Brick Court is not in what has gone, but in what survives. Number two was Oliver Goldsmith's last home. In the rooms, two floors up, on the right-hand side, as you enter to ascend the staircase, he passed the closing years of his warm-hearted, irresponsible, thriftless life. A plaque high on the external wall marks the set. The death chamber is but a square cupboard. Really, it is little more. A central enclosure having no ventilation through the outer walls, and lighted only by a dim pane of glass, or the open door. Thackeray himself a later tenant in this house, of course explored the rooms, and he wrote to Forrester, I was in Goldsmith's chambers in Brick Court the other day. The bedroom is a closet without any light in it. It quite pains one to think of the kind old fellow dying off there. There is some good carved work in the rooms, and one can fancy him with General Oglethorpe and Tomfin Bokler, and the fellow coming in with the screw of tea and sugar. What a fine picture Leslie would make of it! No change has been made in the little death chamber, save that the present occupant of the set has stuffed it with books, a fitting use, and one that surely Goldsmith himself would have liked best. He came to these rooms in 1768. The outlook brightened, and he had money in hand, although then, as always, he was deeply in debt. Garrick had refused his The Good-Natured Man, but a successful production of the comedy at Covent Garden Theatre brought him about five hundred pounds. Fortune's wheel had turned at last in his favour, Remember that for the Vicar of Wakefield his first payment was but sixty pounds, though perhaps more came later. And with four hundred pounds, he purchased a life lease of the Brick Court Chambers. The balance, one may be sure, was quickly squandered. Dr. Johnson is said first to have spurred on Goldsmith to improve upon his customarily squalid surroundings, little as encouragement and extravagance was needed. Goldsmith furnished his chief apartment with Wilton carpet, blue marine covered sofa, and chairs corresponding, blue marine curtains, chimney glass, Pembroke and card tables, and tasteful bookshelves. As you stand today in the amply proportioned sitting room, with three long windows overlooking Essex Court, where the leaves of the trees rustling in the wind fleck the glass panes with shadow, it is easy to imagine it as when he occupied it. 
Mr. H. Hamilton Fox, the present occupant of the chambers, has followed the example of many previous tenants by treating them with reverent care. The carvings about the door cases and in the cornice have been coated with somber black, much to their advantage. Once they were picked out, in curious taste, in florid reds and blues and greens. The literary workshop is believed to have been the smaller room looking into Brick Court. Structurally, there have been no alterations. London's distractions interfered with Goldsmith's work, and for spells of serious labor, he went into country lodgings. Footnote I have drawn freely in what follows upon my own Fleet Street in Seven Centuries, now out of print. End footnote she Stoops to Conquer, was written at Hyde, a farm six miles on the Edgware Road, to which he often retired. For this reason, there is difficulty in saying where his manuscripts were produced. He appears to have written in Brick Court the greater part of the deserted village, perhaps today the most widely appreciated of his poems. It was commenced in 1768, soon after arrival there. His young lawyer friend and fellow Templar, Cook, calling when two days' progress upon the poem had been made, found that ten lines, fifth to fourteenth, had been the morning's output. And when Cook entered his chambers, Goldsmith read them aloud. Dear lovely bowers of innocence and ease, Seats of my youth when every spot would please, How often have I loitered o'er thy green, Where humble happiness endeared each scene, How often have I paused on every charm, The sheltered cot, the cultivated farm, The never-failing brook, the busy mill, The decent church that topped the neighboring hill, the hawthorn bush with seats beneath the shade for talking age and whispering lovers made. Come, added Goldsmith, let me tell you this is no bad morning's work. And now, my dear boy, if you are not better engaged, I should be glad to enjoy a shoemaker's holiday with you. The invitation was the prelude to a ramble from the temple into the country. The social life into which Goldsmith launched, when settled in Brick Court, added to his embarrassments. The bills of Mr. Philby, the tailor, of the Harrow in Walter Lane, hard by, grew larger. The Tyrian bloom satin grain and garter blue silk breeches were charged at eight pounds to sovereigns seven pence. Another suit was lined with silk and with gold buttons. In fancy I have seen that clumsy little figure here at home, the plain features marked with smallpox, and short thick legs arrayed in purple silk small cloths, a handsome scarlet roquelaire buttoned close under the chin, and with all the additional importance derivable from a full-dress professional wig, a sword, and a gold-headed cane. Up the same oak staircase that we tread today, the temple oak was chosen to endure, might often have been seen toiling the unwieldy form of Samuel Johnson and Sir Joshua Reynolds, David Garrick, Edmund Burke, Hugh Kelly, and others of that brilliant circle of conversationalists in which the host did not shine. That, at least, is the contemporary judgment which posterity has accepted. Admit that Goldsmith said many good things. His description of Boswell as only a burr that Tom Davies, the bookseller, threw at Johnson in jest, and he has stuck to him ever since. His suggestion to enlarge the club because the original members had by that time 
travelled over each other's minds his happy remark that if johnson made little fishes talk he would make them talk like whales these are not to be improved upon johnson it was who said that the misfortune of goldsmith in conversation is this that he goes on without knowing how he is to get off and there is garrick's playful epitaph of him here lies nolly goldsmith for shortness called nal who wrote like an angel but talked like poor paul i always carry upstairs with me to that one ample room in the set of chambers the recollections of delightful days that the family of mr seguin have kept for us they were guests at brick court seguin was an irish merchant to two of whose children goldsmith stood godfather they talked says forrester of supper parties with younger people as well in the london chambers as in suburban lodgings preceded by blind man's bluff forfeits or games of cards and where goldsmith festively entertaining them all would make frugal supper for himself off boiled milk they related how he would sing all kinds of irish songs with what special enjoyment he gave the scottish ballad of johnny armstrong his old nurse's favorite how cheerfully he would put the front of his wig behind or contribute in any other way to the general amusement and to what accompaniment of uncontrollable laughter he danced a minuet with mr seguin the learned blackstone was a tenant of the rooms immediately below where he labored at his commentaries that work upon which successive generations of rising barristers have been nurtured he complained of disturbance by the noise of revelry that went on over his head a mr children succeeded him and made the same complaint for six years goldsmith maintained close associations with the temple broken by many intervals of absence happy days were spent when he left care behind and visited paris accompanying mrs hornick and her two daughters whom he had known through reynolds he was in brick court in seventeen seventy three when a libel by his old enemy kenrick printed in the london packet roused him to personal vengeance kenrick had written insultingly of his passion for the lovely mary hornick the jessamy bride goldsmith sallied out to the shop of evans the publisher and struck him with his cane a struggle ensued an overturned lamp swinging from the ceiling covered both combatants with oil and the angry poet rode home to the temple in a coach he paid fifty pounds to a welsh charity to settle a threatened lawsuit then with the suddenness of tragedy the bright days were eclipsed and there came the end debt and remorse hovering about the deathbed in that pathetic little closet in brick court without any light in it goldsmith returned from hyde in the middle of march seventeen seventy four his spirit was crushed he was worried and ill in the country he had worked upon his animated nature and seen it ready for the press its proceeds long since received and spent was ever poet so trusted before asked johnson reporting goldsmith's debts to be two thousand pounds on the twenty fifth of that month he took to his bed with less than a fortnight of life remaining for him is your mind at ease asked dr turton who attended at the bedside no it is not was goldsmith's melancholy answer these were his last words and at a quarter to five on the morning of monday the fourth april seventeen seventy four he expired he was but forty-five 
down these same oak stairs men carried his coffin and there were those gathered about who felt his loss outcasts of the great city whom goldsmith in his generous large-hearted life had befriended johnson wrote his epitaph which is in westminster abbey but his bones do not rest in our national mausoleum look into the little burial ground north of the temple church where gravel and worn tombstones laid flat have made a smooth walk you find a coped stone bearing the words here lies oliver goldsmith the location given may not be exactly true for goldsmith had no honor at his grave till the middle of last century and when this stone was there placed in the year eighteen fifty six knowledge of the exact site of internment had been lost there was an old gardener servant who remembered being told by an earlier old gardener of the temple that the coffin was laid at a spot a few feet nearer the church wall than that now marked but be that right or not goldsmith rests undisturbed here in the sunshine and the shadow about the temple church what matters a foot or two's measure he wrote the most human story the most humorous play some of the tenderest poetry some surpassing prose year by year i find the wreath laid upon his stone at the death day and thereby and by the stream of literary pilgrims trickling to this quiet corner we in this twentieth century know that he is not forgotten End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of more about unknown london by walter george bell this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Janet Chapter 12 Treasure Houses It was rather a trial in old days to possess treasure, but such is the cupidity born in us that men sought it. Land brought income and power, and treasure could purchase land. That apart, there was not much to be done with it. The hoarder could trust nobody and he got nothing not even the return of goshen's two and a half per cent consoles of course money could be spent and some people seized upon that idea jewels were even more burdensome than accumulations of money and still more useless but they had this compensation always there were the shrines of odd saints which might be enriched by the gift of jewels the donor thereby obtained a reputation for devoutness and that cheaply for he was only handing over to the care of the church things the care of which by himself was always a nuisance kings were fond of thus discarding their cares witness henry the third's gifts to the shrine of edward the confessor in westminster abbey a gold image of st edmund crowned having two great sapphires a king with a great garnet in his breast and other stones the blessed virgin and her son set with rubies emeralds sapphires and garnets his queen gave an image of the virgin with emerald and ruby sapphires and garnets rubies and emeralds that they were heartily glad to get rid of these i never doubt precious stones are the most futile of all worldly possessions yet they have through all ages been vastly prized and through all ages have been a great nuisance to their possessors they have tempted thieves and many men have gone to the gibbet for them giving in exchange life a much more precious thing with banks and strong rooms and safe deposit vaults and safes of hardened steel we to-day shift from our shoulders much of the care that attends possession but it was not always so 
men built for their treasure special treasure houses and the state had many of them and the church still more i went not long ago over one of these state treasure houses the jewel tower at westminster still bearing its old name and here it is pictured it is remote unknown a forlorn fragment of old westminster this jewel tower many pass by but few see it for it rises behind the offices and residences in old palace yard opposite is the house of lord's entrance you get by far the best glimpse of the tower from a point within college mews it was difficult to ascertain whose were the rights in it now but ultimately i discovered that control was exercised by his majesty's board of trade whose wonderful collection of standard weights and measures well worth seeing overflows into the old building they are sherry of giving permission to anybody to visit the jewel tower i was privileged but found no jewels there the masonry structure is very old and its origin is lost what king or subject built this tower and for what purpose none can tell the interior vaulting of the lower chambers has molded ribs and finely carved bosses all suggesting the age of richard the second abbot litlington is thought to have done this work for it is much like his acknowledged work in the westminster cloisters the external walls are apparently much earlier thirteenth century dean stanley citing widmore as authority says the tower was sold to the crown in the last year of king edward the third's reign and suggests that its previous use was that of a monastic prison that raises issues i make no attempt to solve the tower stands outside the precinct or sanctuary wall and with much more likelihood it is a relic of the ancient royal palace of westminster yet there is a link with the abbey for a part of its small plot of ground formed in ancient times part of the property which belonged to the prior's portion canon westlake tells me there are scattered references to the tower in the abbey records it is not clear whether what passed to edward the third was a tower already existing or only land the whole subject is obscure little more land is about the tower today than the soil upon which it stands were its plan regular it would be roughly thirty feet square but it has six sides a square of fourteen feet being taken out at one corner thus there is space on the lower floor for a large room and a small room the dimensions of which are reduced by the great thickness of the walls which at the lower window is four feet such strong building of so small a tower suggests that it was a treasure house and this is borne out by the fact that the smaller chamber or cell presumably the jewel chamber can be entered only through the interior partition wall which has space for double doors the rooms above have a modern vaulting no doubt put in as a security against fire king charles i and rushworth the clerk assistant of the house of commons retired to the seclusion of this tower to compare notes after the attempted arrest of the five members the tower has been known for ages back as the jewel tower or the king's jewel house that probably was its earliest use but the only records that we have of it are as a depository for acts of parliament it was the parliament office wherein the records of the house of lords were stored till their transference under queen victoria to the victoria tower of the modern houses of parliament it has not the strength 
nor the age of the chapel of the picts in the neighbouring westminster abbey that too was a royal treasure house a relic of the saxon confessor's original building and perhaps the oldest chamber of all the abbey which survives it is built of heavy masonry with stout short piers from which the semicircular vaulting of the roof springs and looks like a place that it would be impossible to force save with connivance of those entrusted with its charge it has double doors of great strength with altogether seven locks it was enclosed within the abbey walls and furthermore was protected by the tremendous prestige of the church of st peter and of the saxon confessor himself bold was the man who would attempt to force that stronghold yet it was forced and that so early as the year thirteen o three out of this chapel of the picts was extracted none other than the english regalia and much treasure of king edward i accumulated for the scottish wars though that king's great crown and three other crowns jewel in clustered were left strewn about the floor not being easily marketable with other valuable pieces that was the most famous robbery in england's history more daring than colonel blood's attempt on king charles the second's regalia in the tower of london these villains got away with chattels represented in modern money values by around two millions sterling more than a whole year's proceeds by edward's tax-gatherers obtained by force throughout the realm of england it is part of the story of the crime as it has come down to us from the trial of the persons accused that with the wicked connivance of holy men within the covent a crop of tall flax had been specially raised in the cloister garth that it might conceal till disposal the stolen treasure and in fact did so conceal it in that situation but five yards of stone walk separated the tall flax from the doors of the chapel of the picts the spot is to-day the green lawn enclosed by the covered cloister walks along which the visitor to westminster abbey rambles edward was at linlithgow in june thirteen o three when news that his royal treasury had been raided reached him rousing his fierce indignation the robbery had been perpetrated in the last days of april forthwith writs came down from scotland one hastening upon another to arrest the abbot of westminster and his brethren forty-eight in number these and thirty-two other persons were committed to the tower of london the judges were charged immediately to hear and determine the issue jurors in all counties where sales had been made by the robbers scattered to collect evidence it was their duty at that time to collect not to judge evidence all knew the fury of the royal master happily for them absent and trembled for his return as pieced together we have a fairly complete story though not the whole of it john de drokensford master of the king's wardrobe on june twentieth went with others to westminster to investigate and opened the doors of the treasury and entered therein with the company assembled and he found the treasury broken into the chests and coffers broken open and many goods carried away and incidentally the crowns scattered about the floor as already described william the palmer the keeper of the king's palace gave most damaging evidence perhaps reluctantly for there is deep suspicion of his guilty knowledge of the robbery he said that he saw the sacrist of the abbey the sub-prior and various monks go in and out early and late about the time of the burglary and they often carried many things towards the church of what things 
he knew not. On a certain day the monk Alexander of Pershore and others of his brethren were seen to take a boat and row from the abbey out upon the Thames, loading it with two large panniers covered with black leather, in which there was a great weight of treasure, no doubt, but that William the Palmer professed not to know. They returned after evening bell in another boat. Five other robbers conveyed away on horseback more treasure for two nights running. There is mention of this in the city records. It is written in letter book C at Guildhall that William de Kinbentone and John his brother and Chaston a Labarbre and Alice his sister met that eventful week in a certain house within the close of Fleet Prison together with a horseman and five other ribalds unknown for two nights and there spent the time until midnight eating and drinking and then withdrew with arms towards westminster in the morning they returned and this they did for two nights and never were seen again and because about the same time the treasury was broken into they were held suspect of felony and the city's officers were commanded, together with the king's marshals, to take them alive or dead. The daring thieves had sold much stolen treasure. Richard de Patelicate, self-styled a traveling merchant for wool, cheese, and butter, went to Northampton and Colchester, and there had got rid of jewels. He was seized and was found with articles worth two thousand two hundred pounds in his possession say thirty five thousand pounds in modern values this man was a prize to hold instigated there too no doubt by methods of torture he informed upon his confederates john allen designed the tools for the burglary but richard de patelicate according to his own account, was the prime instrument in it. When a suitor in the Westminster law courts, his cupidity had been aroused by seeing servants of the abbey conveying plate and spoons of silver into the monk's refectory. He had broken successfully into the refectory, and there the idea came to him that a raid upon the immense wealth contained in the treasury itself nearby was a possible venture he cannot have told all john de ramage was suspected because he was seen coming from and going to the abbey and on a sudden had dressed himself very richly and acquired horses and arms and he boasted the fool that he could buy a town if he pleased a linen draper of St. Giles had a large pannier full of broken vessels of gold and silver sent to him by certain monks of Westminster. The king's proclamation, promising death of a surety to all concerned, so alarmed him that he gave the valuables to a shepherd boy who hid them at Kentish Town, and there, verifying his story, they were found. The good monkish chroniclers have labored, but with small success, to show that, whose ever was the guilt, it was not among the holy monks of Westminster. It was John de Linton who sowed the tall flax in the cloister garth, refused admission to the man who had bought the abbey herbage to reap it, and after the robbery destroyed traces of footprints by scattering dirt about wealthy merchants of london i say with regret were found to have purchased many cheap lots of precious stones and plate much of the scattered treasure was recovered for its rightful owner there is strong suspicion that the robbery was arranged between the sacrist of westminster abbey richard de Palicate, and the keeper of the king's palace the abbot and his brethren obtained their release the sacrist made out a case for himself, a poor one, representing 
that the valuables found in his cell he had seized not knowing their origin as a waif within the jurisdiction of the church and therefore properly in his keeping the others against whom guilt was brought home passed to the gallows and six centuries after no tears need be wasted upon their fate today the chapel of the picts has a narrow way walled off sufficient only for a passage in the cloister without the masonry indicated a blocked doorway when more than half a century ago sir gilbert scott obtained permission to explore on removing the obstructing stone courses and a quantity of dry rubbish behind he came upon an ancient doorway and his report says on the inner side of the doorway i found hanging from beneath the hinges some pieces of white leather a friend to whom i had shown them sent a piece to mr quicket the curator of the college of surgeons who pronounced them to be human it is clear that the door was entirely covered with them both within and without this was edward's vengeance these were robbers skins the doorway thus revealed after being for centuries walled up originally gave admission to the stairs leading up to the monk's dormitory and by it the monks passed they had this warning always before them the terror of the human skins however did not satisfy edward or his successors as giving sufficient protection for after the robbery the whole part was built in with masonry there being no access to the chapel of the picts save by the double doors with seven locks where to-day the visitor enters and steps down to the ancient stone floor dean milman wrote that in his day inside and outside of the door by which this passage is entered may be felt under the iron clamps fragments of what modern science has declared to be the skin of a human being i wonder you may enter the chapel of the picts on fridays admission free without any feeling of shrinking horror for i have looked over its door and found nothing it is likely that at a later date the king's treasure was removed to that immensely strong norman undercroft of the chapter house which has mention as the treasury of the king's wardrobe below the chapter house of westminster footnote some recent writers believe the king's treasury rated to have been the norman undercroft of the chapter house there may be sufficient evidence to disturb the long tradition of the place but i do not know it both this and the picts chapel are below the chapter house in the sense of being in its shadow for only a wall's thickness separates them End of footnote. it is entered only by a narrow doorway and stairs down at the angle of poet's corner and there again were the ghastly trophies of nailed human skins exhibited in terrorum about the store stood the chapel of st blaise and what was known as the old revestry both swept away to make a clear space for the poet's corner as we now see it dart who wrote his west monasterium in the year seventeen twenty three declared that this chapel which is called the chapel of henry the eighth for what reason i know not unless for that he stripped it of its furniture is enclosed with three doors the inner cancellated the middle which is very thick lined with skins like parchment and driven full of nails these skins they by tradition tell us were some skins of the danes tanned and given here as a memorial of our delivery from them 
I think dart and tradition mistook their meaning. Long centuries back, the Danes used to sail their craft up the mouths of English rivers, and landing, sack villages and churches. It seems to have been the unpleasant custom of our ancestors, when such sacrilegious robbers were taken, to flay them and nail their skins to the church door as a warning to any who came after. Worcester Cathedral bore a human skin upon its north door. The church of Hadstock, in Essex another, said to be that of a Dane. Copford, also in Essex, had a third. Specimens of these last three are to be seen in the anatomical museum of the College of Surgeons in Lincoln's Inn Fields, to which they were presented by Mr. Way. It was that archaeologist's curious bend to make such finds. Frank Buckland, the naturalist, whose father was dean of Westminster, has told that not very long ago, from his own day, of course, a portion of hard, dry skin was found underneath the bossed head of a huge iron nail that was fixed upon the door of the Abbey Chapter House. Upon this skin were found several hairs. Mr. Queckett, then curator of the College of Surgeons, recognized the skin to be human, and asserted that it belonged to a fair-haired person. Pepys, at Rochester Cathedral, had his curiosity excited. Then away thence, diary, 1661, April 10th, observing the great doors of the church, as they say, covered with the skins of Danes. The walls of the undercroft of Westminster Abbey Chapter House were built twelve feet in thickness. That was thought not enough, and another ring of masonry was added, increasing the thickness to seventeen feet. It is of interest to recall that this stronghold of the abbey was again used as a treasure house in the war years of 1915 to 1918, for to its security were confided the king's coronation chair and the scone stone upon which, till the English Edward seized it, the Scottish kings were crowned. The two-handed sword, borne before King Edward III in his wars in France, the helmet, shield, and saddle of King Henry V, carried at his funeral, and other easily movable treasures of the abbey. There they were thought as safe as anywhere from the bombs of a German aviator, and they were returned to public exhibition in their accustomed places, only after the armistice. In the crypt of St. John's Chapel within the Tower of London, absurdly named by the indicating sign Raleigh's cell is a strong interior vaulted cell eight feet by ten feet without light or ventilation this is thought to have been the hold for the treasure contained within the fortress there enjoying the church's protection the sanctity associated with places consecrated to god led to the use of many of our churches as storehouses for treasure, in London as elsewhere. The temple was frequently so used. King Edward I, on return from his victorious campaign in Wales, entered the temple with armed followers, and in pretense that he came to inspect his mother's jewels, he broke open coffers, and carried away ten thousand pounds to Windsor. The Bishop of Chester had gold and silver and a quantity of jewels and precious stones in the temple treasury, when King Edward the Second, going there with his favorite, Piers Gaveston, raided it. The Carmelite Priory in Fleet Street served a like purpose, though its sense of security sustained a nasty shock when in 1307 robbers broke in. 
that was only four years after the great hall at king edward i's royal treasury at westminster abbey already recalled the thieves had the aid and connivance within of one friar judas and they carried away forty pounds of silver stored there by a certain knight they bound in an atrocious way says an old chronicler the hands of the prior and of several of the friars and one they killed and then took their departure judas also went away with them but soon afterwards he had a halter put around his neck and was hanged friar judas you note i feel sure that name was an afterthought end of chapter 12chapter thirteen of more about unknown london by walter george bell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by janet chapter thirteen dr johnson's womankind more persons i realize quite well know and love old samuel johnson's gruff personality than no golf square it naturally is a bit puzzling to find a square which is not of that shape at all, but is merely a passage widened out, into which you may just drive, if your Jarvie knows London's spider ways very intimately indeed, but cannot drive out of, save back by the way you came. Then, geographically, it is not among the squares of London, which are about Bloomsbury and farther west. Gough Square is in the city, which explains its mystery. I would set down a stranger in newspaper land within three minutes' walk of it, with assurance that in half an hour he would not find his quest unaided. The way by road is too tortuous to be set out in a short book, but if walking up Fleet Street's north side you turn into Hind Court or Bolt Court, both footways you quickly stumble upon gough square samuel johnson lived there for eleven years and his house still stands filling up one end it is the last of johnson's london homes surviving a hotel's rear rooms obtrude into johnson's court whereabouts he once lived and the county council's school of photo engraving at the top of bolt court all our courts off fleet street occupies the place where he died all good johnsonians know this as their alphabet but i am guiding the footsteps of the inn expert it is a small though substantial house in warm red brick dating i take it from the first of our Georges, for Maitland, who published his London in 1735, described Gough Square as then recently built, with very handsome houses well inhabited by persons of fashion. Samuel Johnson, the new tenant in the year 1748, may have felt a little strange among the quality for he was not then the great cham of letters that afterwards he became. Nor was he entirely a little cham, for his fame was beginning, and his voice, often raised, was heard with respect. He was then thirty-nine. But most for which we remember him occurred after he had moved into Gough Square. He went there with the contract in his pocket, for writing the dictionary of the english language which with ever buoyant hope he expected to accomplish in three years it took eight and the quiet of this byway for the task sheltered from the buzz and roar of the fleet street he knew so well may have been the inducement i went over the old place the other day with a party of enthusiastic johnsonians filling the small rooms, making them noisy with their chatter. 
we followed the footsteps of carlyle who with difficulty had found the stout old-fashioned oak balustrated house these i was told at the head of the stairs on the first floor were the salons in which johnson received his guests panelled rather pokey right and left of the landing or vestibule the sleeping rooms were next above but possibly the sage's own sanctum which we know was upstairs was one of these in the topmost long garret the length of the house front with its sloping roof johnson's six amanuenses working upon the english dictionary toiled at their heavy task all this left me cold for i had been there before my interests for the moment were with mrs samuel johnson and i sought out the kitchen it is below ground of course rather like a vault notable for nothing except the wide space of its open fireplace its proportions seem to tell that not only were men great drinkers in those georgian days but great eaters as well i must seem horribly ungallant going into the kitchen to visualize mrs samuel johnson but where else should i place the good lady of course her rightful place should be in the salon by sam johnson's side receiving the great for joshua reynolds samuel richardson rubilek dr burney hugh kelly and more we know were guests at gough square garrick often i imagine for from this house johnson went out to see the performance of his tragedy irene which garrick produced at drury lane i love the story repeated by boswell very likely it is untrue of johnson stolidly seated among the audience and being dissatisfied with some of the speeches and the conduct of his own play expressing his disapproval aloud the same incident is told of la fontaine but i am doubtful about mrs johnson's place i think she was a good housewife and helpmate and for this reason you may think it a strange one when sir joshua took rubilek to gough square the sage we are told received them with great civility and took them up into a garret which he considered as his library where beside his books all covered with dust there was an old crazy deal table and still worse elbow chair having only three legs long service was done by these wrecks of furniture dr burney also knew them after having taken tea and dined one day with johnson the latter proposed to him to go up with him into his garret which being accepted he there found about five or six greek folios a deal writing desk and a chair and a half johnson gave to his guest the entire seat and tottered himself on one with only three legs and one arm whether mrs johnson was living when reynolds and rubilek came together i cannot say for she died at this house in gough square in march seventeen fifty two that was four years after the couple settled down there and the widower was terribly sad and disconsolate but the scholar's room so tersely and graphically pictured for us obviously had not received a woman's attentions no tidier or spring cleaner had obtruded there if mrs samuel johnson lived then she had been content to leave her husband's sanctum alone the hallmark of a good wife i think she was chiefly domestic though with some qualities of mind and character that had appealed to her youthful and ardent lover we hardly hear of her alive it is only after her death that we find in johnson's diaries never meant for our prying eyes those pathetic references to her worth and know how deep was his affection she was always the dear teddy 
of his lasting memory. Samuel Johnson married, when a young man of twenty-seven, Mrs. Elizabeth Porter, a widow. Her grown son was not pleased, but with the daughter, Lucy Porter, the stepfather appears always on the basis of most cordial relations. The bride is said spitefully to have been double the age of her groom, which is not true, but the stark fact is that she was in her forty-eighth year. She is said to have been a plain-featured person, but was not so in Johnson's admiring eyes. She had a little money. That, I have seen it represented as though it were a matter of course, was the attraction to the poor scholar. Every fool can say as much. It is the measure, no doubt, of his own desires. Her little fortune was at most a few hundreds. Porter, a poor creature, had died insolvent. The guinea was, of course, then worth more than the gold piece today, if ever you chance to see one, and she did not pay three pounds two sovereign six penny a ton for coal or other fuel burnt in that great kitchen fireplace at Gough Square. The experienced Mrs. Porter presumably could take care of her little money herself. Why not give Johnson the greater credit in his marriage? David Garrick was Johnson's pupil in early days of wedlock, when he kept for a time a private academy, of which he soon tired. Garrick does not flatter Mrs. Johnson. He has described her as very fat, with swelled cheeks of a florid red, produced by thick painting, and increased by the liberal use of cordials. Flaring and fantastic dress, affectation both in speech and in general behavior, are other elements in the portrait. This is savage, and to my mind smacks of the extravagance of the theater. Although to Garrick she was a little painted puppet, Mrs. Thrale speaks of a portrait of her seen at Litchfield as very pretty and very like. Mrs. de Lumont, her companion at Hampstead when, in the Gough Square years, she retired there for a spell for reasons of health, tells of Mrs. Johnson that she indulged herself in country air and nice living, and at an unsuitable expense while her husband was dredging in the smoke of London, for London was smoky even then. She by no means, declared that lady, treated him with the complacency which is the most engaging quality in a wife. I call that merely spiteful. The kindest appreciation of a sort of Mrs. Johnson is, by a lady, Miss Williams, that she had a good understanding and great sensibility, but was inclined to be satirical. Always, poor lady, she seems to have been the target of ill-natured criticism. But then, she married at forty-eight. Sam Johnson himself, and he, after all, most matters, was blind to all these shortcomings in his wife that were so obvious to others. In his eyes, she was even beautiful. He wrote The Rambler in Gough Square, twice a week, year in and year out, by his own hand, for 208 numbers, receiving assistance only with four. It is a curious little sheet expressing his thoughts on divers subjects. The week that Johnson's wife died, the publication of The Rambler abruptly ceased. The shock seemed to have shattered his capacity for continuous work. His irritability of temper probably made him a difficult husband, and one can well imagine the lady suffered many trials. She got well home on that occasion when we are told she protested, Nay, hold, Mr. Johnson, and do not make a farce of thanking God for a dinner which in a few minutes you will protest is not eatable. That he had real affection for her is manifest. 
let me quote a single passage from his diary. This is the day on which, in 1752, dear Teddy died. I have now uttered a prayer of repentance and contrition. Perhaps Teddy knows that I prayed for her. Perhaps Teddy is now praying for me. God help me. That was not the expression of pain of a widower newly bereft. It bears date March 28, 1782, thirty years after her death. Then he was a sorely tired old man of seventy-three. There are others between, of which I give only this entry. April 23, 1753 I know not whether I do not too much indulge the vain longings of affection, but I hope they intenerate my heart, and that when I die like my Teddy, this affection will be acknowledged in a happy interview, and that in the meantime I am incited by it to piety. I will, however, not deviate too much from common and received methods of devotion. I will, with little fear of becoming wearisome in quotation, cite one other expression of Johnson's intimate thoughts, for it is useful in understanding his afterlife and solitude. It is the pathetic prayer that Boswell reverently copied, written on April 26th, 1752, being after twelve at night on the twenty-fifth. O Lord, Governor of heaven and earth, in whose hands are embodied and departed spirits, if thou hast ordained the souls of the dead to minister to the living, and appointed my departed wife to have care of me, grant that I may enjoy the good effects of her attention and ministration whether exercised by appearance, impulses, dreams, or in any other manner agreeable to thy government. Forgive my presumption, enlighten my ignorance, and however meaner agents are employed, grant me the blessed influences of thy Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Johnson was a religious man. He had no longing for spooks. The old man waited for that happy interview with his wife after death, feeling, he thought, her influence upon him in his solitary years. I will take no more physic, he said when lying prostrate near the end. Not even my opiates, for I have prayed that I may render up my soul to God unclouded. Johnson never married again. Ladies of my acquaintance have instanced that fact as proof of his constancy, an element in his character that redeems much of his gruffness and open rudeness, though these sides of him were shown to men alone. But I recall that it was Johnson also who said that a second marriage is a triumph of hope over experience which sounds worldly wise, though perhaps it is only empty sound. I will not set out the Latin epitaph that he placed over his wife's tomb in Bromley Church, but only record that, with a nice feeling which may surprise some of those who think of him only as uncivil and overbearing, he omitted all mention of the lady's age. The Rambler I have alluded to it is curious enough to recall that of the four numbers of the paper in which alone he received assistance, three were written by women, who were only beginning to feel their way with the pen at that time. He had the gift of making lasting friendships among women. Miss Catherine Talbot, who otherwise was published only posthumously, wrote number 30, and numbers 44 and 100 of the Rambler were by Mrs. Elizabeth Carter, Johnson's old friend of fifty years. Johnson never was uncivil, never was overbearing to women. 
he prided himself upon his unvarying courtesy to them there was i know one exception that will flash at once into mind he wrote a rough rude letter to mrs thrall at the time of her announcement to him of her contemplated marriage with paisi it is best out madam he wrote if i interpret your letter right you are ignominiously married if it is yet undone let us talk once more together if you have abandoned your children and your religion god forgive your wickedness if you have forfeited your fame and your country may your folly do no further mischief if the last act is yet to do i who have loved you esteemed you reverenced you and served you i who long thought you the first of womankind entreat that before your fate is irrevocable i may once more see you i was i once was madam most truly yours sam johnson he had no business to write that it was not his concern she had meant much in his solitary restless distressed old age five months after he had penned those lines he lay on his deathbed she was his greatest closest most intimate friend obviously he was writing under stress of the most intense emotion the shattering of a long-established friendship that he knew in his failing health and sorrowful years could not be replaced a gulf opened before the solitary old man that he had not the strength to look across let alone to bridge such future as he should know seemed black before him i do not condone the letter but it is very human mrs thrall replied to it with a dignity worthy of johnson himself i have said and i repeat that johnson prided himself on his courtesy to ladies he was more than courteous he was kind and he was charitable beyond his means to those in affliction when staying at streatham he never failed to come once a week to bolt court to visit the extraordinary company of pensioners he maintained at his house there the blind poetess miss williams had been among his earliest dependents i never came across her poems nor met one who had done so but a poetess is her traditional reputation he nursed says mrs thrall in her exuberant style whole nests of people in his house where the lame the blind the sick and the sorrowful always found a sure retreat from all the evils whence his little income could secure them and commonly spending the middle of the week at our house he kept his numerous family in fleet street upon a settled allowance but returned to them every saturday to give them three good dinners and his company before he came back to us on the monday night treating them with the same or perhaps more ceremonious civility than he would have done by as many people of fashion such testimony many of us would like to have given of ourselves nolkins's wife herself a mean person declared that dr johnson has done more injury by that constant practice of his of giving charity as it is called than he is aware of and i shall take an opportunity of telling him so when i next see him at sir john hawkins's johnson cherished the closest affection for his old mother after finishing one monumental work he wrote to bennett langdon that enjoying his new liberty he thought of taking an excursion why not to the home of the langstons in lincolnshire came the invitation i will give he wrote in reply the true reason which i know you will approve i have a mother 
more than eighty years old who has counted the days to the publication of my book in hopes of seeing me and to her i resolved to go she died in his last year at gough square he could be a flatterer that art he directed upon mrs charlotte lennox whose first novel harriet stuart came out in december seventeen fifty that was in the gough square days and johnson gave an entertainment in her honour the supper was elegant writes sir john hawkins johnson had directed that a magnificent hot apple pie should make a part of it and this he would have stuck with bay leaves because forsooth mrs lennox was an authoress and had written verses and further he had prepared for her a crown of laurel with which but not till he had invoked the muses by some ceremonies of his own invention he encircled her brows about five johnson's face shone with meridian splendour though his drink had been only lemonade they sat until daylight streamed in at the windows of the old devil tavern in fleet street leaving at eight in the morning Johnson's attentions turned Mrs. Lennox's head. Nobody liked her, wrote Mrs. Thrale. It is Miss Reynolds who tells amusedly of Johnson's nice observance, of ceremonious punctilious towards ladies. Never, she declares, would he suffer any lady to walk from his house to her carriage through Bolt Court or Johnson Court unattended by himself to hand her into it if any obstacle prevented the vehicle from driving off there he would stand in fleet street by the door of it his familiar and uncouth figure would gather a mob around him indeed the people would collect the moment the famous dr johnson appeared the passages were long the human mind had grasped newton's theory of gravitation but had not invented the umbrella and sometimes in the rain he got a ducking once at bolt court his visitor was mrs siddons the greatest of english actresses and johnson's servant frank barber bustling about could not immediately find a vacant chair for her in his untidy room you see madam said johnson majestically to his guest you see madam wherever you go there are no seats to be had his was a great courtesy if clumsy at times what matters the will was there and it is a poor spirit to smile only at the awkward performance if to be gentle in your bearing towards ladies be the true stamp of a gentleman then samuel johnson was a great gentleman perhaps with some few who read this i may have succeeded in placing johnson at a new angle for i am aware that greatly as men appreciate that distinguished man of letters with women the appreciation is less marked they think mostly of a sledgehammer style of knocking down an opponent in conversation of his brusque language and too often overbearing manner they have thought him hard ladies i have known have dismissed him tersely as a rude old man that he never was to them end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of more about unknown london by walter george bell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet. Chapter 14. A Carmelite Vault. My greatest respect, unmixed with envy, goes out to Mr. Smee, Messrs. Gething and Company, the possessor of this historic relic. His concern for its preservation equals my own. 
but neither he nor I will always be here to care for it. And both of us know how insatiable is the demand for space in this heart of newspaper land, for ever more machinery. For heavy printing machines, stable foundations must be found deep down. And once a newspaper proprietor comes into Brighton's Court, Whitefriars Street, what chance of surviving has this tiny Carmelite vault? It is the last link left with the great Carmelite priory, which till the Reformation spread over all this land from Fleet Street to Thameside. The Carmelite Church figures in Vander Wingard's 16th century drawing of London, its conical pointed steeple distinguishing it from all others that crowd into the panorama. The churches of the religious orders in London were enormous, each one built with the stateliness of a cathedral. Of that of the Blackfriars in its magnificence, there is a reminder in Piers Plowman's vision, its gay glittering glass glowing as the sun. How many chance visitors, I wonder, to the Norman Church of St. Bartholomew the Great, Smithfield, realize that all they see is but the chancel, transepts, and lady chapel. The vast nave, wholly destroyed, stretched over all the burial ground to the little gateway before the open Smithfield, which is, in fact, a doorway of the original west front. The Carmelite Church was vast, too, its choir extending to the edge of Whitefriars Street, and its western end almost touched the temple wall. In the cloistered settlement some hundreds of brothers lived, whose long white mantle, worn in public over the brown habit, made them the most familiar figures in Fleet Street till the dissolution of their London house in 1538. They were more familiar, indeed, than the gowned lawyers of the temple. They numbered in their ranks great theologians, great scholars. They had a valuable library of written and printed books. Friars white, black, and gray, Austin friars, all have gone. Of the generous buildings of the Dominican priory at Blackfriars, and of the Grey Friars at Newgate Street, not a stone remains above or below ground. There is, of the Austin Friars, the nave of their church alone, now used by the Dutch Protestant community in London for their worship, and of the Carmelites only this little vault. The last has survived many perils. It escaped the despoilers of Henry the Eighth's reign, whose cupidity made away with so much else. The flames of the great fire of London burnt harmlessly over it. Alsatia's lawless bands, the most infamously notorious of Whitefriars' inhabitants, forbade to destroy it. By fortune's favor it has come down to us today but little harmed. For a time this friar's vault was lost, or completely forgotten. It was rediscovered in 1867, and again forgotten. Its re-emergence came about in curious fashion. To find Brighton's Court, you go from Fleet Street far down the slope of Whitefriars Street, almost to the level land and on the right-hand side is a little paved alley bearing this name. It leads nowhere. Four or five houses remain, some a couple of centuries old, enclosing the space completely save for the narrow entranceway. The Carmelite vault is beneath the paving of the court upon which you tread. It chanced that in 1895 Mr. Henry Lumley had instructions to sell this whole property. Investigations at number four of the court took him into a dark cellar, which extended under the court itself. 
it had been used for the storage of coal and wood after rubbish had nearly filled the space to the roof a family named hurl then occupied the house as a dwelling they had been there in successive generations full ninety years and had some vague idea that this was a sort of uncanny cell but were content not to inquire too curiously into its history the grime and disorder could not conceal from an expert eye that here was fine mason's work so on close examination it proved the vault is fourteenth century entrance to it can only be obtained through the basement of number four brighton's court in the wall of which is an opening about two feet in height one scrambles through without difficulty and soon disappears in the darkness no light penetrates from the outer world but the flame of a candle gives sufficient illumination the first view fills one with complete surprise the vault is square measuring only twelve feet three inches on each side blocks of hard chalk form the walls and they have preserved through all the centuries their original whiteness they glisten in the candlelight eight moulded ribs of a dark stone stretch across like a spider's web meeting in a carved rose in the centre the roof forms a dome the ribs rising from the same springing level all around into the southeast side a corner of a dwelling house projects for which purpose one of the ribs has been cut away and another shortened this is the only mutilation the little chamber has undergone save that a coal shaft has been cut through the fourteenth century chalk closed by a victorian iron plate in the pavement it is a typically english touch one can just stand upright on the floor now made but it has been excavated down a brick floor was first disclosed then another layer of rubbish then a tiled floor possibly the original one and beneath this a bed of mortar resting upon clay some fragments of pottery and glass and a few other objects came to light on a careful sifting of the rubbish an ancient doorway still existing in the west wall and shown in the photograph was thought to give access to some subterranean passage possibly extending to the temple it is sufficiently accounted for as the exterior entrance to the vault and originally the only one what purpose this vault served must remain a matter of speculation it is too far south on the priory ground to have been any part of the church it stands clear of the buildings about the cloister one of the cloister walks trodden by the white friars survives in ashentry court today a dead end it has been conjectured by mr a w clapham who with painstaking industry and learning has reconstructed the plan of the priory that this relic is the undercroft of the priory's lodging that for various reasons is probable the crown of the vault lies about two feet six inches below the paved court little can london show today of the four great orders of mendicant friars they played a large part in london's story and their work among the dregs of the city's population the outcasts of humanity squalid leprous lost lightens the dark records of the poor throughout the medieval ages that with acquired wealth they fell into disrepute is nothing strange others have done the same religious and laymen alike we should keep and treasure this little relic of them that time has spared to the city of london one great newspaper proprietor i know 
revering old historical things in london in whose hands the carmelite vault would be safe if ever his premises should extend this way but the greatest of news magnates are no more immortal than are mr smee and myself it should be possible in any future scheme of reconstruction to build right around brighton's court and still to leave the little vault undisturbed where it has been these past five centuries and more but i should like to see the ancient monuments commission mark this building down for preservation in the city corporation as caretaker of those things it ought as a first duty to guard i have small confidence the city's past record is nothing short of deplorable End of chapter 14chapter 15 of more about unknown london by walter george bell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by janet chapter 15 tombstone stories we have lost the art of sepulchral inscription gladstone a name and a date on the pedestal of a marble figure charles dickens on a plain flat tombstone that suffices today i am confident that posterity will be the poorer for our presumptuous reticence of course we attribute it to greater modesty that fine element in our nature which makes repellent any imitation of the fulsome adulation of the epitaph upon the dead favored by our ancestors but is not our vanity actually greater than theirs they sought within the limitations of language at their command often in halting phrase often it is true descending to mere bathos to express the virtues of the dead they commemorated their merits should be figured in lasting stone we on our part assume that all future ages will know those virtues and that a name alone is enough to recall them assuredly the greater vanity is ours so when through shadowed cathedral or historic abbey or homely parish church the curious visitor passes with eyes open for all that is of interest it is the old monuments and the old epitaphs that he searches out so i feel confident will the visitor to these our shrines centuries hence passing by our own with their poor labels meagre as if intended for objects in museums we thus defeat our purpose by our short-sightedness de mortius nil nisi bonum i agree and if in pursuit of that end license should overlay truth history will correct it or oblivion pardon all the proudest epitaph conceived by man was surely that of bacon for himself which never was cut in stone my memory i leave to the charitable speeches of mankind to foreign nations and to the next age august simplicity both of thought and phrase is there the words are written in his will declaring his confidence that the achievements of his life would outlast the deep shadows amidst which his career closed i have found amusement for an idle hour in books of epitaphs from country churches and graveyards which laborious collectors of these genres have compiled the country of course london is always big enough to be overlooked there must be a great bulk of them in this metropolis awaiting harvest in preambulations of the city and westminster i have at times jotted down a few mostly those which recall some historic episode or personality a murder in pall mall is not the sort of subject one would expect to find chosen for representation with the funeral urn 
in westminster abbey too of all places look into the abbey in the south aisle of the great nave there on the blatant memorial of thomas tyne is the thing pictured tom of ten thousand he was vulgarly rich and the popular sobriquet indicates how his contemporaries thought of him that i imagine alone accounts for the sepulchral honors granted looking back over two and a half centuries the matter that his life was violently shortened does not seem cause for regret rochester's lines one recalls who'd be a wit in dryden's cudgelled skin or who'd be rich and senseless like tom tyne a wiltshire member of parliament was himself embroiled in violent courses his private marriage in somewhat scandalous circumstances with lord ogle's widow the heiress of the percy estates brought to him repeated challenges from count Konigsmark, himself an unsuccessful suitor tyne refused to fight and is credited with having sent six men to the continent to murder both the count and his second Konigsmark, failing to secure a meeting hired the services of three ruffians they stopped tyne's coach in pall mall and one of them shot him with a blunderbuss through the window opening a huge wound from which he quickly died political capital was made out of the crime which figures largely in the records of charles the second's later years the duke of monmouth whose partisan and wealthy western friend tyne was had left the coach but a few minutes before the spot was where waterloo place meets pall mall immediately before the united services club of today and there three of the assassins Bratz, Stern, and Borowski, all foreigners, were publicly hanged. It was made plain before their dispatch that they knew their quarry well enough and were not after Monmouth. Count Konigsmark, who was captured when endeavoring to fly the country, himself went free, thanks largely to court influence. The coach, the horse to murderers, the blunderbuss being fired, all are carefully sculptured in marble the coachman had a son a welsh farmer whose boast it afterwards was that his father's monument was to be seen in westminster abbey a long inscription was written intended to have recorded the event in detail but dean spratt vetoed this for the few plain words that appear above the recumbent figure thomas tyne of long late in cum wilts esquire who was barbarously murdered on sunday the twelfth of february sixteen eight and a half st swithin's church in cannon street is of unique interest for embedded in its exterior wall is the historical london stone fixed to appear within is a monument some ten feet high which bears this inscription near this place lies interned ye body of mr michael godfrey merchant late of this parish son of mr michael godfrey merchant and anne mary his wife he was born february the twenty second a d sixteen fifty eight being elected the first deputy governor of the bank of england he went for flanders on some important business relating to the service of his majesty where attending his royal person then encamped before namur he was slain by a cannonball from the works of the besieged july ye seventeenth sixteen ninety five he died a bachelor much lamented by all his friends relations and acquaintance for his integrity his knowledge and the sweetness of his manners his body was brought over and lies buried near his father's 
his sorrowful mother and executrix caused this monument to be erected to the pious memory of her beloved son namer won new significance in these recent years of war king william the third's siege of that formidable fortress being almost forgotten michael godfrey was a co-venturer with patterson in the establishment of the bank of england in sixteen ninety four and often too it is forgotten that that strongest commercial institution that the world has ever seen arose out of a loan of one million two hundred thousand pounds advanced for carrying on the war in flanders the lenders receiving with eight per cent interest in corporation and the right of trading in bills of exchange bullion and forfeited pledges godfrey the first deputy governor and two others had crossed to belgium to establish a branch in antwerp for the coining of money with which to pay the troops arrived before namur godfrey was invited by the king to take dinner in his tent and thereafter he went into the trenches attracted by that irresistible curiosity which would compel most of us in like circumstances to see how war was envisaged at close quarters william noticed him there among the officers of his staff with surprise and anger mr godfrey he said you ought not to run these hazards you are not a soldier you can be of no use to us here sir answered godfrey i run no more hazard than your majesty not so said william i am where it is my duty to be and i may without presumption commit my life to god's keeping but you a cannon-ball from the ramparts at that moment laid godfrey dead at the king's feet it may be added to what is told by the inscription at st swithin's that fear of being godfreyed such was during some time the cant phrase akin to our own stellenbosch of the boer war did not prevent idle gazers from coming to the trenches though king william forbade his english coachmen footmen and cooks to expose themselves he repeatedly saw them skulking near the most dangerous spots and trying to get a peep at the fighting sometimes it was said he was provoked into horsewhipping them out of the range of the french guns of the fortress adventure will out in our blood and none need regret it st swithin's church in the city by the way is the only london dedication to the rainy saint sadder than any other memorial stone i know is the prettily designed woodmason tablet in the church of st peter cornhill high up on the south wall of the chancel it is unfortunately so placed that none can read its tale of woe but the kind wife of the rev g bell doty the vicar has sent me the inscription which i give here having brought together some of the very short lines james born twenty june seventeen seventy three mary born twenty eight august seventeen seventy four charles born seventeen february seventeen seventy six harriet born ten march seventeen seventy seven george born thirty january seventeen seventy eight john eliz twins born twenty two march seventeen seventy nine the whole offspring of james and mary woodmason in the same awful moment of the eighteen january seventeen eighty two translated by sudden and irresistible flame in the late mansion of their sorrowing parents from the sleep of innocence to eternal bliss their remains collected from the ruins are here combined a sympathizing friend of the bereaved parents their companion through the night of the eighteen january in a scene of distress beyond the powers of language perhaps of imagination 
devotes this spontaneous tribute of the feelings of his mind to the memory of innocence i h c the fire occurred in the parents house in lendenhall street that day being the queen's birthday a magnificent ball was given at st james palace in honour of the anniversary mr woodmason and his wife were among the guests and the former was called out only to learn that in his absence all his children had been consumed in the flames mr isaac heard clarence king of arms afterwards sir isaac heard garter king was with the bereaved parents when the sorrowful news was broken to them and it was he who raised this touching memorial to the seven children in st peter's church this deplorable occurrence was deeply felt by the royal family some of whom visited the scene several other persons also perished in this one accidental fire in a city merchant's dwelling-house more persons lost their lives than in the flames of the great fire of london footnote w g bell the great fire of london in sixteen sixty six why should not an author occasionally honor his own works with quotation it is his only method of showing his appreciation End footnote a plain stone tablet is fixed on the north cloister wall of westminster abbey with the old lettering of king james the first's reign deeply cut it has held my attention as i have wandered about that famous pile searching for new joys rarely being disappointed of lawrence i know nothing except what is gained from his stone but as so early an exemplar of their craft he should be a worthy among the legions of shorthand writers of to-day thus are his homely merits set out with diligence and trust most exemplary did william lawrence serve a prebendary and for his pains now passed before not lost gained this remembrance at his master's cost o oh, read these lines again you seldom find a servant faithful and a master kind shorthand he wrote his flower in prime did fade and hasty death shorthand of him hath made well couth he numbers and well mursed land thus doth now that ground whereon you stand wherein he lies so geometrical art maketh some but thus will nature all obit december twenty eighth sixteen twenty one Atida Swa twenty nine. The Boar's Head in East Cheap had great fame among London taverns. Shakespeare and Burbage and Ben Jonson are said to have used it when crossing to the theatres on Bankside, and when returning after the play. It is indicated by Shakespeare, the name appears only in the later folios as the scene of the drunken debaucheries of sir john falstaff and his noisy dependents bardolph and pistol when dame quickly kept the reckoning and of daltiersheet's frailties the statue of king william the fourth looking from the centre of the street towards london bridge at this moment it was threatened with removal stands a few yards east of the tavern site the boar's head was consumed in the great fire of london was rebuilt and long after flourished till finally its roistering trade went elsewhere and at last figured as a gunmaker's shop a link with the famous tavern remains to us you find it at st magnus the martyr but not within the church it is hidden away in that little dreary plot of paved court by the side which was part of the churchyard where seldom visitors go there against the wall is this headstone commemorating some simple virtues here lieth the body of robert preston late drawer at the boar's head tavern in great eastcheap 
who departed this life march the sixteenth on odam seventeen thirty aged twenty seven years bacchus to give the topping world surprise produced one sober son and here he lies though nursed among full hogsheads he defied the charms of wine and every vice beside o reader if to justice thou art inclined keep honest preston daily in thy mind he drew good wine took care to fill his pots had sundry virtues that outweighed his faults you that on bacchus have the like dependence pray copy bob in measure and attendance cherubs a death's head and vases form the curious ornamentation of the stone i hold that this interesting stone ought to be brought under cover for protection against weather and decay the greatest of the dead who after life's fitful fever sleep in the church of st peter ad vincula within the tower have no monuments and their graves till recent years were unmarked this stone there to a worthy master gunner of england is curious as containing his name in acrostic captain valentine pine son of george pine of curry mallet in the county of somerset gent i summarize his lengthy inscription following the footsteps of his father in loyalty and obedience to his sovereign trailed a pike serving in the ranks under his sire in the expedition at calais in the year sixteen twenty five and in that of the isle of re two years later after that he betook himself to his majesty's fleet served at sea till the civil war and in that rebellion fought for the king on land after charles the first's execution at whitehall he voluntarily followed the command of prince rupert for the space of fifteen years at sea and in the wars of germany till his now majesty's happy restoration oh as a fighter the gallant old soldier took command of some of the navy's ship in the first war against the dutch charles the second had the grace to recompense this faithful royalist with the appointment of master gunner of england in that capacity he departed this life which he led single in april sixteen seventy seven his glowing epitaph reads undaunted hero whose aspiring mind as being not willing here to be confined like birds in cage in narrow trunk of clay entertained death and with it soared away now he is gone why should i not relate to future age his valor fame and fate just loyal prudent faithful such was he nature's accomplished world's epitome proud he was not and though by riches tried yet virtue was his safe his surest guide nor can devouring time his rapid jaws e'er eat away those actions he made laws st dustin's fleet street youngest of the city churches has many monuments rich in interest preserved from the older fabric destroyed nearly a century ago among them is an oval tablet to alexander layton ye famed swordmen raised by an admiring pupil of the fencing master with the couplet beneath his thrusts like lightning flew more skilful death paired em all and beat him out of breath leighton taught fencing in tumultuous days when swords flashed readily from their scabbards for king or parliament and lived in old age till sixteen seventy seven this other inscription on a round marble tablet on the wall of one of the bays without ornament i like better to the memory of hobson jutkin esq late of clifford's inn 
the honest solicitor who departed this life june the thirtieth eighteen twelve this tablet was erected by his clients as a token of gratitude and respect for his honest faithful and friendly conduct to them through life go reader and imitate hobson judkin a quaint fancy that it recalls the memorial inscription which pennant found in the neighboring rolls chapel now demolished in chancery lane here lies an honest lawyer that is strange hobson judkin's old firm still survives a century after in messrs watson sons and room solicitors of bovary street e c from these mild jokers at expense of the lawyers always considered a safe butt for witticisms i pass on to a professed comedian fixed on the wall of the south staircase of st clement danes church in the strand you will find this inscribed stone sacred to the memory of honest joe miller who was a tender husband and a sincere friend a facetious companion and an excellent comedian who departed this life the fifteenth day of august seventeen thirty eight aged fifty six years if humour wit and honesty could save the humorous witty honest from the grave the grave had not so soon this tenant found whom honesty and wit and humour crowned could but esteem and love preserve our breath and guard us longer from the stroke of death the stroke of death on him had later fell whom all mankind esteemed and loved full well from respect to sound worth mirthful qualities and histrionic excellence commemorated by poetic talent in humble life the above inscription which time had nearly obliterated has been preserved and transferred to this stone by order of jervis buck church warden a d eighteen sixteen joe miller's jests is a book no longer read but his name has survived it curious i called for a copy at the british museum no ordinary library seems now to keep it and found it both stale and unprofitable joe miller enjoyed a well-earned reputation as an actor at drury lane theatre for five-and-twenty years and some standing as a wit but his posthumous fame therefore is mostly the gift of his editors his jest book when first issued after his death contained two hundred forty seven quips only eleven of these were his others having been collected from all sorts of sources long after he lay beyond power of pen and ink successive editors added others with each new edition fathering all on the ancestral joe miller till a new york reprint the thirteenth some fifty years ago gave no fewer than one thousand two hundred eighty six witticisms so may reputations grow with time miller lived in clare market throughout his theatrical career and dying there was buried in st clemens outlying graveyard in portugal street king's college hospital was built upon the abandoned graveyard in eighteen fifty two and the monument says the dictionary of national biography was then finally destroyed that no doubt has been the case with the original stone but here in st clement danes in the strand is the one that replaced it a century ago preserving the epitaph which stephen duck wrote for him i like best the story told of joe miller's selection of a bride being illiterate himself his principal object was to have a wife who was able to read his parts at the theatre to him last i go out to the open air brem's buildings is a way between chancery lane and fetter lane and there opposite the birkbeck college 
is a fragment of the additional graveyard of St. Dustin in the West Parish. Long since it was disused, and close to the iron railing, on ground raised level with the eye, is a little square stone whereon is inscribed this. Here sleeps our babes in silence, heaven's their rest, for God takes soonest those he loveth best. Samuel Marshall, the second son of Edward Marshall and of Anne his wife, died May 27, 1631, aged two years. Anne Marshall, their first daughter, died 21 of June, 1635, aged one year, nine months. Nicholas Marshall, their third son, died December 5, 1635, aged five years, six months. They die young whom the gods love. Note the date. It is in King Charles I's troubled reign. It calls one back to distant days of cavaliers and roundheads. The great newspaper press, which groans unceasingly day and night, and has transformed the neighborhood, had not yet come into its own when the sorrowing parents laid their children for their last long sleep in this then quiet corner. Who was Edward Marshall? Was he Parliament man, as were the bulk of the Londoners? Or was his sword for King Charles in the storm that was soon to burst over the country? Time has blotted out all save his name. Annie, too. But generations of printers, men and lads passing by, have stopped to read the simple lines of this headstone, telling a tale of loss which after nearly three centuries lapse, makes its appeal with undiminished freshness to our common humanity. Postscript A glance, looking around me as I walked hurriedly about the great spaces of Westminster Abbey, after this paper was closed, and indeed the proofs passed, seemed to tell that my opening fears concerning our modern poverty and epitaph were all wrong. This simple stone, commemorating a great name among all those illustrious dead, was at my feet. Mr. J. Smith End of chapter 15《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーas is the Society of Apothecaries. Were I honored by invitation to the freedom of the livery company of, say, the Bowers of London, or of the Armourers, that I should appreciate, but it would occasion some embarrassment. Little opportunity has come my way to bend the English U, nor is the heavy weight of steel armor for my figure." These warlike trades, and others equally remote, you will find named among the great fraternity of city companies, and I would not see lost a single one of them. In the words of the toast honored in the halls, Skinners and merchant tailors, merchant tailors and skinners, root and branch, may they flourish forever. They are links back in a long chain of events, reminding us by their titles what an old historic city this London is, counting its age by centuries when Harold's footmen stood close on the hill at Hastings, of ancient renown and fame when the English archers loosened their flight of arrows at Poictiers, 
rooted in a dim antiquity when the appearance of the first knight in a complete suit of plate armour no doubt was hailed by the londoners of that day as a novelty like as to ourselves is the k motor omnibus in the london streets we have the same streets cheapside and bucklesbury along which harold's foot soldiers may have marched to the bridge and into kent fleet street trodden by the mailed feet of knights templars leaving their riverside settlement for the crusades in palestine smithfield the scene of many a royal and gorgeous joust before its after reputation came by the marian burnings the grim fortress of the tower of london keeps still that sentinel guard by the river which it has kept for now eight hundred and forty years some among these city companies go back to poictiers it has even been conjectured that some fellowship of trades existed in the london of earl harold and may have given to it that strength of community which william the conqueror sought to win over not to destroy the apothecaries is not among the companies of such ancient foundation for till the scottish king james i came to the english throne its members were incorporated with the grocers and far back before the grocers were so styled these tradesmen last named were the pepperers the guild of pepperorium is mentioned in the great roll of the pipe as early as the year eleven eighty so for my apothecary friends i have not so ancient an historical sense as i have for the tradesmen from whom i buy my pepper physicians and barber surgeons there were in king james the first's time as well as grocers who then sold healing drugs the insistency of king james in separating the apothecaries from the grocers was and is a little puzzling quite true many of the leading apothecaries sought it they were supported in that demand by two doctors of eminence sir theodore de marin and henry atkins james's discreet and faithful physicians gideon de leon the queen's apothecary was also a suitor but the society of apothecaries though torn apart from the grocers took away none of the grocers endowments it had a name and a royal charter but no property it had to find funds with which to begin many apothecaries thrifty men objected to charges thus forced upon their trade and went so far as to petition the king to destroy the charter and reunite them with the grocers james would hear nothing of the sort of the evils to be remedied the charter itself bore witness that in these latter years very many empirics and unskilful and ignorant men and unexperienced do inhabit and abide in our city of london and the suburbs of the same which are not well instructed in the art and mystery of apothecaries but are therein unskilful and rude do make and compound many unwholesome hurtful deceitful corrupt and dangerous medicines and the same do sell into many parts of this our kingdom of england and the same do daily transmit to the abuse and scandal not only of them which embrace the knowledge of physic and of the learned physicians of this our realm of england professing the same and of the apothecaries of our city of london being educated and expert in the same art and mystery but also to the great peril and daily hazard of the lives of our subjects these phrases are the commonplaces of royal charters and well may exaggerate the peril in which the citizens stood from poison when at the instigation of the grocers the city authorities delayed enrolment of the charter the king sent his peremptory orders to the lord mayor 
and that king james albeit the wisest fool in christendom was justified in his foresight and the recalcitrants were not three centuries of experience bear ample witness the early years are somewhat vague the apothecaries had obtained complete power over distillation of all kinds but twenty years later the distillers claimed and won separation setting up their own company this the apothecaries opposed tooth and nail alleging manifold and dangerous abuses by inexpert and criminous distillers incidentally that the ingredients of their distillations were principally the emptyings of brewers vessels droppings of alewives taps and washings of beer hogsheads which they call a low wine adding there to spices seeds and herbs and dulcifying it with the refuse or dross of sugar fit only for hog's treacle this i learned from mr barrett's history of the society of apothecaries and regret grows that there was not a native journalism by this time for assuredly it would have been lively the apothecaries at the outset had dispensed and sold medicines only before the century which had witnessed the grant of the charter in sixteen seventeen was out they were also prescribing the society had beaten back repeated attacks by the grocers company the city authorities and a section of its body but found in the college of physicians resourceful opponents these took up a domineering attitude claimed oversight of the apothecary's doings in brief acted the part of much superior persons justified by their learning and reputation naturally the physicians their college was of henry the eighth's foundation objected to upstart rivals in their own domain of healing a long war of pamphlets waged to which dr garth's cheerfully venomous verse in the dispensary contributed nigh where fleet ditch descends in sable streams to wash his sooty nades in the thames there stands a structure on a rising hill where tyros take their freedom out to kill that was written of apothecary's hall dryden assailed the body in lines like these the apothecary tribe is wholly blind from files a random recipe they take and many deaths from one prescription make garth generous as his muse prescribes and gives the shopman sells and by destruction lives after the pamphleteers the lawyer's aid was invoked life was strenuous for the pill-makers but the stout london apothecaries held their own today the society of apothecaries not only examines candidates qualifying to compound and dispense drugs but it is one of the three great medical licensing bodies for england and wales it conducts the examinations of the conjoint board in its own hall from which issue fully qualified and licensed general practitioners that is a proud position for a city company to have won and stands for evidence of its continued usefulness in old days of nelson's and wellington's wars apothecary's hall made big money by providing drugs for the fleets and armies individual members of the company raised the capital funds for the purpose the stock as it was called and themselves took the profits in the greater war of nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen the apothecary's company played a patriotic and useful part in compounding large quantities of drugs for the fighting forces but long before that time the private co-partnership had been abandoned the company still as a corporate body trades under its three centuries old charter and any one among the public may go to the shop 
beneath the shadow of the hall in water lane blackfriars and there purchase pure drugs expertly compounded the hall was finished about sixteen seventy one replacing that destroyed in the great fire of london it is one of the few city companies halls of the period that have not been tampered with by renovations save that on the exterior the stucco fiend has pursued his noisome work covering all the brick i never have understood the stucco delusion a madness seems to have seized upon our people misleading them to prefer sham to honesty the appearance of sham stone to honest brick and its most awful example is in the tower of london where the timber frames and gables of henry the eighth's lieutenant's lodgings were stucco covered and partly are so still for more reasons than good preservation apothecary's hall at blackfriars is well worth a visit no architect is named in the records and who designed the buildings grouped around the four sides of the open quadrangle none can now hope to tell whoever he was he had good knowledge of his craft the great hall is spacious and lofty with an ornamented ceiling lighted by tall windows with circular openings above them a handsome wooden screen with the apothecary's arms boldly carved is at one end and a minstrel's gallery is raised high at the other the only relic saved from the great fire stands in the hall the marble bust of gideon de Lawn. this dour old gentleman wearing a square beard became master and generally he has the credit of having founded the company though surely that belongs rather to the two physicians previously mentioned portraits on the walls include those of the monarchs james i charles i william and mary and queen anne throughout whose reigns the company grew in reputation and prosperity the pictures that hold my fancy more strongly than these are in the adjoining courtroom a square apartment finely proportioned and panelled up to the ceiling that it would be a delight for any literary man to work in especially i covet an unfinished portrait by sir joshua reynolds of the great anatomist john hunter here seen in a thoughtful pose with his elbow resting on a table it would seem unpardonable to wish more work done on the head itself a perfect example of sir joshua's art there is too a fine head on panel of james i his black hat ornamented with jewels and with jewelled chain and lace collar with many portraits of worthy apothecaries some among them of outstanding distinction the poet keats was granted the lsa licentiate society apothecaries diploma at apothecary's hall on july twenty five eighteen sixteen and there hangs in the courtroom his portrait with an original abstract from the candidate's entry book of that date giving particulars of his apprenticeship attendance at lectures and hospital practice they have a heavy oaken balustraded staircase by which the visitor ascends to the great hall and higher to the upper rooms you will hardly credit that till a few years ago this fine structure was completely fenced off to keep out drafts was i believe the excuse better counsels have prevailed and today it is seen in full majesty the ample library now under the care of dr bramley taylor and one of the best for materia medica in existence began with the gift in 1633 of a single volume of gerard's herbal before leaving the great hall itself notice there the muniment chest bearing date 1668 and the gift of william clark 
composed of six chestnut planks of great size and decorated with brass studs heavy bronze handles and an ornate key scrutcheon it has the original lock notice also the banners or streamers lending a patch of fading colour to the hall originally they floated from the company's state barge when it escorted the lord mayor on the thames or the journey was made by water to the physic garden at chelsea that physic garden is at chelsea still for two centuries and more the apothecary's company held it in sixteen eighty three they planted there four cedars two of which within memory were conspicuous by the riverside to all who passed in boats from branches of these the three chairs for the master and wardens were made the garden in its day under a succession of able gardeners performed a useful service to medical science but other resources have arisen at kew and regent's park in the changing years and at the close of last century the utility of this possession to the company was less noticeable than the cost of its upkeep it is to-day maintained by the london parochial charities trustees and is used by students of botany all residents of chelsea being heartily thankful that in this ample space nature has been left undisturbed apothecary's hall escaped the air raids though missiles fell thereabouts and the careful clerk mr bingham watson has left on record for future generations of the craft all that happened to and all that was done by the ancient company in the great war i have wished that the clerk during the great plague of sixteen sixty five had done as much the apothecary's company performs a useful task unobstentatiously being little in the public eye and is secure in the position and esteem which many generations of masters of the craft have built up it has never been worldly rich i like the apothecaries the better because they fought their way the pestle well used is a serviceable weapon end of chapter 16「Seventeen of More About Unknown London by Walter George Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Janet. Chapter Seventeen London Out of Bounds. Men amongst us who are of middle age will remember there were maps of English counties that as children they were set to draw, which were oddly comprised bits thrown out so to speak gave to the colored sheet a speckled appearance bits of lincolnshire colored brown thrown into yellow cambridgeshire and of green derbyshire left over its border in red yorkshire westmoreland had quite a lot of these detached bits among her fells they were disjecta membra odd fragments of counties of no ordered size or plan somehow or other left embedded in neighboring counties then came a local government act of a date that i don't profess to remember but assuredly drafted by someone who had a soft place in his heart for schoolboys which simplified the geography of england by compacting each county into an indivisible whole if i tell you that for centuries there was a bit of london that was not london but cambridgeshire and not only a bit of london but by the very heart of it the city you may believe that i am romancing it was so and after it ceased to be cambridgeshire it became a sort of little crown colony self-governed living apart from its vast neighbour london in which it was embosomed it knew no london tax collector and any sort of that breed i imagine 
would have had but short shrift had he ventured to call with the blue paper this curious arrangement continued in force till the last local government act well within memory which swept the privileged precinct into the vast network of the metropolis of course there is a story in it which had its origin in those days long ago when the church and various religious orders possessed as their own no inconsiderable part of london and a bishop within the boundaries of his residence retained his jurisdiction as in his own diocese exempt from civil interference this outland is ely place off holborn a quiet byway by hatton garden as you take the rise of the hill to holborn circus and familiar at least to newspaper readers as the quarters of a firm of solicitors famous in many a cause celebre in the law courts messrs lewis and lewis's offices occupy a large part of one side eli place leads nowhere it has a gate on holborn very likely unnoticed as it is always open in the daylight hours it has also a beetle's box and at times the passer-by may catch a glimpse of the uniformed official who occupies this last his importance is emphasized by his gold-laced hat the city stretches along by holborn as far as the fine old timbered front of staple inn where a stone obelisk marks the boundary and there is a companion obelisk opposite by gray's inn road eli place still lives within itself so far as it is allowed to proudly retiring as if hurt in dignity by the intrusion of civildom now forced upon it the gate opens upon the city but the city police have no power there they will act only if called in by properly constituted authority and specifically requested to assist in keeping the king's peace the representative of law and order in the domain is the beadle who was originally appointed by eli and today is the servant of the crown the record of eli place is free from crime as befits a community which has lived for long generations gone by under the aegis of a cathedral often i have wondered what would have happened had one committed serious misdemeanor there would the beadle have seized the offender handcuffed him chained him to his watch-box and sent messengers for cannon a cannon of eli of course or would the bishop have come gaitered and in shovel hat running up breathlessly from the house of lords or was this the dean's work the beadle is also watchman and in this capacity he keeps alive in this matter-of-fact twentieth-century london one of its customs of generations gone by two o'clock and a fine starlight night you may hear the cry still just as our ancestors did from the watchman and charlies who with tottering footsteps and lantern burning made their nocturnal preambulation of the streets for the old london cries are not all stilled the beetle of eli place beats the round of his pavements at appointed intervals during the night proclaiming the hour and the state of the weather to those awake in their beds who may hear him a good father of st etheldreda's living at the priest's house confided to me that he finds the cry rather disturbing and he suspects that occasionally in the drowsy hours the watchman nods or he himself sleeps soundly there is another reminder of a thing centuries older if you listen at nine o'clock each night throughout the year you may hear from eli place over the housetops the musical clang of a bell lasting some three or four minutes that is the bell of gray's inn ringing the london curfew a practice which the benchers of the ancient and honourable society of that house religiously maintain 
my good father of st etheldry does having heard it often but little curious asked me what it was london has another curfew rung each night at sunset from the bell tower of the tower of london as from ancient days yet i never knew a londoner or like the pinafore's captain hardly ever who could tell me whether the curfew was still observed but a few years back i was amused by a correspondence in notes and queries on this very topic of the curfew when remote villages and hamlets were instanced where the norman custom was still honored by the ringing of a bell in the church tower nothing of this native place of mine london is always big enough to be overlooked long ago for centuries till queen elizabeth had a dancing chancellor sir christopher hatton eli place was part of the hostel and gardens of the bishop of eli they resided there when in london attending the king and parliament the prelate's church still stands the church of st etheldreda in eli place built in the late thirteenth century which today is so well kept and after use as a welsh episcopalian chapel and misuse for lay purposes has gone back to the roman catholic community it is the only building commanding interest left for the rest are offices by some uninspired architect though no doubt admirably serving their purpose the walled eli place spread far over what is now hatton garden and its rose garden and orchard and meadows i imagine as especially fine for when the desirability of eli place as a residence appealed to sir christopher's cupidity it was a term of the lease granted by eli that he should pay in rental a red rose ten loads of hay and ten pounds per annum if shakespeare be an authority then so far back as the reign of king richard the third its unrivalled strawberries were another attraction of this fragrant spot gloucester my lord of eli when i was last in holborn i saw good strawberries in your garden there i do beseech you send for some of them eli mary and will my lord with all my heart hatton the great queen's favorite had the lease for a limited term of ten years but he was never got out while alive when he was dead and lay buried beneath an imposing monument in old st paul's the bishop protesting loudly was still kept out of possession of his property the crown held fast limpet like leaving to the prelude's use only some dark rooms and even of these the cellars beneath were partly occupied by others the commonwealth parliament pulled down most of the buildings and made a prison of the rest right through the time of the stuarts william and mary anne and of three of the four georges the unedifying dispute as to the rights of possession was kept alive till in the year seventeen seventy two a compromise was arranged and the bishop acquired possession of a town house in number thirty seven dover street piccadilly there when so disposed he lived i fear uncomfortably planted among the west end modesties and clubs until in nineteen o seven the ecclesiastical commissioners authorized bishop chase to sell the house and site for cash eli place is crown property still but its privilege gained from the time when it was a bishop's liberty of flouting great london rating itself and managing its own lighting drainage paving and all domestic affairs without interference by any outside body has been taken away though geographically within the city eli place forms no part of it nor is this the only corner about the city out of bounds of the lord mayor's jurisdiction if you chance to look into wren's city churches 
any day between the hours of noon and three when substantially all of them are open for inspection and worship you will find in some a great square roomy pew well placed near the pulpit and at the head of the pew an elaborately wrought and decorated iron sword rest these are conspicuous in the churches of st lawrence jewelry by guildhall great st helen's all hallows barking and many more the rest rises high so as to present to full view of the congregation that sword which is the symbol of the lord mayor's authority and is carried before him when he appears in full civic state it is a good soling in blade a serviceable weapon well capable of drawing blood in torrents from any adversary upon whom it might descend should there be such a one contemptuous enough to assail the majesty of the right honourable the lord mayor of london in his own city and in his presence but of more interest and in intrinsic value immeasurably greater is the pearl scabbard that conceals the blade this was a gift to her well-beloved city by queen elizabeth and is the corporation's most treasured relic sword and scabbard go before the lord mayor as i have said only on occasions of civic state footnote a plainer state sword has been in use since 1688 the pearl sword being reserved for the more important ceremonials and footnote i recall them here because so recently as the first of june 1917 there was a memorial service held for the gallant scholars of the city of london school who had fallen in the great war and the place most appropriately chosen for it was the glorious church built by the knights templars wherein cross-legged crusaders lie in stone effigy the lord mayor on that occasion would not have been admitted to the temple had he come in state the temple is extraterritorial it has successfully resisted inclusion under the union of parishes act it still assesses its own rates in the year 1911 it kept outside its gates the city coroner when he attempted to hold a fire inquest there holy church and england's kings made the temple independent in the long ages back and jealous of its privileges it has never admitted the jurisdiction of the lord mayor within its boundaries it pays him neither allegiance nor honor i am confident that everything was done with the utmost courtesy but there was the templars non possumus and it was a most modest little procession of the lord mayor and sheriffs that passed through the quiet courts of the temple to the church the civic dignitaries robed certainly and attended but without sword and scabbard mace or any emblem that might proclaim authority that the temple denies footnote see the city press of june second nineteen seventeen End footnote the contest has not always been so well conducted a lord mayor once ventured to intrude into the temple with painful results that was two and a half centuries ago and the temple then as today held itself free when so ill-mannered to tilt its nose and snap its fingers at mayor or alderman sir william turner a right worthy lord mayor to whose enterprise london rebuilding after the great fire owed a large debt filled the civic chair in sixteen sixty eight to nine invited to dine and hall by mr goodfellow the reader of inner temple on the third march he communicated his intention to come in state bearing his symbols of office the whole society protested whereupon the lord mayor declined to come at all but evidently piqued he afterwards sent this message i will come and dine with him 
I will bear up my sword and see who dares to take it down. Defiance of this kind the Templars did not lightly suffer upon their own ground. A mob of barristers and students of the inn, wearing rapiers under their cloaks, confronted the civic party as they passed into the temple cloisters. One Hodges, their spokesman, told the mayor that unless his sword-bearer at once lowered the civic sword, they would not be permitted to enter the hall. It was not the king's, but was the lord mayor's sword. They were as good men as he, and no respect should be paid to him there. No answer being made to a demand couched in these insolent terms, there was an immediate rush for the mayoral sword. It was pulled down, but not captured, and in the struggle the sword-bearer was slightly hurt, and some of the pearls from the scabbard were knocked off. The cap of maintenance, borne by an official, was partly snatched from him. Worse still, fared the city marshal's men in attendance. They were seized by the law students and hustled away to be put under the pump, but as the record quaintly says, were not pumped. Their staffs were taken from them, and they were beaten and maltreated with their own weapons. Driven into a corner, the Lord Mayor, with his retinue, took shelter in the chambers of Mr. Auditor Phillips. Sir John Nicholas, the recorder, with the sheriffs, was dispatched to Whitehall to report the affront to King Charles the Second. Sir Richard Brown caused the drums to beat for the trained bands to assemble. Here were all the elements of a first-class riot, the Lord Mayor roughly imprisoned, the Templars in their most warlike mood, and an appeal to the Crown. The wise sovereign appears to have advised the Lord Mayor to go back to the city. As soon as the recorder and sheriffs had returned, the Lord Mayor and aldermen attempted to make their way out of the temple. They were again opposed by the victorious students, with Hodges at their head, and a scene of wild excitement and confusion followed. Blows were showered upon the aldermen, and one of the sheriffs was seized by the collar in the frantic attempts by the students to pull down the civic sword. The Lord Mayor and aldermen were called cuckolds, and their officers, dogs, rogues, rascals, and other very bad names. Black eyes were dealt out to the servants. The students refused to allow the Lord Mayor to depart, bearing his sword up, except by way of Ram Alley, today Hair Place, a court of infamous reputation that was regarded as a back door of the inn. No other course offered but for the Lord Mayor and his party again to take refuge in the auditor's chambers. The sheriffs and Sir John Nicholas were sent off a second time to the king. The benchers then intervened with effect, and it was intimated to his lordship that he might leave without further interruption. The young gentleman, says Pepys, had been persuaded to go in to dinner. Finally the Lord Mayor and his train, empty without having dined, made a safe exit, though accompanied to the temple gate by members and students of the inn, shouting and jeering at the civic party. It is written in the Guildhall records that the proceedings aforesaid were greatly affrontive and dishonorable to the government of the city, which none will dispute. Ten years later a Lord Mayor, accompanied by civic officials, put in an appearance at the temple on occasion of a destructive fire. Again the courts resounded with shouts of protest at his presence from noisy Templars. They knew no Lord Mayor there. His lordship was well advised to beat a hasty retreat. He had a mean revenge. 
outside he met a city fire engine of the time hurrying along to assist in putting out the flames he turned it back do you know of a case in the city where a man has to pay a guinea a year for the right of entering his own front door my excellent friend the rev a taylor vicar of st bride's who knows printing as intimately as he knows divinity and thus came well equipped for a fleet street cure told me of such a one he is himself the victim the circumstance arises curiously the vicar of course occupies the parsonage house and that of st bride's is elbowed away at the north end of bridewell place between the st bride foundation institute on the one side and what was a police station on the other but today so things change in this changing world is the office at which the sportsman daily newspaper is produced wolsey once occupied the st bride's parsonage in bridewell's great days and sir richard empson king henry the seventh's rapacious tax collector before him the last beheaded on tower hill i wonder if my vicar friend is troubled by ghosts all ground hereabouts is historical the large palace of bridewell of king henry the eighth and catherine of aragon their desolate residence while they awaited the divorce trial the court assembled in the old blackfriars priory close at hand stretched from before the parson's front door down to the riverside its battlemented walls with the tudor diaper pattern in black brick embedded in the red brick as you see today at hampton court rose thirty-six feet in height and the turrets yet higher the northern wall ran here built of a thickness enough to cover part of what is now the pavement upon which pedestrians tread and the width of two feet three inches behind the parson's iron railing the pavement and road have been dedicated to the public the private twenty-seven inches strip has not bridewell royal hospital the charitable foundation of edward the sixth keeps its old plans and is properly jealous being a charitable body of its old rights and it has not forgotten that the palace wall ended inside the parson's rail and what land that wall covered is its own land st bride's parsonage has no back entrance there is no way of getting into the house but by the front door and to reach it the vicar has to step over that narrow strip of ground whereon the wall rose bridewell hospital mulks him in one guinea each year for the privilege of doing so and he takes a receipt in tudor street there is another curious reminder of the previous existence of the royal palace of bridewell numbers three and five are adjacent and distinct houses with a party wall between them which exactly marks the site of the western exterior wall of the palace but go into number three and you find a semi-octagonal staircase well from basement to roof cut out of the next house commodious enough for a lift and a wide flight of stairs a turret of bridewell palace stood upon that ground projecting beyond the wall it was and is bridewell hospital's property up this turret maybe where now is a modern staircase occupying just as much ground henry the eighth and queen catherine passed the sly diplomatist noai and the ambassadors jean d'adinteville and george de selva who were occupants of bridewell and whose portraits you may see in holbein's picture of the ambassadors at the national gallery the rev e g o'donohue the gifted historian of bridewell gave me this explanation many a monastic foundation about the city no doubt has left like oddities upon its ground site lasting over the centuries 
Charles Dickens, of course, knew Fleet Street. He was the first editor of the Daily News, and abandoned the struggling infant after seventeen days of life. Make a vow, as I have done. So he wrote to Forster, his friend and biographer, who with a heavy heart dropped into the editorial chair, never to go down that court with the little news shop at the corner any more, and let us swear by Jack Straw as in ancient times. I am beginning to get over my sorrow for your nights up aloft in Whitefriars, and to feel nothing but happiness in the contemplation of your enfranchisement. The court alluded to was Plato Court, with its little corner shop in Fleet Street then kept as a tobacconist's by Mrs. Burton, a former actress, who exposed the daily news for sale, and today showing Geographia's skillful maps. Not thirty paces farther down Fleet Street's fallen ground is Bouvier Street, and a door from its corner is a railway receiving office and at its side the fragment of an old coaching inn's yard over the house front you still may read the name the bolton tun footnote as i pass this page in final proof at easter nineteen twenty one housebreakers are demolishing the building End footnote. a famous coaching inn was the bolton tun in fleet street whence set out the coaches for Cambridge, Winchester, Lincoln, and incidentally a good many other places, when people travelled that fashion because there was none better, and indeed continued to travel after the iron horse had driven the stages one after another off the road. For it was the distinction of the Bolton Tun that it was the last to give up the fight. It ran the very last stagecoach out of London on a regular route served by railway, and that was in the Victorian forties. What, I fancy a puzzled inquirer asking, has Charles Dickens to do with all this? Well, just this. Dickens knew London like a book. He walked about with eyes always observant, and it was from painted names above the shop fronts, on passing vehicles, and in advertisements that he derived not a few of those names made famous as characters in fiction no man ever had or has copyright in his own name though his signature is his inalienable birthright dickens of course knew every stone of fleet street wherein he wrote and printed and published and he came that was after the time which i am concerned to fill, though for so short a span, the editor's chair. At the corner of Fetter Lane is Peel's old coffee house, and people I have met remember Dickens looking over the newspaper files there, which used to be that house's specialty. He knew the Bolton Tun in the days when its coaching traffic, outlasting its usefulness but struggling gallantly, was dwindling away and he saw a poster exhibited in its windows. I have a churchwarden friend, Mr. Robert Gray, whom you may meet any Sunday morning at St. Clement Eastcheap. Now he trades in wine alone in the city, and treasures his family association with this last of the old coaching inns in London to run a stagecoach. He has the clock by which the guard of the coach kept time and faith with his passengers. A big watch, cased for safety in wood, and still in running order, a model of the coach, and other relics. But the piece I envy him most is a bill exhibited in the Bolton Tun window, where Dickens, so often passing by, cannot have failed to see it, and he has allowed me to reproduce it. Notice the signatures. Now you may make a shrewd guess where Dickens looked for the name of his immortal Mr. Pickwick. This particular poster I have photographed bears a date two years after the Pickwick papers began to appear in monthly parts. A city company I know, 
with unostentatious hand doing good deeds in charity and education keeps alive a custom which i trust may never die it is a distant recollection dining in its stately hall but at some stage of the feast there comes round the tables a steward with an attendant waiter bearing a tray of tiny glasses filled with an amber or a white fluid and to each guest in turn is put the question do you dine sir with alderman or with lady cooper if with the alderman be the reply a liquor of rich cognac is placed at your hand should you choose lady cooper as host of the occasion then the glass is one of pure hollands that hollands so competent judges have assured me is a brew of rare delight itself justifying a claim by the dutch to be considered a great power dead they have been these two hundred years and more the alderman and his lady these hosts at the cloth workers feasts for that is the company but whenever the liverymen assemble to dine and wine their memories are revived it was an earlier cloth workers hall that peeps in the great fire of london saw burning for three days and nights in one body of flame the cellars being full of oil a vivid incident in that vast catastrophe alderman cooper was i take it a fellow of good cheer holding his own with all honest drinkers of his day knowing men in their strength and weakness he died and dying left to his company a sum of money to provide the good french brandy that always when his brothers met and dined they should drink a glass in remembrance his relict knowing that by this means her worthy spouse's memory was kept green at her own deathbed made a like provision some men achieve immortality by greatness in battle in statesmanship in the arts if not great concede that alderman cooper was worldly wise it is not in the cold aisle of some cathedral or weathered mausoleum or by unheeded monument in the market-place that his memory is kept it survives at the festive board a living thing it comes fragrant over the centuries ever being renewed warming the company bespeaking their gratitude men there are accounted great in their day who will rest in oblivion and their names be forgotten while still at many feasts to come so long as the cloth workers company endures the question will be asked of the guests do you dine sir with alderman or with lady cooper but i am finishing in anecdotage end of chapter 17 end of more about unknown london by walter george bell